Marxism and Democracy by Lucien Loyerat. Published in 1940. Author's Preface. For almost a quarter of a century the affairs of the world and its ideas have been in indescribable confusion. In most cases the confusion of ideas is manifest without the aid of polemic or controversy. It is simple evidence of the chaotic state of the world. The succession of events since 1914 has swept away so many illusions that even a summary inspection of the heap of ideological ruins would demand the compilation of a veritable encyclopedia. The summer of 1914 witnessed the collapse of all those hopes which had been built on a peaceful evolution of the capitalist world, and it also witnessed the breakdown of socialist internationalism. The world crisis which began in 1929, the longest ever known, caused people entirely unconnected with and even hostile to the working class movement to speak of crisis and even of the collapse of capitalism. Bolshevism, which once aspired to supplant tottering capitalism, is now in a state of incurable degeneration both at home in Russia and internationally. The economic and financial smash of 1929 ruthlessly disposed of the Fordist delusion that capitalism was about to experience an era of lasting prosperity and harmony. Liberalism observed with horror that the actual course of world development ignored all its good advice. Today the doctrine of liberalism is practically dead, but, at least, its few remaining defenders can console themselves by noting the disastrous effects of economic nationalism. The dictatorships, whether fascist or Bolshevist, have been able to conceal their innumerable defeats only by ruthlessly using both the gag and the lie. Many people declare that democracy, too, is bankrupt. It is certainly true that democracy has lost much ground in recent years, and is now face to face with a serious crisis. But we do not believe that it is bankrupt, and later we shall show why. In the general collapse of values all around us it is not surprising that Marxists should also be subjected to critical attacks. A failure in the eyes of its enemies, even many of its friends admit that it is going through a severe crisis. Certain self-styled orthodox Marxists, more in love with the letter than the spirit of the writings of Marx and Engels have provided the less scrupulous critics of Marxism with weighty arguments. However, this category of academic Marxists is becoming less and less numerous, and today we can observe their place being increasingly taken by people with far less knowledge and even greater pretensions, half a dozen quotations lifted from this or that popular pamphlet serve them instead of doctrine, and represent in their eyes the sum total of Marxist science. Most of the anti-Marxists of our day reveal the same intellectual poverty. Of a thousand socialists perhaps one has ever read a book of Marx's, whilst of a thousand anti-Marxists not even one. This estimate of Binokolevsky and Domanchin Helfen in the preface to their biography of Marx, one, seems to us to be far too flattering. The real crisis through which Marxism is passing is not due to this relaxation of intellectual discipline on the part of some of those who call themselves followers of Marx. Unfortunately, the habit of praising or blaming without knowledge of the subject is becoming increasingly common to men of all parties today. This is not due to the failure of this or that doctrine, but to the crisis through which our whole civilization is passing. At the same time this regrettable tendency adds greatly to the confusion in which all the sociological disputes of our day are taking place. 2. Before proceeding to a discussion of the crisis of Marxism let us define what we mean by Marxism. Is it the doctrine of Marx and Engels? Or is it the movements to which the doctrine has given birth, and which, rightly or wrongly, claim to be Marxist? To what extent are these movements actually inspired by Marxism, and to what extent have they caused it to develop, sometimes reforming, sometimes deforming it? Are these movements still really Marxist in the classic sense? Or do perhaps both friends and enemies of Marxism often harbor a distorted conception of Marx's original theories? We must therefore ask ourselves whether the so-called crisis of Marxism is not in large measure a crisis of differing posthumous interpretations of Marxism. Karl Marx died in 1883 and Friedrich Engels in 1895. 
although a number of their followers have developed their doctrines and provided important supplementary analyses of the modifications experienced by capitalism in the course of the 20th century, the results of these labors have hardly affected the movement as a whole. In fact, as the movement grew in size, the assimilation even of the ideas of Marx and Engels themselves, which were naturally better known, became slower, more fragmentary and more superficial. In accordance with historical conditions which obviously differed considerably as between country and country, each movement took what best suited it from the original doctrine, and applied its choice, very rarely the Marxist method itself, to its own particular situation. In this sense we can speak of a decomposition of Marxism, and this it seems to us is the actual sense in which Sorel used the term. 3 but in ignoring the important fundamental contribution of the followers of Marx, and by insisting exclusively on the phenomenon of superficial adaptation and variation, Sorel passed in silence over all that was healthy, live and fruitful in the Marxist doctrine. Marxist theoreticians have heard too much, in season and out of season, about the crisis of Marxism to be unduly moved by the latest anti-Marxist challenge particularly as it coincided, oddly enough, with the practical confirmation of the essential theses of Karl Marx in the economic crash of 1929-36. In writing this book it was certainly not our intention to rebut the old stale arguments once again with old and equally stale answers. The same well-worn gramophone records has given satisfaction since the end of the last century. However, after a quarter of a century of economic, political and social upheavals it seemed useful to us to compare Marxist doctrine with present-day reality. Does this reality conform to the predictions of the founders of scientific socialism? And if not, have those predictions proved false in part only, or all along the line? How has Marxism developed theoretically and practically? And how far do certain ideas currently accepted today as Marxist correspond to the real doctrine of Karl Marx and to the interests of the working class movement? Marxism is not a dogma at all, it is a method of investigation. Seeing that the conditions of our day differ considerably from those studied by Marx, what are the new problems which contemporary Marxism has to solve? They certainly cannot be solved by reeling off a few quotations learned by heart. If Marx were to return to our midst today, wrote Karl Renner over twenty years ago, he would reprimand us all, it is not my writings you must study, but society. 4. This exhortation has lost nothing of its value since then, and in this book we propose to respect it scrupulously. The celebrated phrase, so much the worse for the facts, would satisfy only the high priests of Marxism, for Marxism also has its high priests and these priests, like all others, daily denied the principles they claim to defend. Bolshevism is a living proof of this. In conclusion, we have no intention whatever of presenting our readers with a bundle of cut and dried formulas. We propose merely to fructify a long-standing discussion by advancing a number of ideas whose accuracy seems to us beyond all cavil. Lucien Loyerat. Chapter 1. The Marxism of Marx. Before examining the essential theses of Marxist doctrine we feel necessary to explain, at least in general outline, the object of our examination. This, it appears to us, is all the more desirable because most of our contemporaries make no distinction between the original sum of ideas left to us by Marx and Engels, and the subsequent contributions of their followers. And, as we shall soon see, views very far removed indeed from those they actually held are often ascribed to the founders of scientific socialism. Most contemporary discussion of Marxism also suffers from a regrettable confusing of fundamental and auxiliary ideas. Predictions put forward with regard to the general development of capitalist society, and particular recommendations made at this or that moment by this or that socialist group or party, have been placed on the same level. There are numerous supporters and enemies of Marxism who put forward some of the non-essential views of Marx in order to prove either the essential inviability or the complete bankruptcy of the whole of his sociological edifice. 
In our examination of the principal points of this edifice we propose to avoid all abstract controversy. The only satisfactory examination is a comparison with reality. For example, we could go on discussing till doomsday the respective importance of the base and the superstructure in social development without ever coming to grips with the question proper. We are all the more willing to leave this to those who have a taste for extravagant discussions, seeing that Marx and Engels, particularly Engels, have expressed themselves very clearly on the point. However, should it become necessary to expose a false interpretation, we shall, of course, deal with such questions, but then with the sole object of clearing the ground. No one need therefore be surprised at the absence in the following short summary of certain digressions interesting only to the fanatical pedant. I. Historical Materialism. The whole doctrine of Marxism rests on the materialist conception of history, which regards productive relations and the class struggle conditioned by these relations as the determining basis of historical development. It was thanks to this that socialism, from being utopian, became scientific. In founding socialist aspirations on a rational economic law of social development, instead of justifying them on moral grounds valid at any time and in any place, Marx and Engels proclaimed socialism and historical necessity. By that very fact they condemned all a priori constructions. Instead of the illusion of an immediate and complete creation of a new world as though by magic, they gave the youthful working class the conviction that capitalist society was advancing inevitably towards socialism by virtue of its own inherent economic forces. 1. The importance of historical materialism in the work of Marx is twofold. The materialist conception of history is at one and the same time the point of departure and the conclusion of Marx's doctrine. It is the point of departure because it led Marx to devote his best efforts to the study of the laws and tendencies of capitalist economy. Karl Kautsky points this out very correctly in his monumental work on the materialist conception of history. 2. It is the conclusion because, in order to obtain social and political guidance for the struggle of the working class from the study of economics, the methods of historical materialism must be applied. As it is no part of our aim to give a complete picture of the materialist conception of history here, 3, we propose to confine ourselves to restating the authentic gist of that conception as against certain mechanistic and fatalistic distortions frequently met with. To repeat an image employed almost ten years ago by Boris Suverin in a letter to Trotsky, we must not conceive this theory as like a lift traveling vertically and directly upwards from the economic base to the ideological superstructure, not only on account of the reaction of the superstructure on the base, but still more because the ideas, legal and political institutions, etc., of a given epoch proceed from the economic base of that epoch and from the ideology of preceding epochs. The tradition of all the dead generations, declares Marx in his 18th Brumaire, weighs like an alp on the brain on the living. And Friedrich Engels, applying the method practically to explain the birth of modern socialism, writes in his anti-during. Like every new theory, it, socialism, has at first to link itself onto the intellectual material which lay ready to its hand, however deep its roots lay in economic facts. 4. This rapid review seems necessary to us because, as we shall see subsequently, ideas corresponding to material conditions long since past often survive or are reborn under certain historical conditions. 2. The Economic Doctrine of Marx the economic analysis of Karl Marx has its origin in one of the most strongly contested ideas of our epoch, the labor theory of value propounded by Adam Smith and David Ricardo. We have already pointed out that we are confining ourselves in this book to a practical examination of Marxist theory, and we therefore do not propose to discuss the many objections raised against it. In his recent book, 5. Mr. Sidney Hook declares very correctly that one can neither prove nor disprove the law of value by pure logic, but, at least, it is quite certain that the law of value on which Marx based his theories has proved an incomparable instrument of analysis. 
Thanks to it Marxist economic science has obtained results of an accuracy and foresight that no other economic doctrine can claim. Nevertheless, there is no doubt that the theory of value as it has been handed down to us by Marx himself, and developed by a number of his followers, suffers from certain inadequacies. However, as the greater number of the attacks directed against it are characterized by a complete absence of scientific objectiveness, 6, many of them being wholly the result of partisan passion, they hardly merit refutation. The desire to destroy it at all costs and end block prevents these pseudo-savants from observing the parts which are really in need of clarification. At the same time, the religious orthodoxy displayed by certain Marxists utterly lacking in all critical intelligence is another obstacle to this clarification. 7. And yet there is no lack of problems left unsolved by Marx. Let us take simply the question of productive and unproductive labor. In this connection the views expressed by Marx in Capital do not tally with those subsequently expressed in theories of surplus value. Or again, the question of simple labor and complex labor, on the subject of which there are serious differences of opinion between Marx and Engels on the one hand, and Rudolf Hilferding and Otto Bauer, 8, on the other, which have recently been dealt with from a new angle by the Austrian sociologist Julius Dickmann. 9. In this rapid sketch we do not propose to express any opinion which it would be impossible to set out fully within the framework of this book. All that we wish to point out here is that certain aspects of the labor theory of value stand in need of more detailed development, and that serious and disinterested criticism, even if it might be considered on the whole ill-founded, is capable of broadening our viewpoint and contributing towards a general clarification of our ideas. 10. Such efforts towards clarification are infinitely more fruitful than those endless controversies in which the supporters of different theories indefatigably hurl at each other arguments which have been familiar for half a century. It is in its capacity to explain concrete phenomena that a theory shows its real value. For our own part we agree entirely with Karl Kautsky when he writes. Up to the present there is no other tenable theory of value than the labor theory of value. Opposing theories of value which have been put forward apply to quite different phenomena, and not those which the labor theory of value sets out to explain. 11. Let us examine the fundamentals of the economic doctrines of Karl Marx, which are based on the labor theory of value. The total labor of a capitalist society presents itself in a given quantity of commodities distributed along the channels of circulation amongst the various economic categories. Part of this total labor is designed to replace the worn-out means of production, buildings, machinery, raw material and accessories. This is constant capital, C, and remains in the hands of the capitalist class. Another part, designed to remunerate the owners of labor power, variable capital, V, finds its way into the hands of the working class. And finally, the remaining part, surplus value, S V representing the difference between the labor performed by the wage working class and the value, much less, of its labor power, returns in many different forms, employers profit, interest paid to the functionless capitalist, rent, to the various categories into which the capitalist class is divided, and to the owners of land. Marx draws a distinction between certain secondary forms, which we shall discuss later on, wages of direction or superintendence which, whilst nominally forming a part of profit, are, in fact, a remuneration of the labor of the employer, and dividends. To this division of surplus value amongst its various beneficiaries is added a further division into that part which they directly consume, and another part which they accumulate, or reinvest. Having in this way laid bare the anatomy of capitalist economy, Marx proceeds to examine its workings and the changing relations to which it gives rise amongst the various categories mentioned. Competition forces each individual capitalist, on pain of extinction, to accelerate the process of accumulation, to increase the scale of production, and to make himself the champion of technical progress. From this continual revolution in the methods of production the result. 1. The increase of, C, in relation to, V, arise in the organic composition of capital, 
tending to the elimination of man by the machine, to relative overpopulation. 2. The reduction of V in relation to SV relative surplus value, or, from another angle, reduction of relative wages, that is to say, a reduction of the share in the total product enjoyed by the working class. 12. One of the elements of relative overproduction, but only one of the elements. 3. The reduction of SV in relation to C plus V, a fall in the rate of profit, modified by factors operating in the contrary direction, and leading to periodical upheavals, the crises, which have a further cause in the increase of that part of SV which is accumulated, in relation to that part which is consumed. The changing relations between the various subdivisions of surplus value, employer's profit, interest in rent, give rise to still further conflicts, though less fundamental than the preceding ones. On the basis of the contradictions which we have pointed out, Marx then shows us the general tendencies of capitalist economy. We may sum up as follows. 1. The concentration and centralization of capital the ever-increasing preponderance of larger enterprises as against smaller ones, the progressive socialization, 13, of the economic process, and the monopolization of all the advantages of economic progress in the hands of fewer and fewer big capitalists. 2. An increase in the number of proletarians, that is to say, in the number of those who lack the means of production and thus the possibility of selling goods and are therefore obliged to sell their labor power in order to exist, a larger and larger majority of exploited workers is opposed to a decreasing minority of exploiting capitalists, and that majority is trained, united and organized by the very mechanism of capitalist production. 3. The aggravation of the contradictions inherent in the capitalist system, rendering its working more and more difficult and giving rise to a situation in which the transformation of capitalist property into the property of associated producers will be brought about by the irresistible logic of facts. The proletariat executes the judgment pronounced by private property against itself when it created the proletariat, just as the proletariat executes the judgment which it pronounces against itself when it produces riches for others and misery for itself. 14. It is the action of the proletariat, its class struggle, which thus becomes the subjective and decisive factor of social evolution, operating on the material basis of capitalist automatism, its laws and its objective tendencies. The origin of Marx's economic analysis lies in historical materialism. The question of the proletariat as a subjective factor in social development, which rises from an economic analysis leads us back to the materialist conception of history. How therefore does the evolution of capitalism react on the behavior of the proletariat? 3. History conscious of itself. The views dealt with in the preceding passages represent an extraordinary piece of far-sighted historical anticipation. During the revolution of 1848 and immediately afterwards Marx and Engels still harbored the illusion that the revolution which they considered the inevitable end of capitalism, was imminent, 15, but subsequently they soon realized that capitalism had by no means outlived its time, and that the proletariat was not yet ripe to enter into its inheritance. The following passage, dating from 1859, reads like an echo of abandoned illusions. No social order ever disappears before all the productive forces, for which there is room in it, have been developed and new higher relations of production never appear before the material conditions of their existence have been matured in the womb of the old society. 16. Historical necessity, which was the basis of socialism for Marx and Engels, has for its counterpart the historical limits indicated in the passage quoted, historical limits established by both material conditions and the degree of maturity of the human factor. It is the latter element which is so often neglected in our day by many of those who claim to be followers of Marx. And yet all their lives the actual founders of scientific socialism never cease to insist on the importance of this element. No one who has grasped the profound significance of historical materialism will find cause for surprise at this insistence. Historical materialism permits human society to seize upon the natural law of its own development 
although this knowledge at the same time forbids it to clear by bold leaps or remove by legal enactments, the obstacles offered by the successive phases of its normal development. 17. Thanks to historical materialism, humanity can consciously accomplish its historic actions, whereas in the past it accomplished them instinctively and in ignorance of their real meaning. The history of the human race becomes conscious of itself. This conscious realization obviously does not permit humanity to free itself from the natural and social laws to which it is subject, any more than a knowledge of physiology permits an individual to evade the process of growth to which he is subject from birth. But in becoming conscious of its own development society is aware of the path which it must traverse, it becomes free within the framework of those laws whose existence, action and necessary restraint it recognizes. Free will declared Engels, is nothing but the capacity to come to a decision in full knowledge of all the facts. It consists in that sovereignty over ourselves and over the outside world founded upon a knowledge of the essential laws of nature. 18. That is what George Polekhanov meant when he wrote. Sociology becomes a science only to the extent to which it arrives at an understanding of the human aims of social man as a necessary consequence of the social process conditioned in the last resort by the march of human development. 19. From the very beginning Marx never failed to stress the significance of this conception of history. Writing to Ruck in September 1843 he declares, All we are doing is to show the world what it is really striving for, consciousness is something which it must acquire whether it likes it or not. The reform of consciousness consists only in showing the world its own consciousness in awakening it from its dream of itself, in explaining to it its own actions. It will then be seen that for a long time it has possessed the dream of a thing of which to be really conscious is to enter into real possession. 20. Contributing to a controversy in the new Rennes Review about the year 1850 Marx restates this idea more clearly. It goes without saying that every great historical change in social conditions has been accompanied by a corresponding change in man's opinions and ideas, including his religious conceptions. The difference between present and past upheavals lies precisely in the fact that now the secret of the historical process of change has at last been discovered, and that consequently instead of deifying this exterior process, and making a new religion of it man sheds religion altogether. 21. It is in this that we see the greatest merit of Karl Marx. His historical materialism marks a clear distinction between the revolutions of the past and those still to come. Those of the past are characterized by the blind rush of mobs, ignorant of the part they are playing on the historical stage, a prey to illusions concerning even their own wishes and what it is possible for them to attain and incapable of seeing in the womb of the dying society against which they are in revolt the shape of the new order destined to arise as a result of their action. The socialist revolution, on the other hand, strong in its knowledge of the law of social development, can accomplish itself in full consciousness of what will replace capitalism in decline, but also in full consciousness of what this system cannot give before it has arrived at its full maturity. The method of Marx permits us to X-ray capitalist society and capitalist economy, and to distinguish the contours of the embryo developing in its womb. Henceforth humanity can make its own history in full knowledge of what it is doing. In a letter written in 1882 by Friedrich Engels to Karl Kautsky on the Polish question, we find the following passage, the real, not the illusory aims of a revolution are always realized after that revolution has taken place. 22. This remark refers to the Revolution of 1848, a bourgeois revolution characterized by a spontaneous and blind upheaval, by an ignorance of what Engels calls its real aims. Thanks to historical materialism, social development is now, or ought to be, stripped of that duality of real and illusory aims. Formerly the objective aims of revolution, unknown to man, and man's subjective aims, mocked by the actual course of development, were in perpetual contradiction. Now the subjective aims have ceased to be illusory, because the discovery of the laws of social development allows humanity to reconcile its subjective aims with these real aims, which are at last recognized. 
This identity of subjective and objective aims flows from that liberty defined by Engels as that sovereignty over ourselves and over the outside world founded upon a knowledge of the essential laws of nature. This identity of subjective and objective aims merely in the minds of a few leaders is obviously not sufficient to ensure the socialist transformation of society and its economic system. If historical materialism means for human history in general that history becomes conscious of itself, then to a still greater extent it must mean that the proletariat, according to Marx the essential factor in any socialist transformation, must become conscious of its own situation, of capitalist evolution and of the real aims of that evolution. The emancipation of the working class must be the act of the workers themselves. This statement, the first article of the statutes of the first international, often quoted but rarely commented upon, underlines what we have just said. The working people must emancipate themselves, but to be able to do so in the first place they must thoroughly familiarize themselves with the conditions of their struggle, and acquire that maturity without which all their efforts would be doomed to sterility. Marx and Engels always attached fundamental importance to this, from 1844 onwards Marx insisted upon it. It is not a question of knowing what this or that proletarian, or even this or that proletariat as a whole, momentarily makes its aim. It is a question of knowing what the proletariat is and what it historically must do in accordance with the nature of its being. Its historical aim and action are laid down for it definitely and irrevocably in the very conditions of its own existence and in the whole organization of contemporary bourgeois society. 23. In 1850, at the time of the split in the Communist League, Marx judged it necessary to tell the workers. You will have to go through 15, 20, perhaps 50 years of civil and international wars, not merely in order to change conditions, but to change yourselves and make yourselves fit to take over political power. 24. To the end of their days both Marx and Engels insisted on the absolute necessity of the intellectual development of the proletariat. The whole activity of the Second International, directly inspired by Engels in the years from 1889 to 1895, bears witness to this. Parallel with the development of capitalism the parties affiliated to the Second International worked vigorously to hasten the intellectual development of the subjective factor. The Working Class. In his well-known preface written in March 1895 to Marx's class struggles in France, Friedrich Engels boldly draws the lessons of historical evolution in the years from 1848 to 1895. After having stressed how many times Marx and himself had harbored illusions concerning the maturity of the situation and the tempo of development, he writes as follows on the defeat of the Paris Commune. And once again, twenty years after the time described in this work of ours, 1848, LL, it was proved how impossible, even then, was this rule of the working class. On the one hand, France left Paris in the lurch, looked on whilst it bled from the bullets of McMahon, on the other hand, the commune was consumed in unfruitful strife between the two parties which divided it, the Blanquists, the majority, and the proud Honists, the minority, neither of which knew what was to be done. 25. Engels speaks here of the inadequacy of the subjective factor, which, in any case, corresponded to the immaturity of the objective conditions, trenchantly described by him in the same preface. We shall see later on by what means certain sections of the working class movement, particularly Bolshevism, have sought to hasten artificially this process of subjective ripening thereby doing violence to history. For the moment it is sufficient to keep well in mind that in the eyes of the two founders of scientific socialism the maturity of the subjective factor was an indispensable condition for the establishment of the new order. However, we must not imagine that Marx and Engels conceived this process of intellectual ripening as something to be arrived at mechanically on a school bench under the upraised cane of a professional revolutionary, Lenin or of a technician of revolution, Max Eastman. Although they believed that the maturing of the proletariat, conditioned by capitalist development, should proceed parallel with that development, 
They were not less convinced that the more enlightened section of the workers' movement could hasten this process and save the working class from many useless defeats. They contended that the workers must arrive at their intellectual enfranchisement in the school of life, through experience of the social struggle. They energetically opposed all who, like Proudhon and Lassall, instead of seeking the real basis of their agitation in the vital elements of the working class want to dictate to the workers, according to some doctrinaire plan, the course they should follow. 26. When, several years after the death of Marx, the workers of the United States entered upon mass action and grouped themselves in their own organizations, Engels vigorously denounced the activities of those German refugees who sought to impose imported and not always correctly understood theories on the American workers. 27. Our theory, declared Engels, is a theory of evolution and by no means a dogma to be learned by heart and recited mechanically. The less it is imposed on the Americans from without, the more they will understand it from their own experience, and the better they will assimilate it. 28. If we have dwelt at some length upon this question of the consciousness and the maturity of the proletariat, and upon the place it occupies in the theoretical system of Marx and Engels, it is not only because in our day many Marxists neglect it completely, but also for the more important reason that without it only a fragmentary and vitiated idea can be formed of how the founders of scientific socialism regarded the socialist revolution. 4. The Socialist Revolution Capitalist evolution, characterized by the progressive intensification of all its inherent contradictions, leads, according to Marx and Engels, to a proletarian revolution. But while nothing could be clearer than the affirmations of the founders of scientific socialism on all points connected with the general tendency of that evolution, their indications as to the form the socialist revolution will take, and as to the shape of the new society to which it will give birth, are certainly lacking in precision. However, just this lack of precision is one of the most important characteristics which distinguish scientific socialism from utopian socialism. There is no question here of hatching a new ready-made world out of abstract speculation. The task is rather to further those real evolutionary tendencies, foreseen in their general outline, but known in detail to scientific investigation only to the extent to which they are revealed in the course of actual social development. As early as 1846 Marx clearly described the difference between his doctrine and utopian socialism. So long as the proletariat is not sufficiently developed to constitute itself as a class, so long as, in consequence, the struggle between the proletariat and the bourgeoisie has not acquired a political character, and while the productive forces are not sufficiently developed in the bosom of the bourgeoisie to allow a perception of the material conditions necessary to the emancipation of the proletariat and the formation of a new society, so long these theorists are only utopians who, to obviate the distress of the oppressed classes, improvise systems and run after a regenerative science. But as history develops and with it the struggle of the proletariat becomes more clearly defined, they have no longer any need to seek for such a science in their own minds, they have only to give an account of what passes before their eyes, and to make themselves the instrument of it. 29. It is in the course of capitalist development that the proletariat itself develops, that it constitutes itself as a class, that the resulting class struggle becomes a political struggle leading to the conquest of political power, itself a prelude to the transformation of capitalist property into the property of the associated workers. These general conceptions have so often been distorted at the hands of many of Marx's followers that it seems to us necessary to restate briefly his real ideas. Seeing that certain sections of the socialist movement now try to present Marx as an uncompromising upholder of violent methods, an advocate of a totalitarian dictatorship, and a supporter of collectivization introduced at one fell swoop and without compensation, and seeing that they have ascribed to him a grossly distorted theory of the state, we feel it necessary to compare the real Marxism of Marx and Engels with the apocryphal Marxism of certain commentators. The concluding paragraph of the Manifesto of the Communist Party reads, The Communists disdain to conceal their views and aims. 
they openly declare that their ends can be attained only by the forcible overthrow of all existing social conditions. And in his capital, referring to the birth of modern capitalism, Marx writes, force is the midwife of all old societies in labor. Force is itself an economic power. These are the two passages generally quoted to present Marx as an upholder at all costs of methods of violence, and to deny the name Marxist to whoever does not share this view. Two recent books are typical of this attitude, the one from the Ben of Berica, a critic of Marxism, and the other from Mr. Sidney Hook, who proclaims himself a disciple of Marx. 30. We must begin by defining our terms. The term violence usually evokes the idea of a struggle or combat, even of a pitched battle, in which recourse is had to force of arms, often against the law. But the term has also a less narrow and more general significance every time it is employed as a synonym of force, or power. If we accept the term in this larger sense we may logically say that all social order and all legality are founded on violence, that is to say on coercion. Incidentally, Rosa Luxemburg has dealt with this point excellently in her Die Belgische Erfahrung. We must draw a clear distinction between what should be called latent violence, another way of expressing the peaceful pressure of conflicting social forces, and active violence, brutal violence, exercised only occasionally. The first is the permanent state of relations between social classes, whilst the second is characteristic only of those very brief episodes in the life of society when open war breaks out between the various classes. To make ourselves better understood let us take an example from international politics. No one will deny that the peace enjoyed, if one may use their word, by Europe since the world war was founded on latent violence on the fact that the force of those powers desirous of maintaining peace was sufficient to restrain the bellicose powers from plunging the world into active violence. In international as in social life, latent violence is the permanent state of relations, whilst active violence is an episode brought about by the upsetting of the normal balance between the opposing forces. It is perfectly true that around the year 1848 Marx and Engels did not make this distinction between these two forms of violence, and they use the term without making any distinction between its two senses. That is easily understood, at that time the state of Europe was very far removed from democracy, and no change in the political and governmental regime designed to benefit the rising classes could be conceived of without recourse to active violence and illegal violence into the bargain, because it was directed against established legality. In any case, anti-democratic legality cannot be modified except by illegality, because a new legality cannot be born organically out of the old and obsolete legality. 31. In a democratic regime, on the other hand, latent violence, in other words, the peaceful pressure of conflicting social forces, very often enables society to avoid the brutal outbreak of active violence. We propose to return to this question towards the end of our book. For the moment we should like only to draw the attention of our readers to the fact that Marx and Engels subsequently modified their conception of violence, and that they did so in the light of historical experience. The progress of democracy in the second half of the 19th century was naturally not without influence on the development of their ideas. They began to realize that the conception of the proletarian revolution they formed in 1848 was cast too much in the mold of 1789. Franz Mehring, one of the founders of the Communist Party of Germany with Rosa Luxemburg and Karl Liebknecht, a man whom no one could accuse of reformism writes as follows in his biography of Karl Marx. The manifesto did not recognize the factory laws and trade union organizations as stages in the proletarian struggle for emancipation. The manifesto therefore regarded the reaction of the proletariat to the impoverishing tendencies of the capitalist mode of production too one-sidedly in the light of a political revolution. It based its conclusions on the English and French revolutions. 32. However, a quarter of a century after the publication of the Manifesto, that is, in 1872, we find Marx using quite different language. In his famous speech at Amsterdam on the morrow of the Hague Congress of the First International he declared, 
We do not claim that the means necessary for bringing about this aim, the emancipation of labor, LO, will be the same everywhere. We know that we must take account of the institutions, customs and traditions of the various countries, and we do not deny that there are countries, such as the United States and Great Britain, and if I knew your institutions better I should perhaps sad Holland, where the workers will be able to achieve their aims by peaceful means. But this is not the case in all countries. 33. After the death of Marx, Engels expressed the same idea on a number of occasions, the last being in March 1895 and his famous preface to Marx's class struggles in France. That preface is so well known that there is no need for us to dwell upon it at any length. In it Engels utters a warning against the illusions harbored by certain people with regard to the successful outcome of an armed insurrection. He affirms that capitalism fears the legal action of working class parties much more than any illegal action, and that it fears their electoral success much more than it fears an armed insurrection. He stresses the importance of universal suffrage, transformed from the means of deception which it has hitherto been, into an instrument of emancipation. 34, and he declares. The epoch of violent uprisings, of revolutions carried out by small minorities at the head of unenlightened masses, the italics are ours, LL, is past. Where it is a question of the complete transformation of the social organism the masses themselves must take a conscious part in the game, and understand the issues at stake and the cause for which they are fighting. We have learned this from the history of the last fifty years. However, in order that the masses shall understand what they have to do, long and patient work is necessary, and it is to this work that we are now addressing ourselves with a success which is driving our enemies to despair. We shall have occasion to refer to this preface again and to draw conclusions from it applicable to our own day, but for the moment our only aim is to disentangle the real ideas of Marx and Dengels from the incredible confusion caused by their commentators. From the quotations we have already given it follows, firstly, that the ideas of Marx and Engels changed and developed as they learned from historical experience, secondly, that it is false to present them as apostles of violent methods at all costs, and thirdly, that whoever ascribes ideas of non-violent say Lagandi to them would be equally wrong. In the light of the experience gained in the course of their lives as militant socialists they decided that under a democratic regime the workers would be able to achieve their aims by peaceful means, providing that capitalism did not itself destroy that democratic legality without which there could be no question of the successful adoption of peaceful means. We can only be astounded at the frivolity with which Baraka deals with this question. After having quoted that passage of the Manifesto of the Communist Party which seems to favor violent methods, he writes. This is the very basis of the opinions held by the founder of scientific socialism. One could, of course, also gather passages favorable to the idea of a peaceful revolution from his many writings but then one would land immediately in those sophistical subtleties which falsify the real thoughts of any author. 35. What would Berica say if we turned his argument round and based ourselves exclusively on quotations opposed to that idea? Why should his own interpretation be the only true one, even in spite of what Marx and Engels themselves wrote? Would it not be better to record the fact that the opinion of Marx and Engels on this point leaves a considerable margin for unforeseen circumstances? It is very regrettable that in this way Baraka has greatly lessened the value of his book, which is otherwise well documented and full of interesting observations. 36. Let us suppose the proletariat to be in power by one or the other of the two methods indicated by Marx. What would it do? According to most of our ordinary Marxists today it would establish the dictatorship of the proletariat. This formula, to which very little importance was attached by Marxists before the World War, has since been considered one of the main supports of the Marxist doctrine. Anti-Marxists like Berica, are at one with Trotskyist and Stalinist Bolshevists in excommunicating from the Marxist pale whoever dares to express a doubt that this formula is really the cornerstone of the Marxist system. 
Nothing better characterizes the confusion which has been created since 1917 than a comparison of two passages taken from two books written by Paul Louis and published within little more than a year of each other. At the beginning of 1931 he wrote, up to the outbreak of the World War it, the idea of proletarian dictatorship, LL, was the least discussed of all Marxist ideas. It was accepted as an axiom. 37. At the beginning of 1932 the same author wrote. Up to the year 1917 it, the idea of proletarian dictatorship, LL, was very little known and attracted hardly any attention, no one went deeply into the matter, and what socialist literature did mention the subject was practically negligible. 38. It seems to us that this latter passage flatly contradicts the former contention that the formula was accepted as an axiom. 39. In a book published in 1934 entitled What Marx Really Meant, G. D. H. Cole also expresses the opinion that the dictatorship of the proletariat is the cornerstone of Marxism, but he produces no other reference but the celebrated passage of 1875, with which we shall deal in due course. 40. That is indeed a strange proceeding for an author who proposes to explain what Marx really meant. Here again let us dot the I's and cross the T's. The phrase dictatorship of the proletariat is to be found in three places in the writings of Marx, and in two places in those of Engels. And even if there were ten or more references instead of five, we should still affirm one thing without fear of contradiction, neither Marx nor Engels ever fully explained what this phrase actually meant but wherever the context is more explicit it is quite clear that for them this dictatorship of the proletariat was synonymous, with democracy. Here is the first reference, dated 1850. Dot. The proletariat rallies more and more round revolutionary socialism, round communism, for which the bourgeoisie has itself found the name of blank why. This socialism is the declaration of the permanence of the revolution, the class dictatorship of the revolution the class dictatorship of the proletariat as the inevitable transit point to the abolition of class differences generally. 41. Writing on the 5th of March 1852 to his friend Wiedemeyer, Marx declares, What I did that was new, from a theoretical standpoint, LL, was to prove, 1, that the existence of classes is only bound up with the particular, historic phases in the development of production, 2 that the class struggle necessarily leads to the dictatorship of the proletariat, 3, that this dictatorship itself only constitutes the transition to the abolition of all classes and to a classless society. 42. And finally there remains the best known passage of all, that of 1875. Between capitalist and communist society lies the period of the revolutionary transformation of the one into the other. The corresponds to this also a political transition period in which the state can be nothing but the revolutionary dictatorship of the proletariat. 43. Engels uses this phrase twice in 1891. The first time on the 18th of March in his preface to Marx's Civil War in France, in which he writes. The German Philistine invariably falls into a holy terror at the words, dictatorship of the proletariat. Do you want to know? gentlemen, what that dictatorship really means. Take a look at the Commune of Paris. That is the dictatorship of the proletariat. And on the 29th of May 1891, in the criticism we have already mentioned of the draft program of German social democracy, he writes as follows. If anything is certain it is that our party and the working class can only come to power under the form of a democratic republic. Precisely this is the specific form for the dictatorship of the proletariat, as the great French Revolution has already shown. What general conclusions may justly be drawn from these passages? First of all that the phrase dictatorship of the proletariat when used for the first time in 1850 is seen to be associated with the name of Blanquois. This was a period in which Marx himself was still under the influence of certain Blanquist and Jacobin conceptions pointed out earlier by us in this work. However, even in this period the dictatorship envisaged by Marx was never opposed in his mind to the principle of democracy. 
the Manifesto of the Communist Party declares two or three years earlier, the first stage in the working class revolution is the constitution of the proletariat as the ruling class, the conquest of democracy. This attachment to democracy, and this is our second conclusion, will be met with again later. When Engels saw the model of a proletarian dictatorship in the Paris Commune, he identified the dictatorship with a democratic constitution, as he did on the 20th of May 1891 in the passage we have just quoted. It follows from this that for Marx and Engels the formula in question is nothing but a paraphrase for the exercise of political power by the working class. By what means other than through democracy could the working class possibly exercise political power? The proletariat is a collective body and not an individual. Before its will can be made known and before it can prevail, the shape of that will must be forged, and how can a collective will be forged into shape except in freedom under a democracy? Collective property, the aim of socialism, is inconceivable without democracy, for it cannot be collective until the collective body is free to determine the use to which it shall be put. Nothing could be clearer than the passages we have quoted. Those who set up the dictatorship of the proletariat against democracy have no right to call themselves Marxists. They have, of course, a perfect right to believe in dictatorship and to reject democracy. We do not propose to question that right at all, but only their right to invoke the authority of Marx and Engels, for whom the term proletarian dictatorship was synonymous with democracy. It is an open question whether it is expedient in our day to retain this ambiguous term, as Charles Longdit called it, which was originally employed to describe a democratic regime. However, we shall discuss this point later. For the moment, before going any further, it is essential to restate the authentic ideas of Marx and Engels as against the distorted interpretations of some of their followers and many of their adversaries. Closely allied to the question of democracy and political power is the Marxist conception of the state, or, to be more exact, Engels' conception of the state, which was, in any case, approved by Marx. According to Engels, dot, it, the state, LL, is as a rule a state of the most powerful economic class that by force of its economic supremacy becomes also the ruling political class and thus acquires new means of subduing and exploiting the oppressed masses. 44. Engels says as a rule, because he admits that under certain circumstances the struggling classes balance each other so nearly that the public power gains a certain degree of independence by posing as the mediator between them. 45. Apart, however, from these exceptional cases, the state, even a democratic state, was in the eyes of the founders of scientific socialism, the instrument par excellence of capitalist class domination, and this conception is absolutely in line with historical materialism, a political superstructure erected on a capitalist economic base is necessarily impregnated by all that emanates from that base. 46, however, when Lenin tries to demonstrate in his book State and Revolution, 47, on the strength of a single phrase taken from a letter written by Marx to Q. Gelman on the 12th of April 1871, that the proletarian revolution must smash the machinery of the capitalist state in order to set up the proletarian state, we are faced with an interpretation of Marx which can only be described as a distortion. 48. On this, as on many other occasions, Lenin accepts the form for the content and thinks it possible to change the content by smashing the old form. In reality the state can never become a useful instrument in the service of the workers except to that extent to which the economic basis of the state is changed from a capitalist to a socialist one. This is quite clear from the end of the second chapter of the Manifesto. Lenin would have been better advised to attack Marx's real ideas quite frankly rather than try to foist his own apocryphal viewpoint upon Marx. This now brings us to the problem of socialization. The accession of the proletariat to power is not a name in itself, but a means of bringing about the emancipation of labor by the establishment of collective property. We have already pointed out that Marx and Engels left us with only vague references, and that they did so precisely because they had a horror of all utopian schemes. 
but vague as these indications are, they are nevertheless clear enough to enable us to recognize that what is palmed off on us in our day as Marxism has nothing whatever to do with the authentic ideas of Marx and Engels. Those who claim that the founders of scientific socialism preached nationalization, 49, have only the manifesto of the Communist Party, published in 1847, to turn to for support, which proposes to centralize all the instruments of production in the hands of the state. However, the manifesto predates the first volume of Capital by twenty years. And still later Marx and Engels expressed themselves with even greater circumspection on this point. Compare, for example, chapter 27 of volume 3, of Capital with the Manifesto of the Communist Party. In a preface dated the 24th of June 1872 to a new edition of the Manifesto, Marx and Engels declare that no excessive importance should be attached to the revolutionary measures about which we have just spoken. Marx's name is again invoked by certain would-be Marxists who claim that socialization should be immediate and complete and extend to the entire economic system at once. In the first place these would-be Marxists forget that Marx envisaged only the collectivization of capitalist property, and not the property of those who themselves possess and use their own instruments of labor. These people seem to forget, too, that even in the heroic days of their youth, on the eve of 1848, Marx and Engels repudiated such an absurd conception. The draft of the manifesto drawn up by Engels says clearly that the suppression of private property is not possible at one blow, that the proletarian revolution will be able to transform contemporary society only by degrees. And a little later in the same draft we find him proposing to compel such employers as still exist to pay the same high wages as the state. 50. It is profoundly depressing to have to insist on such things, because whoever has even an elementary knowledge of the complex mechanism of contemporary economic life would regard as madness the suggestion that collectivization might be introduced completely from one day to the next, and even the enemies of Marxism have never called Marx and Engels lunatics. Those who claim that the principles of Marxism demand that socialization should be introduced without compensation for the former owners of property violate both the letter and the spirit of the doctrines of those whom they regard as their teachers. By careful reference to the text one cannot even say that Marx and Engels left the question open, though it may have remained so in their minds. However, although passages may be found in their writings where they admit the possibility of compensation, we do not know of one single reference where they formally reject it. Engels envisages the possibility of compensation in 1847 in the draft of the manifesto to which we have just referred. And later on Marx was even of the opinion that the compensation of English landed proprietors would be preferable to a civil war, as less costly. 51. We must apologize for having devoted so much space to what might perhaps be considered flogging a dead horse. We were certainly not moved by any love for such exercises. On the contrary, we very much regret having to waste so much of our time on the matter. However, there comes a point when even the most placid temperament rebels against the endless repetition of the same old untruths. In the end one's patience breaks down at the sight of people claiming to be Marxists in much the same way as the nudists claim to be followers of the theories of Wegener and by reading criticisms of Marx which should obviously have been addressed to other quarters, and finally by the daily distortion of a doctrine which most of its supporters and adversaries are content to know by hearsay. What has happened to Marx's teachings is that which happened to the teachings of Darwin, the public summed it up in the phrase, as simple as it is false, man descends from monkey. However, whilst this misunderstanding of Darwin's teachings does no harm to anyone, the misunderstanding of Marx, who is worshipped by great numbers of people who know nothing about his teachings, is fraught with truly disastrous consequences. For these reasons we feel it necessary to present the real ideas of Marx to our readers before proceeding to an examination of those ideas in the light of contemporary reality. Chapter 2 – The Evolution of Marxism what is regarded today as Marxism includes, in addition to the original fund of ideas formed by Marx and Engels, the contributions of their disciples. 
these contributions, are much more important than is generally thought by those for whom Marxism is nothing but a collection of stereotyped formulas endlessly repeated by the faithful, and approved by the guardians of orthodoxy. We can hardly stress too much that Marxism is a church only in the eyes of hostile critics and ignorant followers, and that a real Marxist orthodoxy is inconceivable without heresy. Writing eight years ago, we pointed out that the dialectical method, which is the basis of Marxist teaching, leads to an inversion of the conceptions of orthodoxy and heresy. We may be permitted perhaps to quote ourselves. It is dialectics which saves Marxism from stagnating in a mere repetition of the same formulas. Marxism can only remain Marxism providing that it always analyzes contemporary reality, which constantly develops and causes Marxism to develop in its turn. A Marxist cannot be orthodox unless he continually questions even the truths he has already acquired, including the words of Marx himself. A Marxist is a heretic if he confines himself to repeating mechanically the phrases, the counsels and the slogans of Karl Marx, that is to say, if he is orthodox in the way the church understands the word. A Marxist can remain orthodox only at the price of continual heresy. However, this heretical orthodoxy implies precisely the preservation of the fundamental basis of Marxism, the dialectical method. Once you abandon this method you will be either heretic or orthodox in the common, vulgar, religious sense of the words. But if you preserve the dialectical method, orthodoxy becomes heresy, and heresy becomes orthodoxy. 1. And so, before proceeding to our examination of Marx's doctrine, we must take a look at the contribution of his disciples. It goes without saying that this contribution is intimately bound up with the evolution of capitalism since the death of Marx in 1883 and the death of Engels in 1895. Marxism has developed hand in hand with the evolution of capitalism. Friedrich Engels died at the opening of the period known to us as imperialist, a period characterized simultaneously by an aggravation of the expansive tendencies of the great powers and by a considerable modification of the internal structure of capitalism in the more highly developed nations. It was only towards the end of the last century that the progress of the socialist parties became more rapid both in numbers and influence with regard to those institutions founded on universal suffrage. To the new problems raised by the expansion of capitalism and by the increasing strength of socialist organizations was added the birth of socialist movements in backward countries, where the belated development of capitalism gave rise to an independent proletarian movement even before these countries had gone through their full bourgeois evolution. The elements which determine the evolution of Marxism are thus many and varied. In various circles, differing from each other to the extent to which capitalism, and with capitalism the workers' movement, spread themselves over the world, the militant elements of the proletarian movement armed themselves theoretically from the arsenal of Karl Marx, and strove to apply his teachings to their particular situation. And in accordance with their circumstances, widely differing from each other, they arrived at differing if not antagonistic conclusions. More than one controversy which looked like a mere scholastic dispute was in reality nothing but a reflection of the changed conditions in which the struggles of the 20th century were taking place. We must continually bear this in mind if we are to have any hope of understanding the evolution of Marxism since the death of its founders. Our presentation of that evolution in this chapter will appear incomplete from more than one point of view. We do not propose to discuss the national, colonial or agrarian questions. In all these fields the contributions of Marx's disciples add nothing to the fundamental principles of Marxism, but proceed from these principles in order to determine the tactics of the movement in the given circumstances. What interests us within the limits of his book is the principles themselves and not their particular application. And for the rest we can speak only in passing of the important contributions to the economic theories of Marxism in the same period from Karl Kautsky, Rosa Luxemburg, Rudolf Hilferding, Otto Bauer and others. This book does not aspire to be a history of economic doctrines, and to our great regret we must, therefore, pass over in silence controversies which roused passionate interest, 
and some of which still do, amongst Marxist economists, touching upon them only when the study with which we are at present occupied obliges us to do so. I, the Kautsky Luxemburg Bernstein controversy. Two years after the death of Engels, Edward Bernstein opened the still celebrated controversy on the fundamental principles of socialist theory and on the tasks of social democracy, a controversy destined to drag on for years throughout the international socialist movement. 2. Bernstein launched an attack against the very fundamental principles of scientific socialism. He denied the intensification of the internal contradictions of capitalism, which, according to Marx, would one day inevitably lead to the collapse of capitalism and to the socialist revolution. In a series of institutions developing within the capitalist system, cartels, the credit system, working class economic organizations such as the trade unions and the cooperatives, municipal socialism, and the extension of social legislation, he saw the means of adaptation thanks to which capitalism would progressively succeed in solving the contradictions which undermined it. At the same time these institutions seemed to him to be the germs or embryos of a socialist order, whose development by means of long-term reformist action should be the primary, if not exclusive aim of the socialist party. To further this development it would be in the interests of socialist parties, he contended to abandon their idea of a violent revolution and to renounce both the theory and practice of the class struggle in order to find a common basis of agreement for collaboration with the democratic bourgeois parties. 3. For Germany Bernstein had the liberals in view. Such a tactic seemed particularly commendable to him because he was extremely skeptical of the political maturity of the working class, and greatly feared the premature accession of socialism to power. Bernstein's theories were vigorously opposed by Karl Kautsky and Rosa Luxemburg. We do not propose to deal here with their criticism of his views on the economic development of capitalism, its inherent contradictions, and the efficacy of its means of adaptation. We shall deal with it in the following chapter when examining the predictions put forward by Marx himself. The forty years of actual development which have unrolled since the opening of that controversy will enable us to see whether the facts confirm or refute Bernstein's ideas, which were so strongly condemned by Kautsky and Rosa Luxemburg. Apart from the economic side of this controversy and the purely theoretical criticisms made by Bernstein, with regard to dialectics, historical materialism and the theory of value. The point at issue concerns above all the practical action of the working class movement and its party. Bernstein declared himself in favor of methodical and patient reformist action, and in favor of adopting the more immediate demands of the Erfurt program. In this he was in no way in disagreement with either Karl Kautsky or Rosa Luxemburg. No socialist has ever been opposed to a struggle for reforms. But whilst Marxism regards the daily struggle for reforms as a means of preparing conditions for the achievement of the final aim of socialism, Bernstein, skeptical concerning the prophesied collapse of capitalism, abandoned this socialist aim altogether and regarded the reforms as ends in themselves. Whilst Marxism regards reformist action as calculated to prepare the proletariat for the conquest of power. Bernstein expressed the liveliest reservations towards this objective. Whilst Marxism believed that no reforms could be obtained without the class struggle of the proletariat, Bernstein repudiated the class struggle altogether and the conception of social democracy as an autonomous class party. The differences referred less to the objectives of daily practical action than to the spirit in which this action should be carried on. Rosa Luxemburg and Karl Kautsky remained convinced that the inherent contradictions of the capitalist system will inevitably result in its final dissolution, though they did not hazard any detailed prophecies as to the form this dissolution was likely to take, very comprehensible caution to anyone who knows the difference between scientific and utopian socialism. Thus socialist action, whilst struggling to obtain reforms within the framework of the existing order, must not lose sight of the distant perspective of the collapse of capitalism and the necessity of the working class taking power in order to establish a new social system. The political party of the proletariat, Kautsky declared, 
cannot remain a party of democratic socialist reforms, it must become the party of social revolution. 4. And Kautsky explains in greater detail what he means by this. It is naturally not a question of a revolution in the sense in which the police use the word, that is to say of an armed revolt. A political party would be insane which decided in favor of violent methods on principle when other surer and less costly methods were at its disposal. In this sense of the word the Socialist Party has never been revolutionary on principle. It is revolutionary only in the sense of knowing that on the day it obtains political power it can use it in no other way but to destroy the mode of production upon which the social order of today rests. Since the days of Lassol the Socialist Party has been at pains to establish clearly the difference between a revolution with pitchforks and flails and a social revolution, and to proclaim itself in principle in favor of the latter. 5. Kautsky adds, I blush to have to repeat such commonplaces. Today, more than 40 years after the opening of the controversy, we are compelled to blush again because we must repeat them not only for the benefit of those enemies of Marxism who seek to foist the pitchfork and flail conception of revolution on Marx, but also for the benefit of certain socialists in whose eyes the social revolution is synonymous with armed insurrection. When Bernstein condemned the idea of proletarian dictatorship, Kautsky replied, I do not affirm that the supremacy of the proletariat must inevitably take on the form of a class dictatorship. 6. And Rosa Luxemburg expresses her point of view in the following words. As to the well-known phrase of Marx concerning the agrarian question in England, upon which Bernstein also relies for support, we should probably attain our aim more easily by buying the land from the landlords. This phrase refers to the attitude of the workers only after their victory and not before. It is obviously quite clear that there can be no question of buying the property of the dominant classes unless the working class is in power. What Marx had in mind here was the peaceful exercise of proletarian dictatorship, and not the replacement of the dictatorship by capitalist social reforms. The absolute necessity of the conquest of political power by the proletariat was never at any time left in doubt either by Marx or Engels. It remained to Bernstein to proclaim the back door of bourgeois parliamentarism the instrument destined to bring about the greatest social transformation of all time, that is to say, the transition from capitalist to socialist society. 7. This passage calls for some comment. First of all we observe with interest that Rosa Luxemburg, who can certainly not be suspected of reformism, is not in the least horrified at the idea of buying up the property of the possessing classes. The Marxist theory must thus have suffered deterioration in the course of being popularized before present-day socialists, and not always those of the left wing, could reject the idea of socialization with compensation. Secondly. Rosa Luxemburg accepts the formula of the dictatorship of the proletariat, 8, but assumes that it may be peacefully exercised, wherein her views approximate to those of Kautsky, who speaks of proletarian supremacy. The following passage shows clearly that what is of more importance to her than the formula is the fact of the conquest of political power, which, for her, represents the beginning of the social revolution. Whereas Bernstein envisages the social revolution only in the form of capitalist social reforms. The last phrase of the passage we have quoted is open to various interpretations. Rosa Luxemburg passes a very unfavorable judgment on bourgeois parliamentarism, but not on parliamentarism as such. We shall have occasion to return to this subject when dealing later with present day problems. What is now called the crisis of parliamentarism is precisely one of these problems. 9. With regard to the fear that socialism might come to power prematurely, a fear due to Bernstein's disbelief in the maturity of the working class, which he expressed on several occasions, Kautsky and Rosa Luxemburg replied in almost identical terms that then there would be only one logical and practical conclusion for social democracy to draw from this skepticism and that was to throw its hand in. Kautsky also stresses the point that as far as political maturity is concerned, the working class can well stand comparison with any other social class. 
everywhere we find only an elite fighting in the front ranks, whose political capacities are decisive for the maturity of the class. In each class part of the mass follows the lead of this elite without taking the initiative itself, and part remains indifferent to the fight altogether. The political rule of the proletariat thus at first means nothing but the rule of its elite, as we observe in the case of the bourgeoisie, of the aristocracy, and of all ruling classes. 10. And we cannot expect the socialist party to come to power until that elite, together with the masses following it, has become strong enough to conquer power. 11. And on the question of a premature taking of power, Rosa Luxemburg expresses opinions which are sufficiently interesting to justify a short summary of their essentials here. After having pointed out that the cases in which power might fall into the lap of the proletariat by default, like derelict property abandoned by everybody, 12, are exceptional, and having repudiated Blanquist coups carried out by an active minority, Rosa Luxemburg declares the conquest of political power by the great enlightened mass of the people nothing but the product of the decomposition of bourgeois society and this decomposition as the economic and political legitimation of the conquest of power. She continues. Thus, although the conquest of political power by the working class cannot take place too soon from the standpoint of social preconditions, it must, on the other hand, necessarily take place too soon from the standpoint of political effect, the maintenance of power. The premature revolution, the fear that keeps Bernstein awake, threatens us like the sword of Damocles, and neither prayers nor supplication, fear nor trembling can help us. And that for two very simple reasons. First of all, such a great transformation as the passage from capitalist to socialist society is inconceivable at one blow by a victorious coup on the part of the proletariat. To think this possible would only be to relapse into real Blanquist notions. The socialist transformation presupposes a long and persistent struggle, whereby in all probability the proletariat will be thrown back more than once, so that the first time, from the standpoint of the final outcome of the struggle, it must necessarily come to power too soon. Secondly, the premature conquest of state power will also be impossible to avoid because these premature attacks of the proletariat are themselves a factor, and a very important factor too, in creating the political conditions for final victory. Only during the course of the political crisis accompanying its seizure of power, only in the fire of long and persistent struggles, will the proletariat attain the necessary degree or political maturity which will permit it to carry out the final great transformation. Thus, these premature attacks of the proletariat on the political power of the state reveal themselves as important historical factors which help to bring about and determine the moment of final victory. 13. The passages we have quoted seem to us to be important, even extremely important. For the first time a socialist author sets out to show us in a more definite manner how the taking of power by the proletariat is to be accomplished. It is not the methods, either peaceful or violent, but the very essence of the revolutionary process, that in its rise to power the working class will be repulsed more than once. Today, twenty years after the beginning of the period of revolutions opened up by the World War, we find that the opinions expressed almost 40 years ago by the great theoretician of international socialism have been completely confirmed by the facts. Irrespective of the methods employed, parliamentary or insurrectionary, whether in the advance of the proletariat towards power or in its retreat, and irrespective of the countries involved, for 20 years now we have witnessed incessant advances and retreats in the course of which the working class has undoubtedly acquired greater experience and political maturity. These prophetic views of Rosa Luxemburg show, besides, that since the end of the 19th century the great theoreticians of Marxism by no means envisaged the accomplishment of the social revolution from one day to the next, as though by magic, from which it logically follows that there can be no clear-cut division between the old society and the new. Those who cast a retrospective glance at past centuries can clearly see that this century or that period of several decades represents a definite division between two epochs. However, as far as the contemporary witnesses of the transformation in question are concerned, 
the division fills the whole of their lives. Here Rosa Luxemburg develops for the political revolution what Marx had already developed with regard to the economic transformation. 14. Unlike other commentators on the Kautsky Luxemburg Bernstein controversy, we do not propose to set ourselves up in sovereign judgment to determine who was right and who was wrong. We are content to leave this office to the facts, and we propose to give them the floor in the following chapters. For the moment let us content ourselves with striving to discover what new light has been thrown on the problems of scientific socialism by this controversy. Let us enumerate first of all the points on which Karl Kautsky and Rosa Luxemburg on the one hand and Bernstein on the other were in agreement. All declared themselves in favor of reformist action on the part of the working class within the framework of existing society, contrary to certain ideas which we have seen develop since, and particularly after the World War. Their principal upholder was the Italian Imadeo Bordiga. They were also in agreement in believing that the socialist transformation of society would be a long and arduous task and could not be carried out at one blow, that the revolution would not necessarily be accompanied by violence, that the supremacy of the proletariat need not necessarily take the form of a Jacobin dictatorship, and finally that democracy was an indispensable instrument to the proletariat, and the basis of its emancipation. In all these matters Bernstein's objections burst already open doors, and it was primarily Kautsky who pointed this out. However, there is certainly disagreement between Kautsky and Rosa Luxemburg on the one hand, and Bernstein on the other concerning the guiding aim of everyday reformist action, and concerning tactics. For the class struggle Bernstein proposed to substitute the cooperation of all classes interested in progress. He contended that this cooperation would be the best safeguard of democracy, whilst Rosa Luxemburg maintained that the bourgeoisie, even the liberal bourgeoisie, at least in Germany, was turning more and more away from democracy. This brief summary is sufficient to enable us to realize in what respects certain terms have changed their meaning since the opening of that controversy. Today the term reformist is applied indiscriminately to whoever refuses to believe in the necessity of a violent revolution under all circumstances and accords only a relative value to the formula dictatorship of the proletariat, to whoever proclaims his support of democracy, to whoever thinks that socialism cannot be brought about from one day to the next, and believes in the necessity of compensation for the expropriated capitalists. On all these points Kautsky and Rosa Luxemburg are just as reformist as Bernstein. However, it was by no means for his acceptance of these ideas that Bernstein was called a reformist in his day. The differences between Bernstein and his adversaries, differences which are of the essence of reformism, must be sought elsewhere. They lie in the fact that Bernstein abandoned the aim of socialism and the theory of the class struggle a proceeding which necessarily leads to the complete abandonment of the idea of classes. His idea of the gradual transformation of society and its economic system, more or less rapid according to given circumstances, is a rational one and borne out by all historical experience. It becomes absurd only because he robs it of its dynamic principle, the class struggle, and with the class struggle he also abandons the dialectical method. It was undoubtedly a merit of Bernstein's that he insisted more than anyone else upon the importance of the cooperatives and trade unions as embryonic forms of socialism, just as it was a merit of Rosa Luxemburg's that she sought to define the limits of these institutions and their possibilities within the framework of the capitalist system. 15. Perhaps these limits seemed narrower to Rosa Luxemburg than they were in reality, but armed with the dialectical method which Bernstein refused to use, she saw things which escaped him altogether. The productive relations of capitalist society are approximating more and more to the productive relations of socialist society, whilst, on the other hand, its political and juridical relations are raising a higher and higher wall between capitalist and socialist society. In order to break down this wall we must, according to her, use the hammer blow of the revolution that is to say, the conquest of political power by the proletariat. 16. We shall discuss this idea at greater length in the latter part of this work.
in the same way we shall reserve for later a closer study of the relations between the working class and the so-called middle classes. On this question there are serious if not irreconcilable differences of opinion between Kautsky and Rosa Luxemburg on the one hand, and Bernstein on the other. Neither side was in a position to appreciate sufficiently certain elements of capitalist evolution which became visible only in the 20th century. 2. Mass Organization and Mass Spontaneity Whilst the controversy with Bernstein was concerned to a great degree with the autonomy of the political organization of socialism as against the petty bourgeois and even bourgeois elements, 17, the controversies of the first decade of the 20th century dealt above all with the relations between the proletarian organization, whether political or trade union, and the proletarian mass itself, and also, therefore, between the party and the trade unions. These controversies took place in widely differing circles and historical conditions. In France it was a conflict between the political and the trade union organization, and it arose about the middle 1880s. In Russia the split which took place in 1903 between the Menshevists and the Bolshevists raised the question of the respective roles of the mass and the cadre in all its aspects. And in Germany, finally, under the influence of the Russian Revolution of 1905 on the one hand, and the increasingly reactionary and imperialist tendencies of capital on the other, a dispute arose concerning the relations between the trade unions and the party in connection with the problem of the mass strike. In the following treatment we propose to sacrifice chronological to logical sequence. We shall deal first of all with the split in the Russian Social Democratic Party, where the principal question was the relation between the masses and the cadres, a more general problem than that which deals with the respective functions of the trade union and the political movement. Whilst the controversy provoked by Bernstein does not go beyond the circle of ideas generally regarded as the inalienable patrimony of scientific socialism, the controversies with which we are now about to deal tend to develop new ideas. The controversy between Kautsky and Luxembourg on the one hand and Bernstein on the other raged around and illuminated existing ideas. The discussions which we are about to examine are concerned with problems hardly touched upon by Marx and Engels, but they seek to find solutions for these problems on the basis of Marxist principles. a. The masses and the cadres the differences which finally led to the split of the social democratic movement in Russia into Bolshevists and Menshevists in 1903 were concerned with tactics and organization. On the eve of an expected revolution ought one to follow the strict letter of the recommendations contained in the manifesto of the Communist Party and support bourgeois liberalism, seeing that the revolution at that time could be nothing but a bourgeois revolution? Or was it better to work towards an alliance with the masses of the Russian peasantry, whose revolutionary dynamism had remained intact, unlike the situation in Western Europe in 1848? We do not propose to deal with this latter point, where it was a question of applying Marxist methods to the analysis of a given situation, and where the differences proceeded not from matters of principle but from a different testament of social reality. In the discussion on organization, on the other hand, the disagreement concerned principles themselves. The Menshevists, together with Rosa Luxemburg and Trotsky, believed that Russian social democracy should be a party with a democratic structure, and that its leadership should be determined by the collective will of its adherents freely expressed. Lenin, 18, on the other hand, the spokesman of the Bolshevists, declared himself in favor of an authoritarian structure which would give a central committee all power including the power to dissolve and reconstitute, without possibility of appeal, all the local organizations, so that, in the last resort, as Rosa Luxemburg pointed out, the Central Committee would be able to determine at will the composition of the highest authoritative body of the party, its National Congress. 19. It is quite certain that in this discussion the ideas of Marxism were put forward by the Menshevists by Rosa Luxemburg and Trotsky. Martov, Axelrod and their friends stressed the blankest character of Lenin's ideas. Lenin himself described the Social Democrat as a class-conscious Jacobin indissolubly wedded to the organization of the proletariat, which is unquestionably an echo of the bourgeois revolution, 
in which the Jacobin was the hero. The essence of Blanquism is its conviction that the proletarian revolution must be modelled on the revolution of 1789, and in this sense there are undoubtedly traces of Blanquism in the Manifesto, just as more than one passage of its economic section is definitely more Sismundian than Marxist. It must be remembered in this connection that the first volume of Capital was published twenty years after the Manifesto. The development of Marx and Engels from the Manifesto to their later writings seems to have escaped Lenin. The Hungarian Marxist philosopher, Georgi Lukács, 20, explains the rigidity of Lenin's ideas on the question of organization by reference to what he calls the topicality, and what we should call the imminence, of the revolution. This explanation is attractive, but it fails to satisfy us. It is certainly true that whoever believes in the imminence of a revolutionary period is bound to prepare for it, and part of that preparation must be the creation of appropriate instruments, but then both Menshevists and Bolshevists were agreed upon the interpretation of the many signs which heralded the approach of the 1905 revolution. Anyone who denies the neo-Bolshevist thesis, according to which Lenin was always right and always infinitely superior to his adversaries, must refuse to admit that this eminence of the revolution, which was the preoccupation of all, inspired only Lenin, and at that with absolutely faultless conclusions. When Lukács speaks of the eminence of the revolution, he neglects to specify what revolution, bourgeois or proletarian. For the latter Russia was undoubtedly not ripe. She was then on the eve of her 89, not even of her 48, though her economic system was more advanced than that of Western Europe in the middle of last century. In the approaching revolution it was reasonable to expect a much stronger and a more vigorous proletarian element than in that of 1848, nevertheless, according to all the evidence, Russia was still farther away from a socialist revolution than the countries of Western Europe. The theory of Lukács would have been better founded if, instead of speaking of the imminence of the revolution as such, he had spoken of the imminence of the bourgeois revolution. Lenin's position and the anti-Marxist character of his ideas would then be perfectly explicable. If we remember that at that time Russia was on the eve of her bourgeois revolution, it is clear that we can expect no greater degree of maturity on the part of the Russian proletariat than the very modest one corresponding to the historical situation in which the social struggles of that day were proceeding. It naturally follows from this that the Russian working class movement was ripe for Jacobinism and Blanquism, but not yet ripe for Marxism. The form of organization proposed by Lenin was thus quite in accordance with the given circumstances circumstances in which it was impossible for Marxism to obtain a foothold in the Russian working class. The Menshevists, Rosa Luxemburg and Trotsky were absolutely right when they opposed Lenin's definition of a social democrat as a Jacobin wedded to the organization of the proletariat, with their own, very Marxist, definition, in reality social democracy is not wedded to the organization of the working class. It is the very working class movement itself. 21. This definition, although the actual formula itself is not to be found in the writings of Marx and Engels, is undoubtedly inspired by their spirit. The passages which we quoted in part 3 of the preceding chapter of this book admit of no doubt on this point. But the democratic form of organization which naturally flows from these principles, Marxist though it was, was not suited either to the epoch or to a proletariat not yet ripe for Marxism. Both Bolshevism and Menshevism were prisoners and victims of a situation in which Marxism as a living movement could be conceived of only in the mind. Under the pressure of circumstances, and taking into account the revolutionary realities of the situation, Bolshevism abandoned Marxism in the organizational question because the situation was not yet ripe for a democratic organization of the working class any more than it was about the year 1848 in Western Europe. 22. On their part the Menshevists and their allies, wishing to take into account those democratic necessities which are the sign qua non of the emancipation of labor, remained faithful to the spirit of Marxism, and under its influence repudiated the primitive, blankwist forms of organization advocated by Lenin. But in practice their organization, too, was that of an elite 
because the masses were not yet ripe for any form of organization. 23. The Menshevist organization, however, had this advantage over Lenin's organization, that it permitted free selection and safeguarded intellectual liberty, whereas Bolshevism did exactly the opposite, it killed all individual initiative, and finally handed over the control of the movement to mediocre spirits who were mere executive organs of a central committee dominated by one individual. 24. Marxism had therefore to suffer from the aberrations of the existing Russian political situation. Marxism appeared as a premature graft, not perhaps in all respects, but certainly in what concerned the organizational idea. The conception adopted by Bolshevism was a lapse into pre-Marxist sectarianism which Marxism had already overcome. It was in striving to apply Marxism to the particular situation of the Russian movement that one of the Marxist parties, the Bolshevists, itself lapsed into pre-Marxist socialism. We feel ourselves compelled to drag this controversy out of the oblivion into which it was fallen, most socialists of our day know nothing at all about it, because it undoubtedly led to a development of Marxist ideas. What Marx and Engels left as a mere sketch takes on infinitely more precise contours in the hands of Rosa Luxemburg and the Menshevists. The relations between the masses and the cadres, or, if you prefer, between the masses and their leaders, are defined as clearly as they possibly can be. In an article written in this period Rosa Luxemburg declares, In all the class struggles of the past, carried through in the interests of minorities, and in which, to use the words of Marx, all development takes place in opposition to the great masses of the people, one of the essential conditions of action was the ignorance of those masses with regard to the real aims of the struggle, its material content, and its limits. This discrepancy was, in fact, the specific historical basis of the leading role of the enlightened bourgeoisie, which corresponded with the role of the masses as docile followers. But, as Marx wrote as early as 1845, as the historical action deepens the number of masses engaged in it must increase. The class struggle of the proletariat is the deepest of all historical actions up to our day, it embraces the whole of the lower layers of the people, and, from the moment that society became divided into classes, it is the first movement which is in accordance with the real interests of the masses. That is why the enlightenment of the masses with regard to their tasks and methods is an indispensable historical condition for socialist action, just as in former periods the ignorance of the masses was the condition for the action of the dominant classes. 25. Rosa Luxemburg concludes from the foregoing that in the socialist movement the relation between the masses and their leaders is reversed as compared with the revolutionary movements of the past. The task of the leaders is no longer to impose their will upon the masses, but to enlighten the masses concerning their historic mission. It is the masses themselves who must lead the movement with their own means, and their leaders are only the executive organs of the conscious action of the masses. Rosa Luxemburg writes further in her polemic against Lenin. The only subject which the leaders of the movement today have to do with is the collective eye of the working class which resolutely demands the right to make its own mistakes, and to learn the dialectic of history by its own experience. And finally let us say bluntly that the mistakes committed by a really revolutionary working class movement are, historically, infinitely more fruitful and more valuable than the infallibility of the best central committee. However, she is well aware that the role which she assigns to the working class is in large measure an anticipation, not only for the Russian working class, but also for the working class of Western Europe, because reality did not then correspond to that ideal. In the article published in Die Neuzeit from which we have just quoted, she makes the following reservation. Without doubt, the transformation of the masses into confident, enlightened and lucid leaders, the fusion of science and the working class dreamt of by Lassall, is not and cannot be anything but a dialectical process seeing that the working class movement uninterruptedly absorbs new proletarian elements as well as recruits from other social classes. 26. In any case, such is and will remain the dominant tendency of the socialist movement, the abolition of both leaders and led in the bourgeois sense, the abolition of the historical basis of all class domination. 
In her polemic against Bernstein, Rosa Luxemburg had already pointed out that the indispensable arrival at consciousness and lucidity on the part of the masses would be a long and difficult process. The proletarian movement, she declared, had not yet become social democratic even in Germany, but it is every day becoming so. The Russian dispute on the organizational question thus permitted Marxism to define what ought to be the relations between the masses and their leaders. It clarified the ideas expressed by Marx and Engels regarding what we called in the previous chapter history conscious of itself. However, the tendency involved here is closely connected with the given degree of maturity of the working class. So long as the working class has not achieved the necessary degree of maturity, the knowledge of the real aims of the struggle, its material content and its limits must remain the property of a minority of leaders, and the reactions of the masses resemble those which characterized bourgeois revolutions. Hence came the Russian dilemma, to recognize frankly the lack of maturity of the masses, and advocate an organization of a Jacobin Blanquist type, thus turning one's back on Marxism, which is what Lenin did or remain faithful to Marxist organizational principles, and try to create a democratic organization, thus reducing the practical efficiency of the immediate action of the movement, which is what the Menshevists did. Although she was in agreement with the Menshevists, Rosa Luxemburg strove to resolve the dilemma by developing her theory of spontaneity. However, this in itself is nothing but the corollary of the Blanquist theory of organization held by Lenin. Both the one and the other rest on the historical basis given by the immaturity of the masses. The general conclusion which results from this is that Marxism cannot take hold of the masses until there has been a sufficient development of capitalism to prepare the ground for it, and this was not the case in Russia or even in Western Europe, though there it was more advanced. This also leads us to the more particular conclusion that the bureaucratic and dictatorial faults which certain left-wing elements take delight in denouncing in the political and trade union movements of the democratic working classes of Western Europe are a sufficiently reliable indication of the lack of maturity on the part of the masses. We are not referring here to lack of maturity in general, that goes without saying, but to the lack of that maturity necessary for a socialist revolution. What is often termed the dictatorship of party and trade union bosses, seeing that these bosses have no means of repression at their disposal, such as an OGP, or pilot isolators, or execution squads, rests solely on the consent of the masses. If at certain moments the leaders of the movement have to take decisions themselves, instead of leaving it to the masses, it would be better perhaps to attack the indifference of the masses rather than the dictatorship almost always imaginary, of the leaders, because the trade union and socialist organizations to which we are referring are not at all of the Blanquist type advocated by Lenin. The degree of democracy which exists in free working class organizations is the outcome of the given degree of enlightenment and maturity on the part of the masses, and this is itself, but not exclusively, there are other factors involved, the outcome of the given degree of capitalist development b. The political and the economic movement, the question of the relations between the political and the economic working class movements has always been different in France as compared with Germany. Superficially the disputes between the trade unions and the parties which played such a large role for several decades before and after 1900 in the history of the French working class movement would seem, it is true to be very similar to the controversy which took place in Germany during the decade which preceded the outbreak of the World War. On the one side of the Rhine, as on the other, the dispute was concerned with the question of which of the two movements, the political or the economic, should take precedence over the other. However, the historic conditions in which these two controversies took place were fundamentally different, as were the solutions to which they finally led. Whereas the French controversy took place outside the Marxist sphere, with the exception of the Gerstists, the German controversy was concerned with conflicting interpretations of Marxist doctrine. However, both the one and the other undoubtedly contributed to the enrichment of the Marxist doctrine by clarifying and developing ideas which Marx and Engels had merely sketched.
Let us begin with a brief examination of the position taken up by the founders of scientific socialism towards the problem of the economic and political struggle of the working class. As early as 1845 Engels stressed the importance of the economic movement. 27, and one year later we find Marx himself vehemently attacking Proudhon for his hostility to the trade unions and to strikes. According to Marx the degree of development of the trade union movement in a given country indicates the position occupied by that country in the hierarchy of the world market. Marx also attacked the liberal economists and the socialists of the day who condemned the trade unions, and he criticized the transcendental disdain shown by them towards strikes, combinations and other forms in which, before our eyes, the proletarians effect their organization as a class. 28. His notes on wages made in 1847 also show the importance attached by him to the economic movement, and in 1865, before the General Council of the International Working Men's Association, we find him defending the trade unions against the Onite Western. 29. The resolution on trade union activity adopted by the Geneva Congress of the International Working Men's Association in 1866 was drawn up by Marx himself. During a discussion with socialist working men in Hanover in 1869 Marx made a number of important observations to Hermann, the treasurer of the Metal Workers Union, the most important of which we give here. The trade unions must never be associated with or dependent upon a political group. Otherwise they would never be able to fulfill their task, and they would receive a mortal blow. The trade unions are the schools of socialism. In the trade unions the workers become socialists because they see every day before their own eyes the struggle against capital. Political parties, whatever they may be, can arouse the enthusiasm of the working masses only temporarily, for a time only, whilst the unions hold their loyalty much more securely, and it is only these unions which can be a real working class party and erect a bulwark against the power of capital. These declarations are sufficiently pertinent to occasion some surprise at the manner in which Pierre Boivin describes the attitude of Marx towards the trade union question. Marx was not exactly interested in trade unionism, he always considered it as a means of assembly and agitation to be subordinated to the political party, and not to be substituted for it in revolutionary action. 30. Well knowing the intellectual integrity and the scientific exactness of which Boivin has always given proof, we can see only one explanation of his manifestly false interpretation of Marx's attitude, and that is that Boivin, like many others, has confounded the ideas of certain Marxists, and of many Gerstists in this particular connection, with the authentic ideas of Marx. The Gerstists, and Jules Gerst himself, have, in fact, expressed themselves on more than one occasion in favor of the subordination of the trade unions to the political parties. 31, however, this attitude is far from being shared by all Marxists, very far from it, in fact. Writing on the eve of the World War, the Austrian Marxist Gustav Wechstein comments as follows on the Geneva Resolution of 1886 drawn up by Marx. The Geneva Resolution declares, it is true that it is the duty of the trade unions to support all social and political movements tending towards the complete emancipation of the working class. However, it places the accent on the second part of the phrase, that is to say, that they must consider themselves pioneers and representatives of the working class as a whole. It is obvious that Marx's attitude was determined by his experiences in England. One of the principal causes of the defeat of Chartism was the lack of an alliance between the political and economic movements. 32. In an historical study published in 1922 by a German communist author at a time when the communist parties had not yet fallen victim to their Bolshevization, we read the following concerning the observations made by Marx to Hermann on the subject of the independence of the trade union movement towards political parties. This warning foreshadows all the dangers which threatened trade union organizations founded as a nursery for a party. The sort of organization founded by Schweitzer, the Federation of Syndicates and Cooperative Groups in France founded by the Gerstists, 
and the Socialist Trade and Labor Alliance inspired by the Socialist Party of America, have confirmed this warning in all respects. 33. Although the position of Marx in the trade union question is clear enough for us to see that he quite definitely repudiates the domestication of the trade unions by a political party, it does not offer us any positive solutions. Marx and Engels always insisted that the character of the class struggle was both economic and political, but they did not leave us any definite practical plan for the relations between the economic and political organizations in this struggle. And that is easily explained. In their day both the political and economic working class movements were in an immature state. Seeing that they were opposed to utopian socialism and all its cut and dried schemes, Marx and Engels were obliged to await the practical evolution of things before deciding upon the concrete forms of development of the growing working class movement. In as far as we find contradictions in their expressed views, these contradictions are the outcome of an interpretation of still embryonic and fragmentary phenomena, not yet arrived at maturity. It was therefore left to their disciples to finish what they had merely sketched. However, one idea does appear with undoubted clarity from all the writings of Marx, namely, the class struggle of the proletariat is one, it manifests itself simultaneously on all fields, it is at the same time economic and political. 34, though, of course, Marx was well aware of the necessary division of labor between political and economic action, the capitalism of that day, as well as the working class movement was insufficiently developed to permit any definite shaping of the methods and forms of coordination, despite the fact that the need for the division was already apparent. In any case, these methods and forms developed practically according to the traditions and particular situation of each country. 35. In England the political movement seemed for a long time to be merely a reflection of the trade union movement. In Central Europe and in Scandinavia, on the other hand, it was political action which gave the decisive impulse to the economic movement. During the final decade of the 19th century the trade unions and the Social Democratic Party in Germany did not experience those conflicts which were at that period convulsing the French working class movement, because the persecution to which they were being subjected had the effect of drawing them together. 36. In France, on the other hand, the repression which followed on the defeat of the Paris Commune diminished after 1880. The memory of the persecutions and of the solidarity to which they gave rise gradually faded. We must bear in mind, too, that the German working class was intellectually not so far developed as the French working class, which was steeped in all the traditions of a glorious socialist and revolutionary past. We must not forget that socialist ideas flourished in France long before Karl Marx, and that it was in France that the working class had fought battles with the forces of capitalism which had shaken Europe to its foundations. Up to that time the proletariat had played a comparatively subordinate role in Germany, and it was therefore easier to set up a single organization there whereas in order to do the same thing the French proletariat would have had to divest itself of its sectarian influences and its pre-Marxist socialist traditions. The divisions and schisms of its political organizations, due as much, if not more, to the sectarian dogmas of the past as to the quarrels caused by contemporary problems, reacted in a disastrous fashion on the economic movement in France and caused it to turn its back on the quarrels of the politicians. However, even the syndicalist movement in France was not free from a heritage of sectarianism, represented in this connection by Bakuninist and anarchist tendencies. The survival of all these dogmas was favored by the slowing down of economic development in France from the Treaty of Frankfurt up to the World War. The French economic system remained essentially agricultural, and the concentration of industry proceeded only slowly with the result that the dispersion of the working class among innumerable small enterprises provided these old ideas with a soil particularly well suited to their survival. It is this insufficient centralization of industry which must be held responsible in the first place for the fact that French syndicalism remained for such a long time the concern of an elite, and failed to draw in the great masses of the wage workers. 
37, a movement of the elite is necessarily more impetuous than one which embraces the broad masses. Discussing this period, Leon Duhaux declares quite rightly. This was the period of revolutionary gymnastics of which, however, we should not speak too slightingly because it was useful to a movement which was still weak and yet had to call attention to itself. 38. The hostility existing between the syndicalist and the political movement in France was exacerbated by the entry of Millerand into the Waldeck Rousseau ministry. The collision between the syndicalist movement and the French socialist parties took on more and more the form of a conflict between two working class tendencies, the one revolutionary, the other reformist, and in the opinion of the anarcho syndicalists the latter included even the Gerstists. The whole process of development which led to and found its culmination in the Charter of Amiens in 1906 may be summed up as follows, opposition to the attempts of the Socialist Party or parties to capture the trade unions, and the independence of the trade unions in the name of revolutionary principles. 39, however, the revolutionary principles of a large fraction of the Anicho syndicalists were open to considerable suspicion and, together with the revolutionary gymnastics to which Duhaux refers, they were made up to a large extent of these old utopian views. The idea of the general strike as a synonym for the social revolution, conceived according to the anarchist scheme of Domlin E. Uwen Hewes, is the worst of all utopian plans, an utterly senseless formula. 40. The repudiation of parliamentary action, the only possible form of political action at that time, was equivalent to the repudiation of political action altogether. The Anicho syndicalists refused to admit glaring truths, that is to say, that the conquests obtained by direct action could not be consolidated except by legislation. Long before it was proclaimed they followed the famous tactic of class against class, with which in the years 1928-34 the French Communist Party did so much harm to the French working class and to French democracy. The Anicho syndicalists refused to recognize the class struggle except on the economic field, and they were quite incapable of seeing that it was also taking place on the political field. They represented the opposite pole of the worst exaggerations of certain Gerstists. Faithful to the principle of active minorities they seemed, despite their anarchistic ideas, a Western counterpart of Bolshevism, they wanted to act above the heads of the masses and they trampled democratic law underfoot even within the trade union organizations. 41. However, gradually these illusions died, and the absurd idea of purely economic action was abandoned. If the Anarcho syndicalists refused to coordinate trade union action with the action of the Socialist Party, then, unless they were willing to remain prisoners of their anarchist absurdities forever, they were forced to resolve on political action themselves, and in fact, addressing the Congress of Mians in 1906, Latapi declared. The very repercussions of syndicalist action point to the necessity of an action for the complete transformation of society. We are thus obliged to engage in politics, not electoral politics, but politics in the broad sense of the term. This declaration takes up again the idea expressed by Marx in the trade union chapter of his Poverty of Philosophy, the struggle of class against class is a political struggle. Subsequent practical development proved to be stronger than the utopian ideas of that time. After the close of the World War the tendency of the French CGT towards political action in the broad sense of the term became more pronounced. Its adhesion to the Popular Front was a political act. And the fact that the CGT no longer confines its activities strictly to the economic field does not prevent the maintenance of its independence, or the division of labor with the parties specializing in the political struggle or the coordination of its actions with those of the political parties for the attainment of specific objectives. The arguments of the apolitical anarchists of 30 or 40 years ago were highly suspect, but their practical action had the undoubted merit of safeguarding the independence of the CGT and placing it on a footing of equality with the political movement. That meant a lot. It was even in our opinion the essential thing. From the theoretical point of view it represented a considerable practical development of one of the least developed points in the Marxism of Marx. 
whilst the affirmation of the independence of the trade union movement appeared in France as the result of the opposition of the revolutionary tendency to the opportunist tendency. The same opposition in Germany led to left-wing socialists putting forward the theory that the political party should dominate the economic movement. Whereas French syndicalism, which had remained a syndicalism of the elite, neglected positive action up to the opening of the World War, the German trade union movement, which had rapidly attracted great masses of workers, 42, ended by going to the other extreme. The revisionist tendencies of the German Trade Union Federation, ADGB, became more and more evident from the beginning of the 20th century onwards. Most of the trade union leaders who appeared at the conferences of the German Social Democratic Party came forward as spokesmen of the extreme right wing. They were completely preoccupied with the immediate advantages to be obtained, they bothered their heads less and less with the final aim of the socialist movement and they pursued a tactic of compromise modelled upon that generally practised at that time by the British trade unions. This attitude caused vigorous reaction in the German Social Democratic Party, and the conflict between the party and the unions intensified to such an extent that it made itself clearly felt at all the conferences, etc., of the German working class movement of the day, whether political or trade union. It would obviously be absurd to make the individual trade union leaders responsible for this development. Unless we are prepared to adopt that primitive conception of history according to which everything even can be explained by the treachery of individuals, we are compelled to look for the causes in economic evolution itself. The numerical growth of any working class organization creates, whether we like it or not, a state of mind preoccupied chiefly with safeguarding its power and fearing to compromise its existence by engaging lightly in any struggles. Parallel with the development of trade union organizations grows a sense of responsibility amongst their leaders, who realize that their decisions may affect the lives of millions of wage workers. 43. This feeling of responsibility leads, by a curious psychological phenomenon to the movements becoming for certain people an end rather than a means. Socialists and syndicalists, both desirous of avoiding this danger, began to ask themselves whether political and economic working class organizations with enormous memberships, high dues and well-filled coffers were really a desirable thing. 44. In our opinion the question is badly formulated. It is not the organization as such which must be blamed but the circumstances in which it is called upon to act, and the circumstances which existed at the beginning of the present century in Germany undoubtedly favoured the opportunist development of the German trade union movement in the worst sense of that term. The expansion of German imperialism made it possible for the German working class to gain advantages by adopting a tactic of class collaboration. 45. A period of prosperity interrupted by two very short crises in 1900 and 1907 respectively, facilitated this evolution. Bernstein seemed to triumph in practice after having been beaten in theory. 46. At the same time, however, the political situation became more grave. Frightened by the electoral successes of social democracy, the reaction set about reducing the political rights of the German working class though they were already meager enough. The aggressive policy of Prussian militarism swallowed up larger and larger sums of money and greatly increased the financial burdens which pressed upon the working class. The threat of war came nearer and nearer. German social democracy, particularly after the Belgian general strike in 1902, began to envisage the possibility of recourse to a general strike but the German Red Union leaders put a veto even on the discussion of the possibility. It was in this situation that the Russian Revolution of 1905 broke out. In 1906 Rosa Luxemburg summed up the lessons of these events, in which, by the way, she had taken an active part in Warsaw, and she wrote a pamphlet, 47, to give Western European socialism the benefit of Russia's experiences. Firstly, her dialectical conception of the mass strike was opposed to the rigid conception of the general strike advocated by anarcho-syndicalism and repudiated by opportunism. Secondly, 
Her conception of the spontaneity of the masses was opposed to the totalitarian views of Lenin, and thirdly, her conception of the relations between the party and the trade unions approximated to the Gerstist point of view. According to Rosa Luxemburg, and to all other Marxists, the Russian Revolution of 1905 definitely and practically refuted the anarchist conception of the general strike as a synonym, or even as a vehicle of the social revolution. It confirmed what Engels had put forward against the Bakuninists in 1873, either the proletariat as a whole does not yet possess organizations and well-filled coffers, in which case it cannot carry out a general strike, or it is already powerfully enough organized, and in that case it has no need of a general strike. The events of 1905 showed that the most ardent appeals for a general strike remained without response, whereas mass strikes spread spontaneously like wildfire. This proves in the first place for the general strike what Marxism always affirmed for the revolution itself, that is to say, that it could not be made to measure and to order. 48. At the same time this also proves that when conditions are ripe, nothing can stop it. At a given moment in social development the situation is such that the tension in the social and political atmosphere bursts into conflagration and then waves of strikes breaking out spontaneously are its supreme expression. According to Rosa Luxemburg, these waves of mass strikes dot, have nothing whatever to do with the general strike of the anarchists, a synonym for the great day, a sort of Swedish knife which can be carried, just in case in the pocket, or opened and flourished at will. It cannot be prepared for in advance for a fixed date, it is a natural elementary product of social antagonisms when they have arrived at a certain degree of acuteness. For Rosa Luxemburg the mass strike is the first, natural, impulsive form of every great revolutionary action of the proletariat. The principal form of other days in bourgeois revolutions, barricade fighting, the open clash with the armed forces of the state, is nothing but a culminating point for the revolution of our day a moment in the whole course of the proletarian mass struggle. And this is the new form of the revolution in which that civilization and that mitigation of the class struggle prophesied by the opportunists of German social democracy is brought about. 49. Rosa Luxemburg regards the mass strike not so much as the last ramification of old bourgeois revolutions, but rather as the first harbinger of a new series of proletarian revolutions. She regards it as the specific form of these revolutions, which, she believed, would lead in Germany to the dictatorship of the proletariat. 50. It can readily be seen how far removed is this conception both from that of Lenin and that of the French syndicalists at the beginning of the 20th century. To the idea of active minorities, dear to Lenin and to the French syndicalists, Rosa Luxemburg opposes the spontaneous action of the mass against the ultracentralism of Lenin, who desired that the Central Committee should set itself up as the schoolmaster of history, she puts forward the fruitfulness of the working class struggle itself, against the non-political attitude of the Anarcho syndicalists she insists upon the importance of the part to be played by the Socialist Party, whose task it is, according to her, to take over the leadership of revolutionary events, not in the technical sense but in the sense of general political direction. 51. In striving to draw practical conclusions from the revolution of 1905 for the struggle of the German proletariat, Rosa Luxemburg finally adopts an attitude which approaches very near to that of the Gerstists. The trade union struggle concerns the immediate interests of the working class, whilst the socialist struggle concerns its future interests. The trade unions represent only the interests of groups and of a stage in the development of the working class movement. Socialism represents the working class and the interests of its emancipation as a whole. The relation of the trade unions to the Socialist Party is therefore the relation of a part to the whole, and the popularity of this theory of equal rights as between the trade unions and social democracy is due to a fundamental misconception of the unions and the part they should play in the general struggle for the emancipation of the working class. 52. 
It is quite certain that this attitude of Rosa Luxemburg was determined by the opportunist tactic of the German Red Union Federation, compared with which social democracy, placing the accent more on the final aim of the struggle, which the unions had lost sight of, appeared like the incarnation of complete working class emancipation. The fight against opportunism led in France and Germany to diametrically opposed conclusions. In France it led to the repudiation of political action, happily only a temporary repudiation, and one which has now ended in the return to what in our opinion is the perfectly justifiable principle of trade union independence. In Germany it led to the unions being proclaimed, purely theoretically, subordinate to the German Social Democratic Party. Both these conclusions are very far removed from the views expressed by Marx. The fact that the class struggle is at the same time both political and economic must express itself in a division of labor, wherein the best solution is cooperation on an equal footing whatever the practical forms and methods may be. A brief indication of the economic arguments with which Rosa Luxemburg justified her thesis of the necessary subordination of the unions to the party may perhaps prove useful. She stated them first in her polemic against Bernstein and his followers, 53, and developed them later in a course of lectures delivered at the Social Democratic Party School in Berlin. 54. Rosa Luxemburg bases her arguments on the fall in relative wages on which Marx dwelt in more than one passage of his capital, and later in his theories of surplus value. 55. Seeing that the share of the wage workers in the total product is measured by the value of labor power compared with the value of the product, the increase in the productivity of labor, by lowering the value of the commodities consumed by the wage earning class and lowering to that extent the value of labor power, leads to the lowering of wages in relation to surplus value. According to Rosa Luxemburg, the working class may, in its struggles on the economic field, be successful in raising the nominal and the real level of wages, but it is powerless to arrest the decline in relative wages. This is an inexorable consequence of an economic system based upon capitalist property upon the exclusion of the working class from the ownership of the means of production. The fall in relative wages, the intensification of capitalist exploitation, cannot be ended except by the abolition of capitalist property, and the first condition for this is the conquest of political power, and, in its turn, this is the task of the political party. Rosa Luxemburg's reasoning suffers from two defects, the one economic, the other political. From the economic point of view she overlooks the shortening of the hours of labor, which to a certain extent, though not completely, because it is accompanied by an intensification of labor, makes up for the decline in relative wages. Further, the shortening of the hours of labor leads from the economic to the political field because it becomes the subject of legislative enactments. From the political point of view Rosa Luxemburg's reasoning is faulty because she regards trade union action as absolutely synonymous with economic action. Although it is true that the struggle against the fall in relative wages goes beyond the economic sphere, it does not follow that it goes beyond the trade union sphere, or that it does not lie within the competence and functions of trade unionism, which may, as has been practically demonstrated more than once, play a political role. Rosa Luxemburg's reasoning unquestionably confirms the theory put forward by Marx in his Poverty of Philosophy, according to which the economic struggle is at the same time a political struggle. Rosa Luxemburg vigorously condemns the non-political utopian views of the Anicho syndicalists, but she completely fails to demonstrate that the political struggle, which is indispensable if any check is to be placed on the fall in relative wages must of necessity be carried on exclusively by the political party. It remains for us now to examine more fully her ideas on the mass strike considered as the specific form of proletarian revolution in our day. We shall return to them later and discuss them in the light of the historical events of the last twenty years. Chapter 3, The Ordeal by Fire the events which burst upon the world in 1914 and let loose a constant stream of catastrophes make it seem desirable to undertake a serious examination of Marxist doctrine in their light. 
certain facts seem to confirm this doctrine, whilst others seem to refute it. The war itself was at one and the same time a most striking confirmation of what Marxists like Rosa Luxemburg and Rudolf Hilferding, one, had predicted with regard to the general tendencies of capitalist development, and the complete wreck of all the hopes which had been placed in the power of the international working class movement to resist the outbreak of war successfully. The tremendous crisis which shook the world in 1929, and whose effects could still be felt in 1939, was another striking confirmation of the Marxist theory, though its political repercussions seemed to be a refutation of that theory, seeing that this great economic catastrophe, whilst annihilating all the anti-catastrophic arguments of Bernstein, gave rise in various countries to mass movements which, far from carrying socialism to power, buried it in prisons and concentration camps. In Russia self-styled Marxists are in power and have undertaken the establishment of socialism over one-sixth of the globe. However, the triumph of this socialism has for the past twenty years reconciled itself, oddly enough, with the basest persecution of all the authentic socialists belonging to the working class international, and even since 1924, of all the surviving leaders of the November Revolution of 1917. All these contradictions do not exactly facilitate an examination of Marxist theory, and every event presents us with a series of pros and cons. We have the choice between two methods, to take the events one by one and to examine whether they do or do not confirm the views of Marx and of his followers, or to take the fundamental principles of Marxism one by one and examine whether what has happened since 1914 confirms or refutes them. We are in favor of the first method, which has the advantage of following the chronological order of events, which we should be obliged in any case to recapitulate, if only summarily. However, we propose to make an exception with regard to the economic theories of Marxism, but we shall examine them only briefly, because it is obviously becoming more and more difficult to deny them, and it seems idle to us to attempt to burst in open doors. I, the unquestionable triumph of Marxist economic doctrine. We have two things to examine here, the laws of capitalist economy, and its tendencies. 2 the development of capital towards a higher and higher organic composition, or, in other words, the growth of constant capital as compared with variable capital, is demonstrated today by all available statistics. Technological unemployment is a fact which no one can any longer deny. 3. In the United States between 1921 and 1929 the authorities even registered a decline in the absolute numbers of the working class as a result of technical progress. The decrease in variable capital in relation to surplus value, fall in relative wages, is also confirmed by the facts. At the end of the first volume of his Apogee of Capitalism, Werner Sombart establishes this by statistics reaching from the beginning of the 19th century to the end of the first decade of the 20th century. 4. We have already seen that the fall in relative wages is modified by contrary tendencies. 5. But there is reason to believe that these tendencies have been less operative since the World War, as indicated by the following figures for the non-extractive industries of the United States. 6. Wage percentage in the new values created. Year percentage. 1989 41.6. 1904 42.3. 1909 40.8. 1914 41.9. 1919 42.8. 1923 42.6. 1925 40.1. 1927 39.3. 1929 36.5. 1933 36.0. With regard to the tendency for a fall in the rate of profit, that fall has long since ceased to be a tendency, and now operates in an absolute fashion. The Marxist theory of crises is the only theory which can boast that it has been confirmed by the facts in an epoch when the upholders of all other theories have been compelled to confess the inanity of their doctrines.
7. We do not propose to dwell any further on this point, because all supplementary demonstration would really be futile. The concentration and centralization of capital have also been confirmed by facts. In all countries there are abundant statistics to support this point. The economic system is developing more and more towards increasingly collective forms, towards a centralization exceeding anything that could have been imagined even less than ten years ago, and out of which regulating organs, control levers, develop and consolidate themselves. 8. It may be objected that Marx did not foresee all the forms of this process. Agreed, but he did foresee the essential forms, including joint stock companies and capitalist monopolies. 9. Let us refer those who claim that Marx knew nothing about all this to his capital, and we may also add before we leave this subject that in his finance capital, Rudolf Hilferding considerably develops Marx's theory. It is also objected that the concentration of capital is taking place only in industry and commerce, the small businessman could say a lot on this point, and that agriculture has been left untouched by the process. In reply to that objection two observations will suffice, the one for the content and the other for the form. Marx's theory is founded on the hypothesis of free competition, and where this free competition no longer exists, the development he predicted is naturally blocked or turned from its course. Let us suppose for a moment that European agriculture were deprived of the protective barriers which defend it against overseas competition, would not the centralization of agriculture then take place in the twinkling of an eye, and to the accompaniment of what convulsions, as the result of the enormously superior competitive power of American agriculture? So much for the content. As to the form. Karl Kautsky pointed out forty years ago, in the course of a detailed study, by what varied methods and under what multifarious forms capital was capturing agriculture in such a way that small-scale agriculture would not necessarily disappear and give way to large-scale agriculture. 10. Faced with an increasingly centralized capitalism, the numbers of the proletariat must, according to Marx, increase and concentrate. In this case also, Marx's predictions have unquestionably been confirmed. On reader man objects, it is true, that the number of manual laborers has been on the decrease for between fifteen and twenty years, and that the number of clerical employees, of foremen, and of administrative personnel in general, has in the meantime increased. This objection is worth taking into consideration, but it in no way invalidates the economic predictions of Marx. For Marx a proletarian is a man who does not possess tools of production, and who in consequence is compelled to sell his labor power in order to live. The clerical employee is just as much a proletarian as the manual worker, and today it is a commonplace to speak of the widespread proletarianization which has taken place since the end of the World War. The economic predictions of Marx have thus been confirmed by the facts. On the other hand, the more rapid numerical increase of clerical employees as compared with manual workers is a social phenomenon which neither confirms nor refutes the Marxist theory, because Marx never at any time made any definite prophecy with regard to the proportions which might exist between the different categories of the wage working classes. It is a new social phenomenon which contemporary Marxism must interpret satisfactorily. With regard to the intensification of the inherent contradictions of the capitalist regime predicted by Marx, we must be excused for being brief, because since 1929 reality has amassed a weight of evidence in this respect as convincing as it is painful. No one any longer dares to deny the existence of these contradictions, and the privileged classes themselves are so well aware of them that they seek more and more to stifle the facts by a dictatorship destructive of liberty of thought and freedom of conscience. It has been left in our day to a number of muddle-headed reformers or revolutionaries to discover that in the last resort it is not the contradictions of the regime which are to blame, but, money. After this rapid glance, all that remains to be done is to underline certain particular aspects of the problem. Henry Ford promised us a new heaven and a new earth with his theory of high wages, and he even found followers in Europe. 
This theory was intended at one and the same time to resolve all capitalist contradictions, do away with crises, and annihilate Marxism. The German Marxist Jacob Walcher, 11, refuted this theory as early as 1925, but, favored by a period of economic prosperity, a very relative one only, by the way, it experienced a certain amount of success for some years, a success repeated at the beginning of the present crisis, and it did a certain amount of damage even in the ranks of the working class movement, where it was imagined that the raising of wages as an isolated measure might be a means of countering the crisis. However, this phase has since passed, and working class organizations, both economic and political, are turning more and more resolutely towards those reforms which attack the very structure of capitalism. And, finally, since 1929 we more and more frequently find arguments on the expansion of capital, on world competition, on trustification, and on credit, in the daily press and in theoretical reviews by no means Marxist, to which any Marxist might subscribe with a light heart. Unfortunately the authors of these studies are for the most part ignorant of the fact that the ideas they consider so original are in fact of pure Marxist origin. A perusal of certain chapters of the Erfurter program of Karl Kautsky, 12, Finance Capital by Rudolf Hilferding, and The Accumulation of Capital, by Rosa Luxemburg, would quickly convince them. On the economic field the controversies between Marxism and its adversaries can be considered as closed. Capitalism has developed in the direction prophesied by Marx and his followers. The objections advanced 40 years ago by Bernstein have been refuted by the facts. Trustification and credit, far from diminishing capitalist contradictions, have driven them to extremes, as Kautsky and Rosa Luxemburg insisted that they would to Bernstein at the time. The process of socialization proceeding in the capitalist economic system gives the capitalist structure more and more socialist forms, but that collectivization in form, far from diminishing the antagonism between labor and capital, renders it, on the contrary, more acute than ever. The hopes which Bernstein placed in the development of the joint stock company, which seemed to promise the democratization of fortunes, have vanished. The economic catastrophes which we have been experiencing for the last twenty years have proved, on the contrary, that the mass of the shareholders have been robbed and expropriated by a new oligarchy, whose advent Marx himself predicted in his capital. Any objective examination on this point will inevitably confirm the Marxist theory. Let us quote the latest of these confirmations which comes from a research group comprising men of all social classes, striving in such measure as is permitted by human imperfection to make an impartial study of the great problems of our epoch without doctrinal prejudices. We read there. Generalization, democratization of property, such seems to have been originally the essential object of the joint stock company. Since then. This original conception has been signally diverted from its real aim. We can say today that the actual state of the joint stock companies does not, in fact, any longer assure the reality of their property rights to the shareholders. The development of the joint stock companies has arrived at this paradoxical consequence that, far from favoring the diffusion of property, it gives rise to an exaggerated concentration of property rights. 13. We cannot resist the temptation to compare certain passages of this study, which might be quoted in its entirety, with certain passages of Marx's capital. We shall see that the only difference is one of terminology. Nouveau gay highs. Closely bound up with the whole of the modern economic system, the joint stock company is in large measure responsible for its development and its present embarrassments. An increasingly important demobilization. The uncontrolled increase in the means of production. Disastrous crises which spread ruin throughout the modern world. Marx's capital. Hence the credit system accelerates the material development of the forces of production. At the same time credit accelerates the violent eruptions. The crises, and thereby the development of the elements of disintegration of the old mode of production. 14. Nouveau gay highs. 
large companies are controlled by boards of directors who hold only an insignificant number of shares, and who recruit themselves by cooping new members from amongst their families or friends. The maintenance of this power, which rests on founders' right only, is the constant preoccupation of certain directors of joint stock companies. The interest of the shareholders is of secondary importance, the principal thing being the importance and prestige of the company. Marx's Capital It reproduces a new aristocracy of finance, a new sort of parasite in the shape of promoters, speculators and merely nominal directors. It is private production without the control of private property. Since property here exists in the form of shares, of stock, its movement and transfer become purely a result of gambling at the stock exchange, where the little fish are swallowed by the sharks. Thus we observe that a few individuals are able to appropriate social property. 15. Nouveau gay highs. In certain cases, French law, 16, without taking due precaution or demanding sufficient guarantees, encourages unscrupulous businessmen to launch out on risky enterprises with capital too easily obtained, capital which does not belong to them personally and for which they are not responsible, and then to develop their means of production or action irresponsibly. Marx's Capital. Dot. Credit offers to the individual capitalist. Absolute command of the capital of others and the property of others, within certain limits, and thereby of the labor of others. What the speculating wholesale merchant risks is social property, not his own. Both success and failure lead now simultaneously to a centralization of capital, and thus to an expropriation on the most enormous scale. Credit gives to these few more and more the character of pure adventurers. 17. The difference between the two texts is slight, even in the terminology. The only really appreciable difference lies in the respective dates at which they were written. The study published in the Nouveau Cahiers is quite recent, whereas that of Marx is between 60 and 70 years old. And yet, if we are to believe certain Marx slayers, Marx knew nothing whatever about credit in general or its particular form in the joint stock company. 2. The World War. Even today, more than a quarter of a century after the outbreak of the World War, the powerlessness of the workers' international in face of that war is still the subject of fierce dispute. No one, no matter to what group he belongs, will deny that the World War represented a terrible defeat for international socialism. However, opinions differ widely not only with regard to the cause of the defeat but even with regard to what exactly represented that defeat. Did the defeat lie in the fact that the international was unable to prevent war, or did it lie in the triumph of chauvinism throughout the working classes? Or did it lie in the treason of a certain number of leaders, an explanation much favored by simpletons? This last solution has, of course, nothing whatever to do with Marxism. Without denying the important role in history played by great personalities, Marxism refuses to explain great historical happenings by the genius or the defects of individuals. At the beginning of the first chapter of his Revolution and Counter-Revolution in Germany, 18, Friedrich Engels writes as follows concerning the defeat of the Revolution in 1848. But when you inquire into the causes of the counter-revolutionary successes, the you are met on every hand with the ready reply that it was Mr. This or Citizen that who betrayed the people which reply may be very true, or not, according to circumstances, but under no circumstances does it explain anything, or even show how it came to pass that the people allowed themselves to be thus betrayed. And what a poor chance stands a political party whose entire stock and trade consists in a knowledge of the solitary fact that citizen so and so is not to be trusted. It is quite certain that during the World War there were cases of treason, for instance, no other word could be used to describe the attitude of an Osk, whose speeches in the Reichstag covered German social democracy with shame. In refusing the right of self-determination to the population of Alsace-Lorraine, the majority socialists in Germany treated elementary socialist principles with contempt. 19. However, such cases of individual treason cannot explain the defeat of the Socialist International in 1914. 
Most of those who explain everything by treason reproach the socialist parties in the belligerent countries with not having proclaimed a general strike against war, 20, and with having refused to make defeatism the guiding principle of their actions. In this respect it is pertinent to observe that the socialist parties never at any time undertook to answer a declaration of war by proclaiming a general strike, or to practice a policy of defeatism during a war should one break out. 21. We do not propose to inquire for the moment whether they were right or wrong in refusing to assume such responsibility. We merely register the fact. The socialist parties were not guilty of treason. The resolutions of the international did not impose the duty of launching a general strike against war upon them, or of adopting a defeatist policy during the war, or even the abandonment of the idea of national defense. 22. Even supposing the existence of such recommendations or injunctions, it would still be wrong to speak of the treason of certain leaders. All those who lived through the terrible days of July and August 1914 know that the working people as a whole and in all countries were obsessed by the fear of imminent invasion and quite ready to take up arms against the invader. Karl Liebknecht himself admitted it. And if in spite of all this the word treason must be used, then we must say that the working class betrayed itself. However, in that case the word treason loses the significance normally attached to it. It is also said that by their attitude during the war, socialist parties abandoned Marxism, but the general strike against war, defeatism, and the rejection of the idea of national defense find no place as recommendations in the writings of Marx and Engels. It is, of course, quite possible to accept these ideas, but those who proclaim them so enthusiastically have no right to style themselves the only authentic followers of Karl Marx, and still less right to condemn those socialists who reject them as traitors to Marxism. The attitude of Marx and Engels towards the wars of their day, at a time when the proletariat was intellectually undeveloped and numerically weak, almost without organization and entirely without parliamentary representation was dictated above all by the desire to issue their triumph of the bourgeois revolution where national revolutionary wars were concerned, and in general to issue a victory of the more advanced country over the less advanced. Their chief aim in this was to further the general interests of the socialist movement, whose development demanded the expansion of the capitalist mode of production and the establishment of a democratic regime. Since the end of the 19th century the problem of war has changed its form. The era of national revolutionary wars is definitely at an end, at least in Europe. Even in Eastern Europe, whether in the case of the Russian Empire or the Balkan Danubian region, the national aspirations of the oppressed minorities have become nothing but valuable tools in the hands of neighboring imperialisms. In consequence, a revolutionary war begun by one of these oppressed nationalities for its freedom would run the risk of losing its main objective, in itself progressive, and plunging the whole of Europe into a disastrous war, which in the last resort would lead not to national liberation but to the triumph of one or the other of the conflicting imperialisms. It was this situation which caused Rosa Luxemburg to write in her Crisis of Social Democracy, 1915, that in the epoch of imperialism, there can no longer be national wars, 23, an observation which gave rise to vigorous protest on the part of Lenin. 24, whilst Rosa Luxemburg goes to the length of rejecting the right of self-determination in the epoch of imperialism, even denying the right in the event of a victorious proletarian revolution, 25, Lenin, on the contrary, is in favor of national revolutions, whose drive, he contends would accelerate the dynamism of the proletarian revolution. However, once this drive has done its work, Bolshevism refuses in practice what it promised in theory to national aspirations, as we can see, in particular, in the case of Georgia. 26. Neither the conclusions of Rosa Luxemburg nor those of Lenin seem to us to be acceptable. The right of self-determination is an integral part of democracy. Democratic socialism dare not repudiate it without denying itself. But there is a great difference between accepting this principle, and lending active support to any national war whatever under the pretext that it would serve the cause of the proletarian revolution. 27. 
that would be playing with fire at a time when such wars, however localized they may be in origin, might easily set fire to the whole of Europe. The events of 1912 and the Balkans proved this to the hilt. Technical progress has enormously increased the destructive power of the engines of war, and has been the greatest single factor modifying the socialist attitude towards war. In Marx's day the progress resulting from a revolutionary war still outweighed the destruction and loss it caused, but for the past half century the massacre and destruction attendant on war have threatened to obliterate all progress. Friedrich Engels was quick to realize this. Writing to Bernstein in 1882, one year before the death of Marx, he deals with the insurrection in Dalmatia as follows. We have to work for the emancipation of the proletariat of Western Europe, and we must subordinate everything else to that aim. However worthy of interest the Balkan states and their affairs may be in themselves, they mean nothing to me when their national aspirations come into conflict with the interests of the proletariat. The Alsatians are also oppressed. But if on the eve of an imminent revolution they wanted to provoke a war between France and Germany, again setting these two nations at each other's throats, and thus staving off the revolution, I should cry, halt. You can exercise as much patience as the European proletariat. When the workers of Europe are free, you will be free too, but until that time we shall not permit you to thwart the struggle of the working class. 28. Ten years later, in an article published in the Almanach du Parti Ouvrier, Engels expresses himself in almost identical terms. Between a socialist France and a socialist Germany there could be no Alsatian question, the matter would be settled in the twinkling of an eye. It is only a matter of waiting for ten years or so. The French, British and German workers await their deliverance, cannot the patriots of Alsace-Lorraine wait too? Is it worthwhile risking the devastation of a whole continent and, in the last resort, its subjection to the yoke of Zurism for this? Is the game worth the candle? These passages show clearly that Engels greatly feared a European war, whose ravages would equal those of the Thirty Years' War compressed into three or four years and spread over the whole continent, bringing famine epidemics and the general deprivation of the armies and the peoples in their train as a result of their acute misery. 29. He feared these ravages because he thought they might put back the social revolution by 10 or 15 years, as he pointed out in the above-mentioned article in the Almanach du Parti Ouvrier. The attitude of Engels in this matter is thus poles asunder from that of Lenin and the Leninists, who wish to use national revolutionary movements in order to add to the proletarian revolution a motive force not its own. Engels' attitude is also opposed to that of Rosa Luxemburg because it regards the proletarian revolution as an instrument capable of giving the oppressed peoples the right of self-determination, a right which Rosa Luxemburg refused to recognize. The primary care of socialism is thus to prevent war and this consideration takes precedence over what the socialist attitude towards the war should be should it nevertheless break out. The war did break out in 1914, and demonstrated that the international working class movement was too weak to prevent it. Is it still necessary in our day to stress the puerility of the reproach directed to working class organizations that they did not have recourse to the general strike? Lenin himself saves us the trouble. In his famous Haig thesis he condemns the slogan of the general strike as utopian. How could a proletariat which was not strong enough to prevent the outbreak of war use the general strike weapon to oppose the disaster once it had come upon the world? We have already pointed out that the various socialist parties, seeing that they never declared themselves against the idea of national defense, did not commit treason in subsequently declaring themselves in favor of it. In the pre-war international the principle of national defense was repudiated only by the anarchistic tendency of Gustav Herve and his friends. Right up to the outbreak of war, from the extreme right to the extreme left of the international, with the sole exception of the Bolshevists, there was agreement on the principle, and disagreement only on the question of its application. In face of the untruths still hawked around even to this day by certain people in the socialist movement, though more no doubt from ignorance than bad faith, 
We find it necessary to remind our readers here that the gravest reproach leveled by Rosa Luxemburg against the German majority socialists was that they had deserted the principle of national defense. Yes, certainly, democratic socialists are obliged to defend their country in a great historic crisis. Just in this lies one great terror of the social democratic fraction in the Reichstag, which, whilst it was solemnly declaring on the 4th of August 1914, in the moment of danger we shall not leave our country in the lurch, was denying its own words. It did leave its country in the lurch at the hour of its greatest danger. 30. As may well be imagined, Rosa Luxemburg's conception of national defense was quite different from that of the majority socialists, but nevertheless, the extreme left wing of the socialist movement was just as firmly attached to this principle as was the extreme right wing, and it is a gross falsification of history to say that it was the acceptance of the principle of national defense which paralyzed and disrupted the international in 1914. However, with certain socialists the idea of national defense degenerated after the outbreak of war into a blind submission to their respective governments, to the total abandonment of the right to criticize, and to a pure and simple abdication in face of the ruling classes, even to the extent of enthusiastically accepting their annexationist aims. 31. This state of mind was particularly marked in the Social Democratic Party of Germany and it has never been better defined than by Friedrich Adler when he wrote of those socialists who permitted themselves to be mobilized ideologically. 32. This is social patriotism or social chauvinism, which abdicates in face of the reaction, which, instead of working for peace at the earliest possible moment, is in favor of prosecuting the war to complete victory, whatever the cost and whatever the sacrifices and which often enough even welcomes the outbreak of war with a light heart. Social patriotism is the counterpart of defeatism. Extremes meet, and it is easy to pass from one to the other. Gustav Herve and Alexander Millerand demonstrated the truth of this, a long time ago, and today the leaders of the French Communist Party are about to follow in their footsteps. As we have seen, Social patriotism means the abdication in face of the privileged classes at home, the abandonment of any independent working class policy, and the blind acceptance of their will, but defeatism means exactly the same thing, except that it is towards the privileged classes on the other side of the battlefront. Both the one and the other of these two extremes deliver the workers bound hand and foot to the mercies of those against whom they should defend themselves. And, in any case, history shows us that once the desired defeat has been attained, the privileged classes, both victors and vanquished, join hands over the trenches, still soaked with fresh blood, to crush the proletariat with one accord. The defeatists of our day do not seem to have understood the lessons of the Thais Bismarck Alliance of 1871, and of the Hungarian Soviet Republic of 1919. The defeat suffered by the Socialist International in 1914 was thus not the result of treason, it was merely the inevitable result of the weakness of the International Socialist Movement, a weakness both practical and theoretical. The facts prove that the working class movement was not strong enough to stave off the disaster. It took several years before it was able to emerge from its ideological confusion. In France, the minority became a majority only in 1918 whilst in Germany the elections in January 1919 gave the independent socialists only 2.3 million votes as against 11.5 million votes for the majority socialists. 33. Let us then abandon once and for all the legend of the treachery of the leaders, and have courage enough to look reality in the face. The war took the working class by surprise, practically it was not strong enough to resist it successfully and ideologically it found itself a prey to indecision owing to the fact that, with the exception of Italy, the workers of all countries were faced with the threat of invasion. As far as we know, weakness is not synonymous with either shame or treason. Although the international working class movement was unable to prevent the outbreak of war, it began to find its feet again in 1915-16.
the ideology of social patriotism lost ground visibly, and by 1918 it retained its hold only on a steadily diminishing fraction of the organized working class. Defeatist ideology was never at any time accepted by any large masses of the people. After the end of the World War the mass of the organized working class seemed to have recovered its spiritual equilibrium and to have arrived at a certain unity of thought. It even appeared possible that the international would be able to reconstitute itself without any very great difficulty. However, the World War proved only the beginning of an uninterrupted series of upheavals, and they made it necessary for international socialism to rechart its course. A succession of new and often unforeseen events gave rise to discussions on constantly changing problems. In face of a situation fundamentally different from that which prevailed before the World War, a change of policy became necessary. Naturally, this change also resulted in vehement discussion, which was then envenomed by the intervention of Bolshevism with its will to disruption on the international field. Thus the ideological differences were given an organizational basis. 3. The Objective Causes of the Split The military collapse of Russia and then that of the Central Powers resulted in the breakdown of their autocratic regimes. Democracy having been won, socialist parties came to power everywhere and took over the reins of government from the politically bankrupt classes discredited by the war, and the question then arose, would socialism as an economic system also take over the succession from shaken and disorganized capitalism? which threatened to founder in general chaos. The World War seemed to have opened up the era of proletarian revolution. After its terrible defeat in 1914 international socialism took its revenge, and what a revenge! In a good half of Europe capitalism was either swept away altogether, as in Russia, or was at the mercy of socialist parties, as in Germany, Austria, Czechoslovakia and Hungary. In a tidal wave, the masses of the people, extending beyond the ranks of the proletariat proper, cast their votes for socialism and gave it their adherence. Everything seemed possible providing only that sufficient boldness were shown. However, these dazzling perspectives vanished after a very short space of time. Those who were in power as the representatives of the majority of the working class failed to display the necessary boldness. Were they right or wrong? We shall soon see. The boldness of a minority working for a more complete social transformation was insufficient to overthrow the existing regime. And even where that minority was successful, in Russia, it did not bring about socialism. It might be hastily concluded from this that the working class movement inspired by Marx suffered bankruptcy after the war just as it collapsed at the beginning of the massacre. Some people have drawn this conclusion, and in consequence they despair of socialism in general, both in theory and practice. In our opinion they have gone too far and too fast. First of all, is the defeat of this or that action necessarily synonymous with the bankruptcy of whatever doctrine inspired it? Did the 18th Brumaire and the 2nd of December represent the bankruptcy of the doctrine and principles of republicanism? Must a refutation of monarchism as a government principle necessarily rely on such arguments as the execution of Louis XVI, Waterloo and Sedan? Above all, we must take the circumstances in which an action is carried out into consideration, and the relation of forces prevailing, or, if such and such an action is not attempted, we must consider what opportunity was offered to attempt it. And, finally, bankruptcy and defeat are very relative terms. They acquire their entire meaning only from the question, in relation to what? In comparison with the utopian hopes of those who believed in 1918-19 that socialism could be carried out completely and at once, the years 1920-21 obviously brought the bankruptcy of socialism all along the line both in Russia and in Central Europe. However, just one of the misfortunes of those days was that so many socialists harbored grandiose illusions concerning the maturity of capitalism, and its corollary that of the working class, and the possibilities of the socialist transformation. Today these illusions still haunt those who allow themselves the luxury of ill-considered criticism of socialist action after the war. Now, after an interval of over twenty years, the situation of those days can be appreciated more objectively and with less partisan feeling.
we can sum it up as follows, deeply undermined by the war, capitalism entered upon the period of its decline, the era of proletarian revolution opened up, the question of socialization passed from the sphere of theory to that of practical action. The working class, strong in its trade union and political organizations, considerably more powerful than they were before the war, was able to throw a decisive weight in the scales of political and economic life. These points were generally admitted in the working class movement, from the extreme left wing to the extreme right wing. The latter, however, regarded the decline of capitalism as a passing phase only, due above all to the shock of war, 34, and, without refusing to envisage the possibility of socialization, counted upon a speedy recovery of the existing regime. The extreme left wing, on the other hand, were convinced that the knell of capitalism had definitely sounded, and that the socialist movement should proceed with all possible speed to take radical steps. Such differences of opinion with regard to the measure and degree of what ought to be done, differences which rose frequently before the war on various questions, were quite natural, and of themselves would certainly never have brought about a split. For this to come about a particular constellation of circumstances was necessary, and in this respect socialism was, alas, only too well served. Generally speaking, differences of opinion result in an organizational split only if they give rise to actions so diametrically opposed to each other that life under the same roof becomes impossible, 35, or if one of the conflicting tendencies advocates principles of organization which imperiously demand its constitution as an autonomous party. The first of these conditions for a split was present in Germany in 1916 and the second arose subsequently in 1919 on the international field. Let us discuss the first of these conditions. The policy of one fraction of German social democracy was such that an organizational split became inevitable. Karl Kautsky was absolutely right when he declared that the disruption of the movement into majority and independent socialists was all the more deplorable because it cut off the most resolute opponents of social patriotism from the mass of the party and retarded the growth of the opposition, but he agreed, in any case, the split could hardly have been avoided except by the conclusion of a speedy peace. 36, however, from the moment when one fraction of the party is hounded persecuted and harassed by the police with the consent and approval, and at times upon the direct denunciation, of another fraction of the party, then it is clear that the maintenance of unity is impossible. Once the war was at an end, the obstacles to unity which resulted from the diametrically opposed policies of the two fractions seemed for a moment to have vanished. Independent and majority socialists shared power in November 1918, 37 but grave differences of opinion soon made themselves felt. They centered on the date of the convocation of the National Assembly, but behind that apparently harmless question of a date was hidden the more serious questions of the revolutionary harvest to be gathered in before the appeal to universal suffrage. It was both a political and economic harvest. From the political point of view many things might, in fact, have been done, for instance, the immediate disarming of reactionary and monarchist elements in the army, and the carrying out of a republican purge in the state apparatus. From the economic point of view it would have been more difficult to act rapidly, and we do not believe that the immediate harvest could have been very abundant. The excessive prudence of the majority socialists carried the day. History has since shown us that they were wrong but they were undoubtedly expressing the sentiments of the immense majority of the German working class. At the National Congress of the Workers' Councils which took place in Germany at the end of 1918, the independents represented only a small minority, whilst Karl Liebknecht and Rosa Luxemburg had no mandates and were not even present. The immense majority of the Congress approved the standpoint of the majority socialists. The minority free to pursue and intensify its propaganda, might reasonably have hoped to carry its point of view to triumph during the course of the revolutionary process. The first phase of all revolutions is invariably characterized by the abundant growth of illusions. This was pointed out by Marx in his 18th Brumaire, 
and Rosa Luxemburg constantly insists on it in the numerous articles written by her and published in November and December 1918 in the Rote Fahne. 38. The task was thus to win over the majority of the German working class for the bolder solutions put forward by the left wing. However, the left wing itself was a prey to deep divisions. The group of Rosa Luxemburg, Karl Liebknecht and Franz Mering, the so-called Spartacus League, seceded definitely from the Independent Socialist Party, and constituted itself the Communist Party of Germany on 31 December 1918. In the ranks of the Independent Socialist Party, the left wing, numerically weakened by the departure of the Spartakists, was opposed to the right wing, morally weakened by its participation in power together with the majority socialists. The latter, sole masters of power since the end of December, Hayes, Dittmann and Bath having resigned as a protest against the increasingly repressive anti-working class policy carried out by their majority socialist colleagues, appealed to the most reactionary elements of the old army, the monarchist officers, in face of a rising wave of working class agitation, and this perpetuated the division between the majority and independent socialists by the fault of the former. However, the cleavage between the Spartacus League, which had constituted itself the Communist Party of Germany, and the Independent Socialist Party was without any justification. 39. This was a grave fault of which the disastrous consequences appeared on the very day of the foundation of the Communist Party. The sectarian elements, for the most part new recruits to socialism led by a few older socialists who had lost their heads, went beyond Rosa Luxemburg and her friends, and obtained a majority for a proposal to boycott the elections to the National Assembly. However, these elements were more than sectarians, like most of those who come to socialism in unsettled periods, they confused Marxism with Blanquism, and armed uprising with revolution. And it was these elements who, against the advice of Rosa Luxemburg, launched the putsch on 6 January 1919 which created an opportunity for the tragic assassination of Rosa Luxemburg and Karl Liebknecht. We have no intention of withdrawing anything we may have written during the past 20 years of our socialist activity concerning the abominable role played by the Eberts and Nosks in the German Revolution. However, elementary justice forces us to recognize that the thoughtless antics of raw recruits, who had no idea of the real situation, who were unable to discipline themselves, and who were incapable of accepting the soundest advice even from a leader like Rosa Luxemburg, must also bear their share of responsibility for what happened. We feel ourselves obliged to emphasize this with all the more insistence today because the happenings in Clichy, 40, in March 1937 gave us a foretaste of what would threaten the French working class movement if that mass of newcomers, in need above all things of a strong dose of socialist education, should find a center for the coordination of its disastrous policy of revolutionary gymnastics in a dissident organization, poor in numbers, but a happy hunting ground for agents provocateurs. 41. The blood which flowed widened the gulf between the different fractions of the German working class, and the influence of masses of new recruits weighed upon the policies of all working class parties. The petty bourgeois elements, radicalized by the revolution, showed a preference for the majority socialist organization, and caused its policy to veer still farther to the right. On the other hand, those working class elements which, up to then, had remained unorganized and were hardly touched by the true spirit of socialism, flowed generally into the independent socialist party and into the Spartacus League where their putschist tendencies caused the disastrous ravages with which we are now all familiar. Mass spontaneity, upon which Rosa Luxemburg had counted so confidently as the primary motive force of the proletarian revolution, now turned against the revolution. Throughout the year 1919 strikes and risings, unprepared and lacking coordination, flared up and died down in all parts of the Reich at the bidding of active minorities. The revolutionary fraction of the German working class bled itself white in trying to act over the heads of the majority, who repudiated the conquest of power after the model of the Russian Revolution, and in bleeding itself white it weakened the offensive force of the whole working class.
Nosk turned for help to the most reactionary circles of the old imperial army, the officers who had learned nothing and forgotten nothing, and enabled the privileged classes, who, for the moment, had been driven from the scene, to come back and prepare their revenge. March 1920 witnessed the reactionary cap putsch, from which the Republic was saved only by the prompt and unanimous action of the working class. But hardly was this danger past when Nosk again let loose the riders were against the workers who had taken up arms to defeat the rebellious generals, and the generals who had failed in their attempt to bring back Wilhelm from Holland were at least given the base satisfaction of revenging themselves personally for their disappointment by shooting and massacring the working men whose action had saved the Republic. And the majority socialists let them do it. They also neglected to purge the courts of justice and remove those ruling class judges who closed their eyes whenever they were called upon to deal out justice to the murderers of revolutionaries, or even to the murderers of simple Democrats like Herzberger and Rathnau. 42. The happenings in Germany briefly described above throw light upon the objective causes of the split in the German working class movement and show us that they were due to a series of particular circumstances against which human goodwill was powerless. The split took place in tragic circumstances. The socialist parties of Austria and elsewhere were spared the experience. According to their temperament and to their estimate of the situation. The socialist militants of other countries supported the one or the other of the tendencies which were tearing the German working class movement asunder, but they did not find their own differences sufficient reason for causing a split in their own organizations. They felt no inclination to follow the German working class movement in its errors to the point of organizational disruption and fratricidal strife. Working class disunity, limited to one country, is certainly an evil but it is a minor evil which leaves the unity of the international intact. Before the war the existence or several French or Russian socialist parties did not represent a threat to the unity of the international. However, the minor evil became a major one the moment Bolshevism crossed the Russian frontier and appeared on the world stage. 4. The Subjective Cause of the Split in the International We have already described the Bolshevist organizational theory, which, although labelled Marxist, in reality represents a lapse into blankism, and has its routes in the backward state of Russia in general and of the Russian working class in particular. Bolshevism is a sectarian and authoritarian organization intended to group only a small number of resolute professional revolutionaries ready to carry out without discussion or orders emanating from a central committee responsible to and controlled by no other body. It is the very party for leading unenlightened masses in revolt, and directing their drive towards objectives whose real significance and repercussions are known only to the professional leaders. In short, it is the classic type of organization produced by the bourgeois revolution, and adopted by the nascent working class movement in the first half of the 19th century in Western Europe, and by the Russian working class movement later. The international spread of Bolshevism after the end of the World War is often attributed to the great prestige given to it by the Russian Revolution of November 1917. That is doubtless true, but only in part. The psychological effect of those ten days that shook the world was certainly enormous. How can a revolution arriving in power and proposing to all the world an immediate peace without annexations and without indemnities fail to win at once the active sympathies of the peoples? already heartily tired of slitting each other's throats. How can a revolution carried out by a socialist party fail to fill the masses of the working class with hope? How could a revolution, whatever its label, and providing that it seemed to bring peace nearer, fail to move the conscience of the world? And when the seizure of power by the Bolshevists was followed by the adoption of economic measures which were, rightly or wrongly, we shall discuss this point later, considered socialist, the masses of the people began to identify Bolshevism with socialism. However, there is a wide gap between all this and the blind acceptance of Bolshevist methods by the workers of Central and Western Europe. For admiration to change into imitation, and for the wish to defend the Russian Revolution from its enemies to change into the willing acceptance of the orders of its governing party, a constellation of certain conditions, which was in fact not present everywhere, 
was necessary. One of these conditions, the desire of Bolshevism to bring about a split in the international working class movement, was present and apparent in all countries. However, this desire would not have been sufficient in itself had it not found an echo, stronger in some countries, weaker in others, in the heart of the working class masses. For the seed of Bolshevism to take root in Central and Western Europe it had to fall on favorable ground. It found it in the masses of people who came to socialism under the shock of war, just those masses who had not gone through the school of democratic socialism before 1914. Whoever, in recalling the series of events which followed on the World War, tries to understand what happened during the terrible years of disruption from 1918 to 1920 must be astonished at the strange behavior of the masses during that troubled period. He will find that there was not one mass, but two masses, two masses quite distinct from each other despite a large measure of overlapping and fusion. One of these two masses, accustomed for a fairly long time to the ideas and methods of socialism, did its best to keep its head and to remain a disciplined body following the lead of its directive organs, whose general policy it was called upon to lay down itself at its sovereign congresses. The other mass, brought into action only by the war, and in Central Europe by defeat and dissolution, unacquainted with the ideas and methods of socialism except for a few ill-digested slogans, a prey to perpetual and easily understood excitement submitting unwillingly to the discipline of an organization to which it was not attached by any tradition, reacted exactly like the unenlightened workers during capitalism's period of adolescence in the first half of the 19th century. It flung itself headlong into all sorts of a phrase without weighing up the chances of success or the possible or probable results. Blanquist tendencies have long been rejected by the first mass but they completely swayed the actions of the second. And by the term Blanquist tendencies we do not mean merely putschism, but also, and above all, the preparedness of this second mass to accept Blanquist organizational principles. The awakening of the unorganized working masses provided Russian Bolshevism with the favorable soil indispensable to it in Central and Western Europe. Those who experienced the years of disruption will at once agree that from September to December 1920, from the split in the Czech Social Democracy to the Congress of Tours, via the split in the German Independent Socialist Party at Halle, one and the same phenomenon was observable everywhere. The majority of the new and raw recruits to socialism voted for joining the Moscow International, whilst the majority of the older socialists voted against it. And in 1921, when the French CGT was being dragged into a split, we again saw the collision of these two masses. Wherever the influx of these new elements is particularly large in relation to the masses already organized, the awakening proletariat with its blankest tendencies prevails over the proletariat already awakened and imbued with Marxist ideas. 43 and these Blanquist newcomers proclaimed that those socialists who remained faithful to the Marxist tradition have betrayed Marxism. The mentality of these newcomers enables them to accept the lapse into sectarianism with a light heart, because for them, in fact, it is not a lapse at all. What would seem to be a lapse for old socialists seems like progress for these newcomers. They arrive at class consciousness in a rudimentary and primitive form, but they do arrive. 44, and the historians of the year 2000 will record this fact with rejoicing and mixed with bitterness. Those who lived through this awakening, on the other hand, will feel regret that the progress of enlightenment, like technical progress, has its negative sides, its antithesis. As some consolation let us draw the conclusion that Marxist dialectic finds in this its full justification. Our examination would be incomplete if we failed to go one step farther, most of the leaders who promoted the split were much less imbued with the Blanquist spirit than the mass, at least with regard to organizational principles. On their part, the newly organized masses implicitly obeyed the orders of those who proposed to prepare and organize the conquest of power. The leaders for their part were profoundly convinced that the traditional methods of socialism had proved themselves ineffective and that it was necessary to rejuvenate Western European socialism with a transfusion of fresh Russian blood. Actually, 
Rosa Luxemburg and her friends in the Spartacus League, always opposed to Bolshevist organizational principles, had no desire for a split on the international field. In her pamphlet on the Russian Revolution Rosa Luxemburg warned her comrades in arms in September 1918 against any servile imitation of Bolshevist methods. After the constitution of the Spartacus League as the Communist Party of Germany at the beginning of January 1919, and in view of an international conference to be held in Moscow in the following March at the instance of the Bolshevists, she persuaded the Central Committee of her party to declare itself against the founding of a new international. Hugo E. Bern, the delegate of the Communist Party of Germany to that conference, only half carried out his instructions. He put forward the objections of his party according to his instructions, but he did not vote against the formation of the Communist International. He was nevertheless the only delegate who abstained. 45. Thus the Communist International was founded against the will of the only Communist Party playing a role of any political importance in the more highly developed part of capitalist Europe, and the very vote which decided on its creation stamped it with a stigma of sectarianism. The foundation of the Communist International in March 1919 meant the internationalization of the split and this split rested on an entirely different basis from that which took place during the war in Germany between the independent and the majority socialists. In 1916-17 the question at issue was primarily that of the attitude to be taken up towards the war. In 1919 it was a question of the proletarian revolution, and criticism of social patriotism played only a retrospective part in the program writings and speeches of the communists, social patriotism being considered as a synonym for the right wing in general. Although in many cases this was true, the generalization was far too sweeping. 46. The great majority of all socialists were in agreement in believing that the era of proletarian revolution had begun. Even those of the extreme right wing, who did not consider that capitalism had received a mortal blow, believed in the possibility if not the necessity, of the socialization of those industries which had arrived at a sufficient degree of centralization. The differences between them referred to methods rather than to aims, but the communists exalted methods to principles. The first of these methods made principles was the organization of the left-wing opposition into an autonomous party. We have already seen that this is the essential and distinctive characteristic of Russian Bolshevism and that the German Spartakists accepted it only very much against their will. This principle was, in fact, in flagrant contradiction with all the theories they had previously professed, and in particular with the vehement criticism of Lenin's ideas delivered by Rosa Luxemburg in 1904, and with her theory of spontaneity. Nine years later Jacob Walcher, one of the few German communist leaders capable of reasoning, tried to explain and to justify the capitulation of the Spartakists to the organizational principles of Bolshevism. In a detailed summary of Volume 4 of the collected works of Rosa Luxemburg, which deals with trade unionism and strikes, 47, and after having shown that post-war German experience confirmed her theory of spontaneity, Walcher writes. However, Experience has also shown that spontaneous mass movements run to waste and end in defeat unless there is a party at hand capable of taking direction of them and giving them the lead, aim and cohesion they require. It is only with a party which knows how to organize revolution, and understands that insurrection is an art, that we shall succeed in directing those revolutionary forces which arise out of the class struggle against a definite objective. It is only under such conditions that a lead can be given to the struggle, releasing every ounce of energy and at the same time remaining thoughtful, cold and realistic, which will replace the blind and chaotic rush in which we should risk smashing our heads against a brick wall. 48. This argumentation of Jacob Walger expresses with greater exactness the idea of Georgi Lukacs to which we referred earlier in this book, the idea of the imminence of revolution. However, the important question was precisely whether the proletarian revolution would take the same forms as the bourgeois revolution, in which a party enthroned above the ignorant and uncultured masses, drove them forward to the assault. 
we have already seen that the rebellious masses, those who take part in this blind and chaotic rush, and risk smashing their heads against a brick wall, were just the least enlightened and the least imbued with the socialist spirit. It is in the passage which we have quoted from Walcher that we can best see that Rosa Luxemburg's theory of mass spontaneity and the organizational principles of Lenin, as opposed to each other as they seem to be at first sight, are in reality only two aspects of one and the same phenomenon, namely the immaturity of a large section of the proletariat. It is here that the connection between the organizational problem and that of the proletarian revolution appears with striking clarity. If we adopt a Jacobin Blanquist conception of these problems, one arising from an imitation of the methods of the bourgeois revolution, then we shall inevitably be led to accept the Bolshevist form of organization. 49. If, on the other hand, we remain faithful to the spirit of Marxism, and hold that the socialist revolution can only be brought about by a mature proletariat freely disposing of its own future, by a proletariat embodying history conscious of itself, we cannot but repudiate the organizational principles of Lenin. The former conception, even if it seems at first to reject these principles, Rosa Luxemburg and the Spartakists, leads finally to a marshalling of the unorganized or newly organized masses against those masses organized and enlightened long before, with the result that a fratricidal struggle breaks out. In the event of defeat there is useless bloodshed, and in the event of victory there is a civil war and a minority dictatorship which render any rational reorganization of the economic system on socialist lines impossible. The latter conception strives to assimilate the new recruits to the masses already organized, and to imbue them with a sense of their responsibilities, with a knowledge of the historic process, its future prospects and its present limits and with that democratic spirit without which socialism must remain a chimera. These were the two conceptions which disputed for mastery in the hearts and minds of the workers following on the end of the world war. The spread of the second conception was terribly handicapped by the violent awakening of great masses of unorganized workers, their successful assimilation required a much greater portion of socialist leaven. The policy of the majority socialists in Germany was not by its nature calculated to hasten that assimilation, on the contrary, it drove the newcomers into the camp of Bolshevism. Despite all that, the split might have left the parties of the Communist International as skeletons without real flesh had Moscow not thrown its financial resources into the scale. During the period of which we are speaking there was no question of intellectual, moral and material corruption, however and this began to spread only later under the Zinoviev regime, from 1924 onwards, and still later under Stalin. We are referring here to the subsidies granted to those fractions of the working class movement which sympathized with the Communist International, in order to permit them to create ready-made communist parties in their respective countries. Provided that it is supplied with sufficient funds, any sectarian tendency could in this way obtain an influence far beyond that which it could otherwise hope to have as a result of its principles, its intellectual abilities and its own normal driving force. It was thanks to the great material support given by Moscow to the parties of the Communist International that they were enabled to establish a firm foothold in several Western and Central European countries and in this way they seriously hindered the assimilation of the eleventh-hour recruits to the body of democratic socialism. But although these differences in organizational principles are the essential characteristic of the international split inaugurated by the foundation of the Communist International, we must not overlook a number of other points of difference introduced into the working class movement in Western Europe by the Russian Revolution of November 1917 which has been presented as a model for a socialist and proletarian revolution. The conclusions drawn by the Bolshevists have been presented to the working class as authentic Marxism, and on this account they deserve closer examination. v. The Distortion of Marxist Theory by Bolshevism Thanks to Bolshevism the terminology of pre-war socialism has suffered almost unbelievable distortion, and we can hear echoes of it today even in the ranks of socialist parties. Words have changed their meaning, Bolshevism has put forward as Marxism ideas which are not Marxist at all, 
and has given a new meaning to the term reformism. The Kautsky-Luxemburg-Bernstein controversy used the word reformist to designate those who repudiated the class struggle, renounced the socialist aim of the working class movement, and limited their activities purely and simply to the amelioration of the prevailing capitalist regime. From 1919 onwards the Bolshevists, and even many socialists under their influence, denounced as reformist anyone who refused to accept their so-called Marxist doctrine as a dogma outside which there was no salvation. The most obvious blankism seemed to them to be orthodox Marxism, and the term reformist was flung as a supreme insult at the heads of all those who consistently upheld the ideas of Marx as defended by Karl Kautsky and Rosa Luxemburg against Edward Bernstein. 50. From September 1918 onwards Rosa Luxemburg saw and warned the working class against the danger of a mechanical transfer of Bolshevist methods to the Central and Western European scene. Discussing the actions of Lenin and Trotsky she wrote. By their vigorously revolutionary attitude, their exemplary force of action, and their unshakable fidelity to international socialism, they have truly done everything it was possible to do in such diabolically difficult conditions. The danger begins at that point where, making a virtue of necessity, they turn the tactics which they had been compelled to adopt by these terribly difficult conditions into a complete theory, and commended its acceptance to the international proletariat as a model of socialist tactics. By doing this they put forward their own personalities, where they ought not to be involved, and hide their real and incontestable historic merit under the bushel of faults imposed on them by necessity. Thus they render a bad service to the cause of international socialism in whose name they struggled and suffered, when they claim to add new truths to the general fund of socialist ideas, new truths which are in reality old errors committed in Russia under the pressure of necessity, and, in the last resort, as the result of the bankruptcy of international socialism in the World War. 51. Rosa Luxemburg was murdered in January 1919. She no longer lived to witness the ravages the servile imitation of Bolshevist methods was to cause subsequently in the Western European working class movement, going even so far that finally Luxembourgism was denounced by the leaders of the Communist International as one of the most pernicious forms of reformism. Let us review briefly the principal distortions wrought by Bolshevism in the current ideas of traditional socialism. Contrary to one of the fundamental ideas of Marxism, Bolshevism is not at all interested in the question of whether capitalism has arrived at that stage of maturity necessary to give immediate birth to a socialist society. Bolshevists considered that this problem was solved by the world war and by the economic collapse of capitalist society which followed upon the war, and that it was solved so absolutely and completely that they denounced as the obvious product of reformist and revisionist ideology all proposals for socialization by stages, despite the fact that such proposals were quite in accordance with all Marxist teaching. Their denunciation was all the more vehement because under the stress of civil war Russia had adopted war communism, the realization of complete socialism. Once again, to use the words of Rosa Luxemburg, the Bolshevists were making a virtue of necessity and developing the tactics which had been forced upon them by the fatal conditions of their isolated revolution into a complete theory. In 1921 the Bolshevists were themselves compelled to liquidate their war communism, and, with the new economic policy, to introduce a mixed economic system including a vast private sector. Lenin tried to justify this retreat, 52, by explaining that a reformist policy, 53, was a sound one after the conquest of power, and to be condemned only before that conquest, which, in Lenin's eyes, was always opposed to the accession to power within the framework of democracy. Further, socialism having been accomplished in Russia by expropriation without compensation, there again in the tragic circumstances of civil war and foreign aggression, the rejection of compensation became, in the eyes of the communists, and of many socialists who succumb to the disease, the supreme criterion of revolutionary deportment, and of Marxist deportment, too, despite the opinions expressed by Marx and Engels. The supporters of compensation, though they were faithful to the ideas of Marx, were denounced as renegades and traitors. 
there might have been some justification for a frank revision of the Marxist doctrine on the ground that the experience of the Russian Revolution, with its socialization accomplished overnight and without compensation, had brought forward new facts contradicting Marx and Engels, but the Bolshevists insisted, on the contrary, that the measures taken in Russia under the stress of adversity and in very unusual circumstances confirmed the views of the two founders of scientific socialism, and made Bolshevism the sole authentic inheritor of Marxist doctrine. In the kautsky luxemburg bernstein controversy the question of the accession to power was left open. Whilst in Rosa Luxemburg's observations we can occasionally hear echoes of the earlier ideas of Marx and Engels, which were tinged with blankism, Kautsky insists more on the absurdity of choosing the way of armed uprising when more certain and less costly ways are open, and in this he shows himself a faithful follower of the founders of scientific socialism. Seeing that the Russian Revolution was carried out by way of insurrection, the Bolshevists and the Bolshevized socialists concluded that henceforward this must be the sole method everywhere, and that only insurrection, certain French socialists, finding insurrection of itself insufficient, even dreamt of the insurrectionary general strike, fulfilled all the conditions of Marxist orthodoxy. According to Mr. Sidney Hook, for instance, whose opinion we have already quoted, this insurrection is then to be followed by a lively and jolly little civil war. 54. All this was presented as Marxism in spite of the contrary opinions expressed on a number of occasions by Marx and Engels, and loyally quoted by Mr. Sidney Hook, who, however, thought it necessary to surround them with reservations. All those who felt that these methods were useless, or even harmful in a democratic regime, were banished from the pale of Marxism by the communists and denounced as reformists. Once in power the proletariat must, according to communist doctrine, smash the state machinery and replace it by a new structure based on Soviets, workers, peasants and soldiers' councils. 55. We have already quoted the opinion of Jules Martov, which is shared by the great majority of socialist theoreticians. 56 according to which Marx was not thinking of the machinery of state as such, but of bureaucratic and the military excrescences surviving from an autocratic regime. No socialist will reproach the Bolshevists with having made a clean sweep of these excrescences in a country where the state machinery suffered particularly from such evils. The gravest terror of German social democracy was precisely that it failed to attack them. But whilst German social democracy did less than the indispensable minimum, the Bolshevists went farther than was necessary, and into the bargain they set up their errors as inalienable rules of conduct for the international working class movement. They replaced the developing democratic state by Soviets. In his state and revolution, Lenin certainly highly recommended the democratic virtues of the Soviets but their very structure offered far fewer democratic possibilities than that of modern parliamentarism. 57, and in this we are not taking into account the fact that the Bolshevist party ended by establishing a totalitarian dictatorship, and eliminating forcibly all other proletarian tendencies. After having proclaimed the Soviet system as the model and incarnation par excellence of proletarian democracy, Bolshevism went on to suppress proletarian democracy altogether. 58. After having declared itself the instrument of the proletarian dictatorship, Bolshevism goes on to cow the proletariat under the totalitarian whip of a minority, which is itself first under the dictatorship of a handful of leaders, and finally under the dictatorship of one man, and that man no genius. Rosa Luxemburg writes. In the last resort cliquism develops a dictatorship, but not the dictatorship of the proletariat, the dictatorship of a handful of politicians, that is, a dictatorship in the bourgeois, in the Jacobin sense. And further, such a state of affairs necessarily causes an increase of brutality in public life, individual terror, the shooting of hostages, etc. 59. Thus, in the Bolshevist sense, the dictatorship of the proletariat becomes the dictatorship of one proletarian party to the exclusion of all others, and even that one party loses more and more the freedom to express its own will and to criticize its leaders. 
This dictatorship embodies itself successively in that of the Soviets, that of the party, that of the Politburo of the party, and finally that of the henceforth irremovable General Secretary of the party. The Soviets and the party dissolve themselves into nothing. And in the end the argument put forward to justify all this is that lack of maturity on the part of the proletariat has compelled the Bolshevists to limit the liberty of the workers. But that is precisely what democratic socialism has always insisted upon, Russia is not ripe for socialism, either from the standpoint of its economic system or from the standpoint of the maturity of its working class. The whole evolution of Russia during the past 20 years proves this and those who persist in declaring that socialist maturity exists in Russia have only two possibilities open to them, they may camouflage truth and proclaim mendaciously that the building up of socialism is proceeding from victory to victory, as the Stalinists do, or they can frankly recognize that nothing of all this is true, and explain this deplorable evolution by treachery, as Trotsky does, 60, an explanation which Friedrich Engels terms lamentable. Lenin's theory of the proletarian dictatorship as embodied in the form of Soviets, suffers from the failing which we have already pointed out in the second chapter of this book with regard to his organizational principles, the confusion of content and form. Lenin believed that it was sufficient to give the party another structure, another form, in order to make it a more efficient instrument for proletarian emancipation. In the same way he believed that it was sufficient to replace parliamentarism by the Soviet system in order to turn bourgeois democracy into proletarian democracy. However, the bourgeois or proletarian character of democracy, even supposing that the Soviet system expresses a democratic ideal, does not depend at all upon the structure of the state. On the contrary, the state and its structure proceed from the socio-economic basis on which they stand. 61 and no act of will can make the state anything but what the degree of economic development and the degree of maturity of the masses permit it to be. In Lenin's conception of the proletarian international we again find this same tendency to place the form above the content, whereas, on the contrary, the whole genius of Marx lies in the use of a method which recognizes the priority of the content over the form. It was in order to prevent the further disruption of the international by a new war that Lenin founded the Communist International. The best means of preventing a future possible split seemed to him to be the proclamation of an immediate and actual permanent split. Like Gridwell, he throws himself into the water to get out of the rain. The international created in this way in order not to split again in case of a new war, was according to the stipulations of the celebrated 21 conditions, to include neither social patriots nor social pacifists, that is to say, internationalists like Jean Longuet who repudiated blankwism. Thus it could not possibly include more than a small minority of the international working class. Was the much likelihood of an international founded on such a sectarian basis proving very useful in the struggle against war? Even a limited organization subjected to iron discipline, and founded on the international application of Lenin's organizational principles, would not be exempt from splits. This is proved by the innumerable and endless purges which have taken place in the communist parties during the past twenty years. Even putting these splits on one side, as an international sect, however homogeneous it may be, and however enthusiastic and devoted its members, a greater power of action than an international organizing the masses of the workers? A sect is condemned to impotence in any case, whereas although in particularly tragic circumstances an organization of the masses may be rendered helpless, it need not inevitably be so. It is here that we place our finger on the essential cause of the weakness of the working class international, a weakness which is caused by objective circumstances, and not by the treason of individuals. The various nations find themselves at different stages of capitalist development, and, of course, their working class movements naturally find themselves at correspondingly varied stages of development. 62. The proletariat is not the ideal and abstract collective body, already fully organized and uniformly enlightened, that certain armchair Marxists imagine. 
an international striving to organize the masses of the workers of all countries necessarily suffers from the weaknesses which result from the differences we have just discussed. Such an international cannot be more than the sum of all the national proletariats of which it is comprised. Whilst it is the task of its leading members to recognize the limits of its strength, it certainly has real strength, whereas a sectarian international, however grandiloquent its resolutions may be, has no real strength at all. Seeing that an all-powerful international could never exist, we have the choice between an imperfect international which can at least do something, and a perfect international which could do nothing at all. Bolshevism has made its choice, and so has democratic socialism. It is democratic socialism which has the right to claim the authority of Marx and Engels, not Bolshevism. In a letter to Bolt on 23 November 1871, Marx wrote. The international was founded in order to replace the socialist or semi-socialist sects by a real organization of the working class for struggle. And the history of the international was a continual struggle on the part of the general council against the sects and amateur experiments which attempted to assert themselves within the international itself against the genuine movement of the working class. 63. And Engels pointed out on more than one occasion the harm that would be done by an attempt to impose any doctrine whatever upon the working class movement from without. The passages which we quote below refer to the activities of German emigrants in the American working class movement, who behaved at that time in much the same way, money and corruption, of course, accepted, as the emissaries of Moscow now behave in the international working class movement. On 28 December 1886, Engels wrote as follows to Mvisnivetsky. The great thing is to get the working class to move as a class. And I consider that many of the Germans there have made a grievous mistake when they tried in the face of a mighty and glorious movement not of their own creation, to make of their imported and not always understood theory a kind of alliance ligmations, the only one leading to salvation, translator, dogma and to keep aloof from any movement which did not accept that dogma. Our theory is not a dogma but the exposition of a process of evolution, and that process involves successive phases. A million or two of working men's votes next November for a bona fide working men's party is worth infinitely more at present than a hundred thousand votes for a doctrinally perfect platform. 64. On the 27th of January 1887, he wrote a further letter to the same lady. When Marx founded the International he drew up the general rules in such a way that all working class socialists of that period could join it, proud honists, Pierre Laroxists and even the more advanced section of the English trades unions, and it was only through this latitude that the International became what it was, the means of gradually dissolving and absorbing all these minor sects, with the exception of the anarchists. Had we from 1864 to 1873 insisted on working together only with those who openly adopted our platform where should we be today? I think that all our practice has shown that it is possible to work along with the general movement of the working class at every one of its stages without giving up or hiding our own distinct position and even organization, and I am afraid that if the German Americans choose a different line they will commit a great mistake. 65. And finally on the 9th of February 1887, we find him writing to her as follows. That great national movement, no matter what its first form, is the real starting point of American working class development, if the Germans join it, in order to help it or to hasten its development in the right direction, they may do a deal of good and play a decisive part in it, if they stand aloof, they will dwindle down into a dogmatic sect and will be brushed aside as people who do not understand their own principles. 66. This should clinch the matter. It can be seen clearly from the above quotations that Bolshevism has no right to appeal to the authority of Marx and Engels. Obviously it has the right to do what it likes apart from this, but then let it be honest enough to repudiate Marx as openly and to stop denouncing real Marxists as renegades and traitors. Bolshevism, whether of the Trotskyist or Stalinist order, has another argument in reserve, 
Marx and Engels may have been right for their day in stressing the necessity of an international embracing all working class organizations, but since then socialist parties have adopted a policy of social peace and repudiated the class struggle, thereby making a rigorous separation necessary. Vi, the class struggle and social peace. Bolshevism attempts to justify the split in the international by declaring that socialist parties have abandoned the class struggle and become converts in practice to the doctrine of social peace inspired by class collaboration. Quite recently such practices were again denounced under the name of social democratism by the General Secretary of the Communist International. A certain section of the French Socialist Party hastened to associate itself with this denunciation. The essential question involved is that of socialist participation in bourgeois governments, that is to say, the policy of coalition with bourgeois parties. Such a reproach, we must admit, is particularly intriguing when it comes from people, we are referring to the communists, who themselves clamorously demanded ministerial portfolios in order that they too might take part in the administration of the bourgeois state. A closer examination of this question will once again show us that the critics of socialist parties are juggling with words. The class struggle is by no means synonymous with social war or civil war. It is the necessary result of the division of society into classes, and it will exist as long as that division exists. According to circumstances, it expresses itself in a great variety of forms from the exercise of the franchise and the exertion of peaceful pressure, to open explosions and the use of ruthless violence. Social peace is thus by no means the opposite pole of the class struggle, but a phase of that struggle determined, it may be, by an equal balance or social forces, or, it may be, by the temporary complete supremacy of one side over the other. The class struggle, like all other struggles, implies in any case incessant compromises which give rise, whether one likes it or not, to a certain collaboration. Lenin himself was obliged to stress, against the wordy intransigence of his followers, the necessity and expediency for such compromises. 67, and Marx himself reproached the Paris Commune with not having sought to arrive at a compromise advantageous to the masses of the people with the Versailles. 68, it is a ridiculous misunderstanding to imagine that struggle is one thing and compromise another. The two things condition and merge into each other. All struggle implies compromise, and all compromise is the expression or result of a struggle, without struggle compromise would be useless and inconceivable. It is curious to observe that the enemies of Marxism interpret the doctrine of the class struggle in more or less the same fashion as the most intransigent upholders of that doctrine. Both of them see only the purely physical aspects of the problem, and often fortify their attitude by the emotional factor of hatred. 69. On the part of those who pretend to believe that the materialist conception of history is only sordid materialism of primary interest to the stomach, this is not surprising. They misrepresent the theory of the class struggle just as they misrepresent Marxism in general. On reflection perhaps this misrepresentation is not altogether surprising even for the extreme left-wing elements of the working class movement, most of whom are usually newcomers to the socialist movement, whose knowledge of Marxism was gained from a study of the capitalist press of which they were faithful readers up to the moment when they began to be conscious of their class interests. They take as Marxism what these prejudiced newspapers presented to them as such, and they overwhelm the old-time socialists with the vilest insults for refusing to conduct the class struggle in the manner depicted by the reactionary press. In reality, the doctrine of the class struggle is a factor which has contributed more than any other to the humanization of social struggles. It was Marxist doctrine which taught the working class that it was not the industrialist A or the banker B who was responsible for its poverty, that there was no sense in attacking the person of this or that capitalist, and that it was stupid to blame machinery for unemployment and the depression of wages. It was the Marxist doctrine which taught the wage workers that their emancipation could be brought about only by the transformation of the existing economic system. 70. 
the organized working class has always condemned acts of terrorism against individuals, and even the Communist International, in spite of its fundamentally anti-Marxist principles, practiced individual terrorism only post-mortem, that is to say, after the advent of Stalin. On the other hand, individual terrorism is the common practice of the enemies of the class struggle. All the extremists of the right have recourse to terrorism without scruple, as proved by the innumerable murders committed by German nationalists since 1919, and by their French emulators the Cagoulids. The degenerate intellectuals who almost succeeded in killing Leon Blum in 1936, all the experts with carving knives, bombs delivered at the front door, and poison cocktails, thought themselves able to destroy the class struggle by savage attacks on individuals. Very fortunately Marxism can boast of always having vigorously opposed such practices. 71, but there are Marxists, who, whilst quite understanding that the class struggle is not the same thing as a succession of scrimmages, feel nonetheless that they would be lacking in what they believe to be good Marxist deportment if they admitted that the class struggle might adopt less and less violent forms. As in the case of Lenin, these people confuse content with form. The much maligned Marx, whom they claim as their teacher, would turn in his grave if he heard their talk. All dialectical conception of the world they live in is foreign to them. Just as they will never understand, although Marx taught us that it was so, why a rise in the rate of surplus value must be accompanied by a fall in the rate of profit, and why a fall in relative wages is not at all irreconcilable with a rise in nominal and real wages, so they will apparently never understand that an intensification of the capitalist exploitation of wage labor need not necessarily bring with it recrudescence of savagery in social struggles. 72. At the same time there is no doubt whatever that certain big capitalist elements, those who subsidize the terrorist organizations of the right, actually want civil war, but the working class would be foolish to please them by falling into their trap, if it had at its disposal more effective and less murderous means of disarming its enemies. However, the mere wish of certain big capitalist elements is not sufficient to let loose civil war. The most dangerous madman can be rendered harmless by putting him in a padded cell. By what means? Asylum attendants tell us that the straight waistcoat is the most appropriate means. In political strategy Marxists will apply the doctrine of the class struggle for this purpose. This doctrine permits us to examine the anatomy of the social organism carefully, to analyze the objective situation of the various classes, to understand their interests their needs and their aspirations, and to recognize in what measure and to what point their claims can be reconciled with those of the wage-earning class. All that remains then is to form a block of all those sections of society interested in social progress within the bounds of legality against the advocates of civil war. That is our means, our straight waistcoat. And although it may seem paradoxical, the class struggle is thus waged for the maintenance of social peace. The class struggle unrolls in continually changing circumstances and it demands constantly differing tactics. The thing that matters is the content and not the form at all. Only the shallow-minded can maintain that those who consent to sit in a government together with men appointed by bourgeois parties thereby abandon or betray the class struggle. In reality they are waging the class struggle where they have been instructed to do so by the vote and the confidence of their militant socialist comrades. The socialist minister can wage the class struggle with as much energy as the delegate of a strike committee appointed by his comrades to settle a labor dispute. And just as the delegate in question cannot always obtain complete satisfaction, and is often obliged to return to his committee with proposals which only half satisfy its members, so the socialist minister gets what he can for his supporters according to the strength of the support he finds in the country. Like most strikes, the discussions in the cabinet conducted by socialist ministers lead to compromises, more or less advantageous, according to circumstances, for the working class. Would it have been possible to obtain more? In order to answer this question we must draw a distinction between two things, the personal qualities of the socialist ministers, 73, and the objective situation. It is obviously the latter which matters most. 
if they are obliged to conclude compromises it is because they are not in power alone, and they are not in power alone because socialism has not yet won over the majority of the electors. And even where they have majority of the people behind them, as in certain Scandinavian countries, they are hampered by the insufficient development of the economic system, which does not permit them to introduce socialism from one day to the next, something which, in any case, no socialist party ever promised to do. In the first case they are led to a compromise with political reality, and in the second with economic reality. It was reserved for Bolshevism to denounce as treason the impossibility of running the 100 meters in five seconds, when the world record, in any case very difficult to emulate, is almost twice as much. However, and this is the knockout argument of the anti-participationists, there are resolutions of international congresses, Paris in 1900 and Amsterdam in 1904, which, they say, categorically condemn the participation of socialists in bourgeois governments. Let us take a look at the text of the Amsterdam Resolution, which merely repeats the gist of the Paris Resolution. Social democracy may not seek any participation in the government of bourgeois society, in conformity with the Kautsky Resolution adopted by the International Congress in Paris in 1900. However, in his speech to the Amsterdam Congress, Karl Kautsky stressed that one should not pass a general condemnation of all socialist participation in a bourgeois government, and that the formula may not seek did not signify an absolute injunction against agreeing to such participation. He recalled that the Paris Resolution regarded socialist participation in the government as a source of danger and embarrassment, but also as a sacrifice which it would not always be possible to avoid. 74. Kautsky was not the only one to think like that. On 6 July 1899, Rosa Luxemburg, discussing and condemning the entry of Millerand into the Waldeck Rousseau cabinet, declared. No doubt there may be moments in the development, or rather the decline of bourgeois society, when the complete taking over of power by the representatives of the workers is not yet possible, but when, nevertheless, their participation in a bourgeois government would appear necessary. Such a moment, for instance, would be when the liberty of the country or the democratic achievements of the people, such as the republic, are called into question, at a moment, for instance, when the bourgeois government itself is too compromised and already too disorganized to persuade the people to follow it without the support of the representatives of the working class. In such a case, of course, the representatives of the working people would not have the right for love of abstract principle to refuse to defend the common cause. 75. In order to understand the circumspection of Karl Kautsky and Rosa Luxemburg we must recall the situation in which socialism found itself at the end of the 19th and the beginning of the 20th centuries. Both in France and in Great Britain, the only two great democratic countries in Europe. Socialism was still very weak on the parliamentary field. In Germany, where the Social Democratic Party had polled more than 3 million votes out of a total of 9.5 millions in the election of 1903-76, the semi-absolutist regime excluded all possibility of participation. Participation could not be envisaged except under circumstances when, in nine cases out of ten, the socialist ministers would be the hostages of their bourgeois colleagues. By the end of the World War the situation had radically changed. Europe had become democratic. The strength of the socialist parties had very considerably increased. 77, socialists judged, with very good reason, that the period of hostages was past, and that it was now strong enough to exercise a considerable, if not decisive influence on the government. However, it was nowhere strong enough to take over power alone. The immaturity of the masses, of which only a part had declared themselves for socialism, and that very often by instinct rather than by knowledge and reflection, reflected the immaturity of capitalism for immediate and complete socialization. In this situation three possibilities were open to the working class. 1 to share power with bourgeois parties whilst waiting until they had won over a majority of the electorate. 2. To entrench themselves in intransigent opposition and decline the responsibilities of power until the situation was ripe. 
3. To try to seize power by force. This last solution, which fascinates the extreme left wing of the working class movement, and not only the communist parties, had little chance of achieving anything worthwhile. An armed insurrection carried out against or without the expressed consent of the majority of the people, opens the path to socialism only in the minds of Blanquists and other incorrigible utopians. But even in power alone, ruling by terror, and no longer hampered by the resistance of their bourgeois colleagues, the socialist ministers, or commissars of the people, would still find themselves face to face with hard economic reality, peremptorily forbidding the immediate establishment of socialism. 78. The second solution, that of remaining in opposition, offered no more promising perspectives, though it might be conceivable in countries where the parliamentary representation of socialism was still relatively feeble, in France, for example, until a few years ago. However, when a socialist party has between 40 and 45 percent of the seats in parliament it is impossible for it to abstain from participation except at the price of feebly handing over power to a bourgeois coalition in which the extreme right would have every chance of seizing the principal levers of government and weakening democracy. Such an uncompromising opposition could, its advocates claim, upset all ministerial stability, cause one crisis after the other and thus hasten what they call the decomposition of the regime. It obviously might do that in many cases, but it would not thereby advance the cause of socialism one step. In provoking the decomposition of a political democratic regime, it would in no wise accelerate the development of the economic system, whose maturity is the primary condition for the realization of socialism. All it does is to contribute to the discrediting of democracy which represents a further essential condition of socialism, and in discrediting democracy in the eye of the masses, it would retard their political development. Nothing remains in practice but the first solution, socialist participation in the government, in spite of all the risks attached to it. These risks would be all the greater where the working class was divided, where one fraction of socialism in opposition was opposed to another fraction participating in power whose influence would thereby naturally be diminished. 79. We may, of course, hold more or less skeptical views on the possibilities of usefulness offered to a socialist party by participation in a coalition government. In this connection on read a man expresses the following opinion, which may at first sight seem a little strange. Precisely in a stage of development in which the political influence of the working class has been considerably strengthened, we may expect more socialist reforms from bourgeois governments than from socialist governments, though this naturally does not contradict the fact that the drive towards these reforms is always in direct proportion to the strength of the working class parties. 80. Many examples in support of this theory might actually be cited, but that is not the point. The necessity for socialist participation in power arises, as we have already said, at that moment when the Socialist Party is represented by a strength in Parliament which really counts, in which case it cannot refuse to share power without the risk of allowing the fascist reaction to establish itself and prepare to annihilate democracy. With regard to the winning of reforms, even if we agree with demand that reforms may sometimes be more easily won in opposition than in power, it is no less certain that the application of social laws once voted is often sabotaged by purely bourgeois governments, whilst on the contrary they are better administered by governments in which socialists participate. To those who constantly insist that a policy of coalition in the government is contrary to Marxist principles, we can only reply that it is one of the forms which can be taken by the class struggle in given circumstances and that in democratic regimes it makes itself more and more necessary during the whole of that period when the organized working class is already too strong to leave the governmental field entirely in the hands of its enemies, but not yet strong enough to affirm, to use the expression coined by Kautsky in his polemic against Bernstein, its supremacy. This, of course, does not at all mean that socialist parties should pursue such a policy at all costs no matter in what conditions, no matter how, and no matter for what ends. Everything depends on the program such a party proposes to carry out in power. 81, however, 
in democratic countries it will be the rule rather than the exception. The transformation of the capitalist regime makes participation more and more a necessity so long as socialism has not arrived at the supremacy which will give it the freedom of action it needs. However, for their rational development, all far-reaching economic changes need social peace and the operation of the Pacific pressure exerted by the opposing classes. This would be made quite impossible by civil war. We shall deal at greater length with this question in the concluding chapter of this book. 7. The Degeneration of Bolshevism In view of the fact that the degeneration of Bolshevism, both in Russia and on the international field, is interpreted by many people as an experimental demonstration of the failure of Marxism, we are compelled to devote a few pages to a critical examination of this viewpoint. In its origin Bolshevism was indisputably a branch of Marxist thought. We have already seen, however, that the particular conditions in which it was called upon to work from the very beginning imposed on it a policy which was tantamount to a relapse into blankwism. Its success in Central and Western Europe after the World War was due to the awakening of those masses of workers who up to then had been on the outskirts of the working class movement only and who are subject to those blind reactions which are the basis of action for active minorities. In this period the parties affiliated to the Communist International really reflected the state of mind of an important fraction of the working class, whose will they represented. The influence of Moscow and the action of these masses mutually complemented each other. In fact, we might even ask ourselves whether the Putschist ravages would not have been still greater but for the influence of Moscow. Although the damage caused by the organizational principles of Lenin in disrupting the international was great, it is quite certain that the separate organization of these blankwist elements constituted to a certain extent, at any rate in those countries in which there was a great deal of social ferment, an obstacle to all two brainless putches. The masses in revolt were prepared to listen to the moderating counsels of Lenin, Trotsky and Radke, whereas the exhortations of socialist leaders, even of left-wing socialist leaders, fell on deaf ears. It was thanks to the persuasion of Radke that in December 1919 the Austrian communists themselves condemned the putsch they had launched in Vienna on the 15th of June of the same year, although, speaking in the name of the immense majority of the National Congress of Workers' Councils, Fritz Adler had warned them against it in vain. And it was Lenin in person who, after the disastrous rising in central Germany in March 1921, said to Wilhelm Cohen, one of those responsible, you ought to have your head chopped off, if you had one. And in 1922 it was Trotsky who tried to muzzle the wordy intransigence of a strong fraction of the French Communist Party. However, the principles of rigid organization, demanding blind obedience, ended by getting the upper hand of all political considerations. Paul Levi, the best known and most intelligent leader of the German Communist Party, the friend and collaborator of Rosa Luxemburg, was expelled for having publicly denounced the criminal activities carried out by irresponsible agents of the underground organization of the German Communist Party in 1921. Lenin supported Paul Levi fundamentally, but Levi had committed a breach of discipline, and his expulsion, decreed by the Central Committee of the German Communist Party, was confirmed by the subsequent Congress of the Communist International. Organizational Principles Uberals. At the National Congress of the German Communist Party which took place at Jena in August 1921, Paul Levi made his last effort in concert with Clara Zetkin. Having no access to the Congress he drew up together with Clara the resolutions presented by her to the Congress which were, however, rejected by a large majority. It was in 1921 that the fate of the Communist International was decided. Born of an alliance of Russian Bolshevist ideology and the much more democratic conceptions of the extreme left-wing socialists in Central and Western Europe, it represented in origin a compromise between the two tendencies. The German Spartakists tolerated the split in the International, but they did not desire it themselves. During the first years of the Communist International, and in spite of the personal intervention of great eminences, often disowned by Lenin and Trotsky, 
the sections of the International were free to take their own decisions within the framework of those resolutions adopted by the International Congresses. At first these resolutions were drafted and voted upon with full liberty of discussion. If the Russian delegation often took a predominating part in the drafting of them, that was a result of the immense moral prestige of the Russian Revolution, the Russians have made their revolution, they have a right to give us others lessons, and of the exceptional stature of the men who made up their delegations. However, in 1921 a desire to establish Bolshevist hegemony made itself felt for the first time, not with regard to personages, but with regard to principles, and principles of organization. In January a split took place in the Italian Socialist Party, which up to then, the reformists Durati and Treves included, had been affiliated to the Communist International. This split came about as a result of the refusal of the great majority of the Italian Socialist Party to put the famous 21 conditions into operation, which would have meant the expulsion of the said reformists. And then in the summer of 1921, still in the name of Bolshevist discipline, followed the expulsion of Paul Levi and his friends grouped around the review Unserweg. 82. This was the first clash between the two tendencies which made up the Communist International. The Communists of Western Europe had hoped that in contact with European reality Bolshevism would be modified, would Luxembourgize itself. 83. They were compelled to admit that their hopes were in vain. The principles of Bolshevism penetrated more and more into the mass parties of Western Europe on which the Luxembourgists had relied for support, believing that they would prove the best antidote to the Leninist spirit. There is no cause whatever for surprise at the failure of these hopes. Luxembourgism regards the spontaneous action of unorganized masses, gradually awakening to political consciousness, as the specific form of proletarian revolution. However, this action, because it is spontaneous, calls for a directive center with dictatorial prerogatives. The spontaneity of Rosa Luxemburg, as opposed though it may seem to the totalitarianism of Lenin, is in reality only its complement. Lenin, too, counted upon the spontaneity of unorganized masses. However, whilst Lenin regarded the process from the height of his professional and infallible Central Committee, Rosa Luxemburg, more Marxist, regarded the same process from below, from the real mass basis of the movement. To put it briefly, the uneducated masses set in movement by the situation which arose in Western Europe just after the World War, proved by their acts that their chaotic and spontaneous movements had nothing whatever to do with the Socialist Revolution. They proved it by accepting the organizational principles of Bolshevism in spite of all the efforts and in spite of the indisputable intellectual superiority of Paul Levi's arguments. In a polemic against Paul Levi, Clara Zetkin dealt with the danger, already pointed out in 1918 by Rosa Luxemburg, of the mechanical transfer of Bolshevist methods and principles to the working class movement outside Russia. In her opinion the fears expressed on this point were senseless, 84, because the particular facts of the Russian Revolution had been determined by the specific conditions of Russian society and therefore would not be reproduced everywhere according to one and the same pattern. She was cruelly deceiving herself. The masses organized in the communist parties, insufficiently enlightened as they were, accepted the principles of the Bolshevists and the degeneration of Bolshevism manifested itself in the consolidation of an increasingly irresponsible bureaucratic dictatorship, 85, and ended by transforming the desire of the Bolshevists for ideological hegemony, into an insatiable thirst for domination as such. It stopped at nothing, neither material corruption, nor, more recently, murder. 86. In place of a control of the national sections by an international executive committee freely elected at World Congresses, came the dictatorship of the Russian state over the foreign communist parties. The World Congress of 1924 sounded the death knell of the Communist International. What has since existed under this name is nothing but a domesticated annex of the Russian machinery of state as foreign to the interests of the international working class as any consulate of any totalitarian state.
under the pretext of restoring the fighting force of the communist parties outside Russia, which at that time were obviously in decline, they were subjected to a proceeding called Bolshevization, the object of which was to strip them of their own revolutionary traditions and to refashion them in the image of the Russian Bolshevist party. Two years after the publication of her book, the Bolshevist leaders disavowed Clara Zetkin in a brusque and humiliating fashion, and Leninism, up to that time unknown, was now proclaimed the official religion of the Communist International. We say advisedly religion, and not doctrine, because freedom of thought was suppressed, and persecutions began against those recalcitrants who admitted their failure to understand the explanations with which Zinoviev, Bukharin and Belakun tried to define Leninism as against a phantom described as Trotskyism. 87. From then on blind obedience became the supreme law even in questions of pure theory. Communists were no longer permitted to think for themselves, they had to accept agreed blindly. 88. Everyone knows what the communist parties have since become. Although Marxism-Leninism is still inscribed on their facade, their activity has in reality nothing to do with any doctrine at all. They execute the orders of a bloody despot who has anointed himself great leader of the world proletariat, leader of the world proletariat whose immense majority abhor him and have never shown the slightest desire to have him as a leader. The communist parties embrace the least enlightened sections of the working class, the least right for their emancipation because they are more inclined to abandon freedom of thought and of criticism and expression at the behest of leaders who are not chosen by themselves. They can attract only those who prefer blind obedience to reason, only slothful minds prepared to believe every light told to them about the so-called Soviet paradise, only people who are not astonished to hear elections called free in which there are only official candidates and which take place under a regime of bloody terror, only people who display no surprise at hearing a regime called a model democracy in which there is only one party in power and all the others are in prison. Only people who are not shocked to hear the building up of socialism claimed for a country in which socialist thought has been prescribed, persecuted and stifled for twenty years in the pillet isolators, and who are, finally, not embarrassed to hear confessions extorted from political prisoners which are manifestly in contradiction to the known and verifiable facts. 89. More than half of the influence of the communist parties on a section of the working class rests on the gigantic Russian imposture, the most monstrous in the history of mankind. This imposture is made still more monstrous by the systematic vilification of all those people who dare to tell the truth about Russia, 90, by a campaign of calumny and intimidation to defame the opponents of Bolshevism by every possible means and to defile the memory of its victims killed usually by a bullet in the back of the head, by untruthfully and unscrupulously denouncing them as agents of the Gestapo. Such a party has nothing whatever in common with Marxism. It might embrace a fraction of the working class, but it could never be a working class party in the sense in which this term has been used since the beginning of the modern, working class movement. Many workers have even strayed into the ranks of Hitler's party, and it calls itself a workers' party, but this does not prevent its being what we know it is. In the period before unity of action became the fashionable slogan of the Communist International, all those socialists who remained faithful to the democratic spirit were denounced as social fascists. Quite recently Dimitrov revived this piece of abuse, in spite of unity of action. Since they have invented the term let it be used, but for the right people. If you want to know what authentic social fascism, social fascism in flesh and blood, looks like, then cast a glance at the regime established in Russia, and at its offshoots called communist parties. 8. Fascism. In so far as bourgeois critics, complacently and in bad faith adopting the Bolshevist thesis according to which Leninism is the sole authentic inheritor of the Marxist tradition, conclude from the failure of Bolshevism in Russia and on the international field that Marxism in general has failed, their arguments are, as we have just seen, easy to refute. However, the phenomenon of fascism seems to contradict in a much more serious fashion all those tendencies to which Marxist thought has given birth during the past fifty years. In Italy, in Germany, 
and in still other countries, fascism has triumphed over all the parties and groups claiming, rightly or wrongly, to be Marxist. Since the World War capitalism has writhed in convulsions which announce its approaching end. Everything which Marx and Engels predicted concerning the historic limits of capitalism, and all that their followers, from Karl Kautsky to Rosa Luxemburg, Hilferding and Renner, subsequently added, are being realized today before our eyes. 91. The objective conditions for the socialist transformation are developing visibly. But despite this undeniable fact, the masses of the people, or at any rate an important part of these masses, seem to be taking the wrong turning. Must we assume from this that whilst Marx the economist was right, Marx the philosopher of history, the Marx to whom we owe historical materialism, was lamentably wrong? And that at the same time the whole edifice of Marxist doctrine is faulty? Let us try to define the phenomenon of fascism. First of all it is very important that we should make a clear distinction between the fascist state and the fascist movement. It is the latter only which interests us for the moment, in the following chapter we shall deal with what is called the fascist state and the fascist economic system. The main problem we have to elucidate here is, how is it that capitalist decadence has given rise to mass movements which, far from carrying socialist parties to power, have destroyed them completely, and deprived them of all legal existence. It is therefore the fascist movement which we must first define. Fascism has often been termed preventive counter-revolution, and there is certainly some truth in this definition. The dictatorial and totalitarian tendencies of large-scale capitalism increase as the working class draws nearer to political power, whether the approach takes place by parliamentary means or by a recrudescence of revolutionary agitation. In certain moments of grave economic crisis even the maintenance of already existing social legislation becomes a revolutionary act, because, in order to keep up its rate of profit, capitalism is forced to withdraw as far as possible those concessions it had been compelled to make to the working class in former times. From that angle fascism certainly appears as a preventive counter-revolution. However, this definition ignores another aspect of the fascist phenomenon which is not less important. If we accepted this definition at its face value, such dictators as Primo de Rivera, Franco, Horthy, Salazar and others would also appear to be fascists, and in this case fascism would become a simple synonym for dictatorship. However, that would be to strip it of its real characteristics, and to abandon all attempt to analyze it effectively. The fact that some of these dictators call themselves fascists, admire fascism, and ape its methods, does not dispense us from the necessity of closely examining the objective social bases of their dictatorships. 92. What distinguishes fascism from simple counter-revolution, whether preventive or not, and what distinguishes the fascist dictatorship from dictatorship as such? is the movement of the masses which is an integral part of the phenomenon of fascism. Mussolini and Hitler were both carried to power by the support of an important fraction of the masses of the people. Horthy, Primo de Rivera, Franco and their like were raised to power by military coups, and with regard to Horthy and Franco, we must add the assistance of foreign capitalism. As far as we know, this essential characteristic of fascism as a mass movement was clearly described for the first time by Heinrich Brandler at a session of the Central Committee of the Communist Party of Germany in December 1922. 93. On the one hand, there is, of course, the will of large-scale capitalism to make an end of democracy in independent working-class organizations. On the other hand, there are the masses in a state of ferment who unconsciously render it considerable assistance to this end. 94, we say advisedly, the will of large-scale capitalism, because nothing would be farther from the truth than to regard fascism as a tendency of capitalism as a whole. 95. Fascism is certainly a mass movement, and an anti-Marxist mass movement, and thus at first sight apparently a negation of Marxism by those very elements for which Marxism claims to speak. Could there be a more conclusive refutation? Let us take care not to jump to too hasty conclusions. Marx certainly declared that the development of capitalism, 
whilst creating the objective conditions for socialism, would also create the subjective conditions by developing the maturity of the proletariat parallel to that of capitalism, but he never said that the development of the proletariat to maturity, the subjective factor, would take place from one day to the next, and he even foresaw long periods of delay. 96. Have those who complain of the lack of maturity of the working class ever asked themselves whether capitalism is already sufficiently ripe to give birth to socialist society? Can we really demand that all the victims of capitalism in decline should become 100% socialists when the capitalist economic system is still far from lending itself to a 100% socialization? One thing is not possible without the other. The immaturity of a very considerable fraction of the workers only corresponds with the immaturity of capitalism. This statement may please or displease, but it is nevertheless a fact. And far from refuting Marxist theory, it confirms it. The socialist transformation of the economic system is the first revolution in human history in which the actors, the human beings involved, know what they are doing and why they are doing it. 97. All preceding revolutions were characterized by the fundamental fact that the revolutionaries harbored illusions concerning the nature of the new birth it was their mission to deliver from the womb of the old society in labor. The first Christians of antiquity, the religious communist sects of the Middle Ages, and the heroes of 1789, all accomplished an historic mission very different from what they had imagined. And to the extent to which they were successful, they assisted in the birth of a new society very different from their utopian aspirations. Thanks to Marx we know today in what direction capitalism is developing, and to what it must give birth. One important section of the working class has already grasped this truth, and it has grasped it so well, and its socialist ideas have spread to such an extent, that even fascist organizations are compelled to use more or less socialist labels in order to capture the discontented but still unenlightened masses. Hypocrisy is the homage paid by vice to virtue. Those discontented masses who let themselves be regimented by fascism merit a closer examination. All observers are in agreement that the mass elements stirred up by fascism against democracy are recruited from the middle classes, peasants included, in course of proletarianization, from amongst the unemployed, and in particularly the very young ones, and amongst certain categories of wage earners who have not yet reached class consciousness. On this point we must recommend those of our readers who would like more detailed documentation to the valuable book of Daniel Grin. We feel ourselves obliged to lay particular stress here on a fact to which, in our opinion, insufficient importance has been attached, namely, the resistance put up to the spread of fascist ideology by those masses belonging to democratic working class organizations, or under their influence. On the eve of Hitler's triumph, under a reign of terror, by the sinister light of the Reichstag fire, at the last elections which were still to some extent free, the so-called Marxist bloc remained almost intact. A really infinitesimal percentage of the voters making up this bloc succumbed to Nazi agitation. Apart from an insignificant number of deserters, the clear fact remains outstanding that fascism did not succeed in gaining any ground amongst the masses organized in the trade unions and by social democracy. The masses of the people who followed the fascist drum did not come from what was called the Marxist camp. The fascist revolution was not supported by those who had previously been drawn into the ranks of working class organizations and imbued with their ideology. It was supported precisely by those who had been untouched by the influence of these organizations, by those who had been neglected by these organizations, or those they had tried to win and failed. Here we have two movements, both driven by powerful mass impulses, and both the result of capitalist decline and directed against capitalism, but in one of these movements there was consciousness of class and a deep attachment to democracy as an indispensable element of socialism whilst in the other there was unenlightened revolt, a blind rush, and faith in the omnipotence of Messiah. The existence of these two parallel movements of revolt side by side need surprise no one. In view of the lack of maturity or present-day capitalism from the standpoint of the establishment of complete socialism, 
It would be more surprising if all the victims of the capitalist crisis gave proof of exemplary socialist enlightenment. The hybrid character of the present period of transition reflects itself precisely in the rise, side by side with the enlightened masses who know more or less what they want, of other masses, hardly awakened out of their sleep, just sufficiently enlightened to know what they don't want, and ready to fall into any trap. We are here in the presence of an anti-capitalist revolt, in which the purely instinctive and utopian movements of past revolutions reappear side by side with an enlightened movement directed towards a socialist aim, and by that very fact deeply attached to democracy, in short, the educated and organized working class. And it is the former of these two movements, the instinctive and utopian movement, which large-scale capitalism succeeds in pressing into its service and using to defend its privileges. Was this development really so unforeseen? Even in the Manifesto of the Communist Party published in 1847, Marx and Engels predicted that a section of the masses, the lumpen proletariat, were inclined far more for the part of a bribed tool of reactionary intrigue. 98. And in 1892 Karl Kautsky wrote as follows describing the mentality of the newly proletarianized elements. This mentality is not yet dead. There is a tendency towards it in every proletarian stratum which prepares itself to enter the ranks of the fighting proletariat, it shows itself in every country whose proletariat is just beginning to realize how unworthy and intolerable its situation is, and to become socialist, without, however, yet having any clear view of social conditions, and without having sufficient confidence in itself to wage a protracted class struggle. Seeing that more and more countries are being drawn into the capitalist mode of production and becoming proletarianized, it is clear that this mentality of the first utopian worker socialists can come to the fore again and again. It is an infantile sickness which threatens every young proletarian socialist movement which has not yet developed beyond the stage of utopianism. In that period these unenlightened strivings took on the forms of anarchism and blanquism, but just after the world war they poured themselves into the Bolshevist mold. Nothing of this is absolutely new in history. What characterizes the revolutions of the past is precisely the fact that the masses engaged in revolutionary action were pulling the chestnuts out of the fire for a new minority of exploiters who were preparing to take the place of the old dominant class whose regime had outlived its day. These revolutions destroyed the shell of the old society and revealed the new economic and social structure which had risen within it. Is that perhaps what is happening today with fascist revolutions? we shall see in the following chapter. There is, however, if we accept the history of ancient Rome, a new factor, a section of the privileged class deliberately uses these declassed elements and those in course of being proletarianized, provides them with funds and completes their corruption. The fascist movement is not merely a movement of suddenly declassed masses, it is also a movement of mercenaries. It is chronic unemployment which creates the reservoir from which fascism preferably draws its mercenaries. In those countries which have suffered for many years from widespread and chronic unemployment, the unemployed begin to form a special class, very similar to the proletariat of antiquity, which, according to Sismondi's definition, had to be maintained by society, whereas the modern proletariat maintained society. Long years of enforced idleness create a special mentality which finally expresses itself in the demand bread and circuses. Just as in ancient Rome the proletariat was recruited by the cliques and fractions engaged in the struggle for power, so, in our own day a large fraction of the permanently unemployed workers has been enrolled in fascist bands. The masses set in movement by the fascist leaders are thus composed of the most diverse elements of all sorts of victims of capitalism, still insufficiently enlightened, still outside the influence of working class organizations, and finally turning against these organizations. They rush blindly to the assault, take the citadel of power, and install their leader in it. Revolution or counter-revolution? Fascism is, for good or ill, a revolutionary movement, at least with regard to the masses. However, those who pull the strings behind it are obviously following other aims. This has always been the case in history, 
In most of the revolutions of the past, the leaders of the movement had aims other than those of their followers. Fascism is thus a revolutionary movement in the sense of past history. Chemists know that certain substances in a nascent state react differently to the same stimulus than when they are fully constituted. It is the same with the masses pauperized by capitalism. Let us try as far as possible to analyze the distinctive and essential traits of these two anti-capitalist movements, the socialist and trade union movement on the one hand and the fascist movement on the other, whose hostility and whose clash so tragically characterizes the period in which we are living. I, with regard to socialism and trade unionism we have a a clear consciousness of its socialist aim, the knowledge of the end towards which existing society is moving, there is no longer, as in the revolutions of the past, any discrepancy between the professed aims of the movement and the objective aim of social development. b. The conscious limitation of action in accordance with what the existing order can objectively permit at each given stage of its development. Thanks to historical materialism and an analysis of the capitalist economic system it is now possible to determine the aims capable of immediate attainment in accordance with the maturity of each stage of capitalist development. c. The evident desire to avoid a violent clash between the opposing classes, to avoid above all the outbreak of civil war, and to see that the necessary transformation takes place legally and by democratic means. 99. This desire is dictated above all by the recognition, unquestionably justified, that civil war leads to dictatorship and destroys all possibility of progress towards socialism, which is inconceivable without democracy. d. More humane and more civilized methods of action, scientific socialism has taught the workers that their enemies are not this or that person, not the industrialist or the banker b, but the capitalist system itself whence follows the rejection of terrorist acts and individual violence. The liquidation of individuals cannot solve the social problem. 2. With regard to the fascist masses we have a. Vague socialist aspirations coupled with a mystic nationalist exaltation, an absolute ignorance of the tendencies which determine the development of the existing order of society, utopian ideas in complete discord with economic necessities giving rise to a discrepancy between the purely imaginary subjective aims, and the objective aim of historical development. b. An absolute inability to determine what is possible and at the same time necessary at a given moment. c. Demagogic incitement openly striving towards civil war, and undeterred by the prospect of violence, this is the direct result of a profound ignorance of economic, social and historical questions. 100 d. Medieval methods, stamped with horrible cruelty and sadism, all fascist agitation is accompanied by innumerable acts of terrorist violence against individuals and aims at the physical extermination of its enemies. This comparison clearly reveals the enormous amount of educational work accomplished during the past 50 years by trade union and socialist organizations. From a mob which once reacted as the masses now being dragged along in the wake of fascism react, these organizations have become associations of free and enlightened men, understanding the real possibilities and the conditions of their emancipation. However, this intellectual and moral force was, it is true, also a cause of their weakness in face of the assault carried out by masses brought to white heat by fascist demagogy as we have seen in countries where fascism has made unscrupulous use of every possible weapon and crushed them in an unequal battle. 101. But yet another point arises from this comparison. In the light of the characteristics we have examined above, the fascist movement appears as a movement of declassed and recently proletarianized elements whose reactions are very similar to those of the uneducated working men of a century ago. In the one case as in the other we have violence with no clearly defined objective, a blind revolt purely negative and destructive, and total ignorance of the causes of poverty and the means to abolish it. What caused the defeat of the working class organizations, both trade union and socialist, in the countries where fascism has triumphed, was the growing process of proletarianization accelerated by the economic crisis. 
people have often spoken of the political errors committed by these organizations, which are said to have driven a part of the disillusioned masses into the fascist camp. It is indisputable that very grave errors indeed were committed. However, we must ask ourselves whether it was really these errors which caused the disaster, or whether it was not rather the impossibility of these organizations, even if they had pursued the best policy in the world, of attracting and assimilating in a few years that avalanche of newly proletarianized elements whose socialist and trade union education really required long and patient labor. If fascism has proved anything, it is certainly not the failure of Marxism, but rather the folly of those Marxists who imagined that both capitalism and the proletariat were sufficiently mature to make possible the establishment of a socialist society at one blow. Minerva springing, fully armed, from the brain of Jupiter, the vision is certainly captivating, but sociology is not mythology, and Marxist science has nothing to do with fortune-telling. The only misfortune is that some fortune-tellers, believing themselves to be Marxists, provide the enemies of Marxism with valuable weapons gratis. Chapter 4 – The Birth of a New World Up to the present we have been trying to retrace the evolution of Marxist ideas. We have seen that the followers of Marx and Engels contributed important clarifications and additions as they were made possible by the development of capitalism and the growth of working class organizations. These clarifications and additions were naturally worked out in discussion which sometimes became violent, and this caused a number of critics to talk of the crisis of Marxism. Every one of these discussions was, in fact, a crisis, but it was a crisis of growth. A living movement which proposes to transform the world, and which bases itself upon a doctrine according to which the world itself is in perpetual evolution, must ceaselessly struggle to gain new knowledge and to adapt its action to changing circumstances. This ceaseless ideological struggle, which we may well regard as a succession of crises, seems to us to be the best proof of its vitality. We approve entirely of what Karl Renner wrote in 1933. The task of Marxism in our day is not to explain the writings of Marx by a subtle commentary, or to simplify them by drawing up an inappropriate catechism but to analyze the new situation of the proletariat by means of the Marxist method. Just as the proletariat has progressed and changed from decade to decade, so capitalism itself takes on new forms suited to every stage of its development. Therefore Marxism, as a science, is in a certain sense timeless. As long as the economic system develops it will demand an analysis of its changes by the methods of Marx. Marxism will be dead only when it ceases to renew itself every day. 1. However, in certain cases these crises of growth may take on more serious forms and even end temporarily in a considerable weakening of the socialist movement and its organizations. When the socialist idea takes root in countries which are only at an early stage of their industrial development and where the working class is still backward, or when in more highly developed capitalist countries, it wins over large masses previously lacking in all socialist enlightenment, then we observe a recrudescence of the whole gamut of pre-Marxist conceptions. It was no accident that at the end of the 19th century Russia witnessed a recrudescence of Sismondism amongst the Narodniki, of Blankwism amongst the Bolshevists before 1917, and of Saint Simonism amongst the Bolshevists who developed into bureau technocrats in the period of Bolshevism's degeneration. However, such is the hold of Marxism, of the word, not of the doctrine, on the mind of man, that when reborn the greater part of these primitive socialist ideologies take a Marxist label, and with the sectarian elan which characterizes this primitive form of socialism, they claim the title of the only authentic Marxism not knowing that in reality they represent only a relapse into doctrines long since superseded by Marxism. The advocates of this primitive socialism in the newly industrialized countries, like the new recruits to socialism in the more highly developed countries, would like to have their old-fashioned notions accepted as new knowledge, and to foist them onto working class organizations which left them behind long before. Two. After Kautsky it was Rosa Luxemburg who showed on two occasions, in her polemics against Bernstein and Lenin, 
how these outworn ideas come to life again amongst masses of the people unenlightened by socialism. 3. From this angle we see that it is not a question of a crisis of Marxism, but a crisis of differing and distorted interpretations of Marxist doctrine. We believe that in the foregoing we have demonstrated that what has failed was not Marxism at all, but the ideas and practices of pseudo-Marxists. Obviously, it might be objected that the failure of Marxism lies precisely in the fact that it did not succeed in winning over these masses of new recruits and saving them from their pre-Marxist illusions. However, as we have already pointed out, the winning over of these masses is a long and arduous task, and it is one which is constantly hindered by the entry of still further proletarian masses into the socialist struggle. Those who proclaim the definite failure of Marxism have let themselves be hypnotized by what has happened in Germany. They forget that everywhere else, where the situation was less tragic, and where socialist parties did not find themselves threatened with avalanches of new elements suddenly declassed and difficult to assimilate from one day to the next, the appearance of new recruits on the political scene did not at all lead to a weakening of socialism, but rather to the contrary. The fact that the doctrine of Marxism has emerged unscathed from the ordeal of fire to which it has been subjected during the past 25 years entitles us to use the Marxist method without hesitation to examine in this last chapter the economic and social structure as it presents itself to us after the shock of war, the upheavals of the post-war period, and the ravages of the last economic crisis. Changes of vast importance have taken place. Where do we stand? Where does the working class stand? What is, what must be the action of socialism and of the trade union movement in the face of this accelerated development? We shall do our best to reply to these questions presently, without, of course, making any claim to distill absolute truths, but with the sole aim of contributing to a clarification of ideas. I the end of capitalism even in circles far removed from the working class movement and its traditional ideology, people are beginning to speak more and more often of the end of capitalism, or at least of the crisis of the capitalist system. Others oppose such talk and declare that capital is not a special category, but something as old as the human race, something which will only disappear with it. Most of the discussions around this question suffer from one initial disadvantage, an inadequate definition of the subject under discussion, and this is common both to the adversaries and defenders of capitalism. The result is that many of these discussions only add to the already existing confusion because each of the disputants has a different interpretation of the terms he uses. The difficulties encountered by those who try to define what capitalism is proceed from various causes and the most important of these are. a. Capitalism has never existed alone. Throughout history it has existed only in conjunction with other economic formations essentially different from itself, and in this way the student has been led to confuse its own proper characteristics with those of coexisting formations. b. There are several types of capitalism. The capitalism of classic antiquity, essentially mercantile and usurious hardly entered into the sphere of production, and like the similar capitalism of the end of the Middle Ages, and again in the 17th century, had very little in common with the form of capitalism which we call modern, and whose growth and development have changed the face of the world during the past 150 years. C. Capitalism, as a socio-economic category, transcends all definitions of a technical and psychological order. Those who ask whether this or that thing, machinery, buildings, money, is or is not capital by virtue of its technical properties lose sight of those social relations, and in particular of those property relations, which permit us to distinguish precisely between one economic formation and the other. Those who look for psychological characteristics and insist, for example, on the motive of personal interest, forget that this is as old as humanity, that it existed and still exists, in all economic and social formations, and that these formations can be distinguished by the form in which this motive manifests itself. According to circumstances, it comes to its own in an organization at times more collectivist, at times more individualist, and in varying degrees. However, 
What interests us in this book is obviously modern capitalism. What distinguishes modern from antique and medieval capitalism is that it has gone beyond the sphere of circulation, commerce and usury, and taken undisputed hold of production. Money, destined to produce more money, can thenceforth function in production also, not occasionally, but permanently, as the general rule. Modern capitalism ended by completely routing natural self-sufficing economy, all the goods essential to mankind became commodities. In all countries in which modern capitalism has triumphed, no one can consume without buying, and to buy he must sell. The market, an accessory factor only for preceding economic formations, has become the vital center of society, the absolute sovereign of its life process. By its inexorable expansion, for, the new mode of production established what we now call capitalist property, modern, which rests on the fact that the workers, having no property of their own, are compelled to sell their labor power in order to exist. In preceding social formations, the wage-earning class represented a minor factor, an exception, it is the essential general characteristic of modern capitalism. We have already indicated the difference between modern capitalism and the purely commercial and usurious capitalism of past time. It is also important to distinguish modern capitalism from two other social forms often referred to, slavery and serfdom. Under slavery the worker is the property of his master just as much as cattle. 5. Under serfdom the worker had to serve the seigneur in time and kind. In both these cases it is the law which makes the worker in the one case a slave and in the other a tributary. In neither case is he free. In both cases his maintenance is assured, whether ill or well, a quantitative question, does not interest us in this qualitative analysis. Under modern capitalism the worker is free. No legal pressure compels him to sell his labor power. He can take a job where he likes and when he likes or remain idle if it pleases him. Only the commodity market, to which he must go to live, compels him to subject himself to the changing conditions of the labor market. However, the disappearance of all legal protection corresponds to this legal liberty. If, for causes usually independent of their will, the owners of the means of production cannot employ the available workers, these workers are doomed to starvation. 6. On the other hand, the owners of the means of production enjoy the same liberty. They, too, have the right to produce what they like, and when they like, to sell their products at any price that seems agreeable to them, to any customers they like, and at any time that seems expedient. However, their sovereign, the market, punishes their errors. The stability of their existence is no more guaranteed than that of the wage workers. We could define modern capitalism as follows. 7. It is a system of free economy characterized by the fact that the means of production, too big to be used individually, are the property of a minority, who, for wages, employ the majority, excluded from that property, and appropriate to themselves a part of the value created by that majority, surplus value. Both the minority and the majority are legally free. The impersonal authority of the market decides everything above their heads. It is only since the appearance of this system that political economy, the search for the laws which govern economic workings above the heads of the minority and majority at the instance of natural laws, has become a science. Adam Smith, David Ricardo and Karl Marx formulated the laws which govern this system. The influence of this system is so great that the ideas which have grown up with it, and which are actually specific to it, have been transferred to the pre-capitalist forms which surround it and which exist within its framework, so that even the artisan and the peasant speak of their capital, whereas a tool of production or a sum of money is not in itself capital, but may become so through its function. A machine is capital not because it is a machine, but because it is owned by a particular person who uses it to let others work, whilst these workers, not owning it, are obliged to accept the conditions which he imposes upon them. The beginnings of capitalism are characterized by a universal process of dissociation and dissolution, accompanied by a contrary process of association and integration equally universal, 
the dissolution of the final remnants of natural self-sufficing economy, the dissociation of simple mercantile economy and its replacement by the second degree of mercantile economy, capitalist economy, the destruction of all bonds between the producer and the soil, between the producer and property, the atomization of the economic process in the hands of innumerable individuals, employers, absolutely independent of each other. Amidst this atomization there develops spontaneous association, the automatic coordination of these atoms, the creation of national and world markets, and the drawing in of backward regions and hitherto neglected economic units into the economic system as a whole. Thus there is an atomization into millions of independent economic units, but at the same time the transformation of all these units into integral parts of the mechanism of capitalism. All these economic units are governed by the same law, the law of value, and set in motion by the same motive force, average profit. All are equal before this law, and competition governs the whole. In this chaos new relations are finally created. In our book Economy Dirigi et Socialization we analyze the transition from liberal capitalism to organized capitalism. As we are unable to give a detailed study of this development here, we are compelled to refer our readers to this book, and to limit ourselves to a summary sketch of the essential traits of these new relations which have so greatly changed the aspect of traditional capitalism. 8. The process of monopolization, cartels, trusts and agreements, gives rise to organized islands in a sea of anarchical chaos. In addition, it creates multiple relations of which the following are the most frequent forms. a. Within industry, in the chain which stretches from the raw material to the finished product, consisting of a multitude of links, enterprises, independent of each other, one link acquires a particular importance, the raw material industry may subjugate the manufacturing industry, dictate its conditions of sale, and reduce it to dependence, the heavy industries reduce the engineering industries in this fashion, the manufacturing industries, on the other hand, may dictate the conditions of purchase to the raw material industries, the sugar refiners reduce in this way the producers of raw sugar and the beet farmers. b. Between industry and commerce, one branch of industry may subordinate the commercial branch which sells its products, coal, the practice of uniformly fixed prices, one branch of commerce may subordinate the industry which has need of it. Importers and exporters of commodities can place industry at their mercy. C. In commerce, wholesale commerce may reduce retail commerce to the position of a dependent. Retail commerce, department stores, chain stores, dictates its conditions to wholesale commerce. D. Between the banks, industry and commerce, the banks hold industry and whole branches of commerce under their thumb, industries and more rarely branches of commerce, found banks of their own, or subordinate certain existing banks. All these relations gradually turn an amorphous economic system into a vertebrated economic system. The process goes into reverse, atomization is replaced by organization, the integration of scattered units, formerly spontaneous and automatic, becomes voluntary. Freedom at the one pole corresponds with the acceptance of restraint at the other. This process of integration, coordination, and subordination considerably modifies the circulation of value and the distribution of profit. Under liberal capitalism, the total revenue of the capitalist class, surplus value, SV, is composed of P plus I plus R. P represents the profit of the active capitalists. I represents the interest accruing to the loan capitalists, and R represents rent going to the landed proprietors. P contains a fraction of value which is not surplus value but wages. A part of the revenues of the active capitalists is, in fact, remuneration for highly qualified work, wages of superintendents. Let us now examine the modifications brought about in this distribution by the changes in the structure of the modern economic system. The monopolies, trusts, etc., sell their commodities at enhanced prices, at monopoly prices. In this way they seize a fraction of the surplus value which should, according to the rules of automatic capitalism, 
go into the pockets of other capitalists, and thereby they cause a fall in the rate of profit in those branches of industry not under monopolist control. This fall tends to make profit in these branches of industry approximate to simple wages of superintendents. This is what happens in the economic system as a whole, a transfer of value from a non-monopolist sector to a monopolist sector takes place on a smaller scale, but in a more thorough fashion in the processes which stretch from the production of the raw material to the distribution of the finished product. Originally, under liberal capitalism, such a chain looked as follows. I-234 V. Raw material production production of machinery manufacture wholesale commerce retail commerce. P1 plus VS1 P2 plus VS2 P3 plus VS3 P4 plus VS4 P5 plus VS5. To each one of these links falls a share of the profit in proportion to the amount of capital invested in it. But over and above the profit probably so called which is a part of the total surplus value, which we have indicated as P, there is the wages of superintendents, a part of variable capital, paid by the capitalists to themselves, which we have indicated as versus, an abbreviation for variable superintendents. However, when one of these links, for example the second, subordinates the four others by dictating to the producer of raw material its own conditions of purchase, and to the manufacturing and commercial links its conditions of sale, the table changes. The remuneration of link 2 increases at the expense of links I, 3, 4 and V. Should the second link obtain absolute dominance over the others, the chain will finally appear as follows. I 2 3 4 V. Raw material production production of machinery manufacture wholesale commerce retail commerce. VS1 P2 plus VS2 plus P1 plus P plus P4 plus P5 VS3 VS4 VS5. Link 2 attracts all the profit, properly so called, which belongs to the whole chain, and reduces the other links to simple wages of superintendents. The active capitalists I, 3, 4 and V have become simple executive agents, mere employees of Link 2. Instead of an automatic and proportional distribution of profit, we find the stronger apportioning the revenue of the weaker. According to circumstances, this new order of precedence may interest the chain as a whole, or only one part of it. It happens sometimes that the dominant link subordinates only its immediate neighbors. Thus we observe that the functions of active capital are slowly being divested of their capitalist character. In a large section of the economic system, the return on capital is tending to become simple wages of superintendents, whilst profit, properly so called, is being seized more and more by the monopolists. The development of the credit system has given rise to changes no less important. Credit is at the basis of the joint stock company system. In the joint stock companies we can observe a double modification of the distribution of surplus value. On the one hand, the active capitalist conducting his own business is disappearing. Every shareholder is a joint owner of the business. However, the dividends he receives tend to become interest pure and simple. Profit, the most important part of surplus value, is seized by an administrative oligarchy instead of being distributed amongst the shareholders as a whole. These administrators are not the owners of the business and they seldom take any part in its technical and commercial direction. They control the business as usufructuaries, and draw a disproportionate amount of the revenue thanks to their installation at a commanding position in the circulation of surplus value, thanks to a practical monopoly and not to their real function in the economic system, or even to a sufficient property title. This evolution is similar in more than one respect to that which made the feudal seigneur at first the simple leader and protector of his peasants, and later their exploiter. With the disappearance of the active capitalist, his real functions in economic life are being taken over by highly qualified paid workers. This separation between capitalist property and the directive function of the capitalist corresponds to the clear separation between the two parts of which the capitalist's return was formerly composed, versus and p. versus, variable superintendents, 
is paid to technical and commercial directors in the form of salaries, and thus appears quite clearly as variable capital, whilst P, profit, divested of its last semblance of a return for labor, appears openly as the fruit of the exploitation of man by man. And this profit does not go into the hands of the shareholders, who are the real owners of the business, who have to content themselves with a dividend which is usually reduced to mere I, but to a new oligarchy. Karl Marx points out all this in his capital, and in his theories of surplus value. Our whole demonstration is based on his analysis. The only difference between his epoch and ours is that the rudimentary elements of his day have grown and developed in ours. The exception of his day has become the rule of ours. Whilst formerly organized capitalism developed within the framework of free competition, today free competition plays only the limited role assigned to it by organized capitalism. Quantity has now been transformed into quality. The reducing of all those who perform a real function as the directors of economic activity to the level of mere paid superintendents is carried out simultaneously by monopolization and by the development of the credit system. As it is generally joint stock companies which control the monopolies, and which represent the strongest links in a given chain, the profits seized by their administrative oligarchy comprise, apart from the profit of the particular joint stock company itself also the profit of the subordinated links. The monopolist and finance oligarchy thus tends to reduce the revenues of all those active agents in the economic process, both within the joint stock company itself and in all those undertakings which it has succeeded in subordinating by commercial relations, to the level of mere wages. All active functions in economic life are tending to become subordinate activity carried out in the interests of a new oligarchy and rewarded solely by wages. The reducing of all active elements to a wage or salary earning class will cause a change in the function of this class itself, when society as a whole takes the place of the administrative oligarchy. This line of reasoning brings us to the conclusion that capitalism as defined by the classic economists and by Karl Marx is now approaching its end. The structure of the present-day economic system is so different from that of liberal capitalism of the 19th century that we find far more points of difference than resemblance. Organized capitalism from the beginning of our century up to the outbreak of the World War marked the transition between the two formations. Today we might say that the differences between the two lie in the things, whilst the resemblances are in the terms. The old terminology is now being used to describe a state of affairs entirely different from that which gave it birth. The profit of the active capitalists in the non-monopolist sector of the economic system contains less and less surplus value, and is being more and more reduced to mere wages of superintendents. The interest drawn by the great mass of the smaller investors, whilst still remaining a part of surplus value, has quite ceased to be the return of capitalists without function, loan capitalists. It can no longer insure them a leisured existence, and is changed more or less into insurance. The major portion of the employer's profit does not go into the hands of the active capitalists, but into the hands of a very limited number of monopolists and financiers who usually do not own the property or even an important part of the joint property of those enterprises from which they draw their excessive remuneration. And it is these functionless elements who take the lion's share when surplus value is distributed. Such changes are unquestionably of a qualitative nature. The capitalism examined by Marx is disappearing. But to those who are inclined to declare that this very fact shows that Marxism has lost its basis and its reason for existence, we must reply that Marx was the first to perceive these changes, and thus to assist us very considerably in recognizing these new forms now that they have come to maturity. We might, of course, engage in long argument concerning the term suitable for defining this new economic formation, but we must confess that we feel very little desire to do so. Whether this new formation is called neo-capitalism or monopolist and finance capitalism, or even state capitalism, 9, we propose merely to point out that all these appellations preserve the term capitalism, and are therefore in our opinion calculated to cause a great deal of confusion. The world which is being born before our eyes is a new formation, 
an economic system sui generis, meriting special analysis, and occupying a place of its own in the history of economic formations. The preservation of the term capitalism seems to us all the more dangerous because it tends to hide something essential to the workers' struggle for emancipation, namely the new conformation of social classes, which must to a great extent determine the tactics, the immediate objectives and the alliances of socialism. These fundamental structural changes, proclaiming the approaching end of capitalism, have their counterpart in the chronic stagnation from which the capitalist world has suffered since the end of the World War. The laws and the tendencies of development formulated by Marx are now more active than ever they were. The various modifying tendencies of development, also formulated by Marx, are showing themselves to be less and less effective. There is unquestionably a close connection between the disappearance of the capitalist structure and the paralysis of the functioning of capitalist economy. 10. This connection is characterized by reciprocal action, the change of structure paralyzes the once famous automatism, as Rudolf Hilferding demonstrated in 1910 in his finance capital, and the progressive paralysis of the automatic functioning gives rise in its turn to the development and consolidation of control levers, in other words, to an increasingly fundamental structural transformation. This development, during the course of which capitalism divests itself more and more of all those characteristics which permit it to be called capitalism at all, liquidates itself, so to speak. 11. It has achieved its highest degree of development in the totalitarian countries, whose economic structure shows the clearest characteristics of a period of transition. 2. The Intermediary Forms Contemporary socialism is a prey to two contradictory sentiments with regard to the totalitarian states. It abhors and denounces their political regime, which deprives the masses of the people of their elementary rights, freedom of thought freedom of expression, and liberty of association. At the same time it is compelled to recognize the efforts of these states to control and direct their economic systems. We are well aware, of course, that their efforts in this respect are inspired by damnable ends, the consolidation of a pitiless dictatorship over the working people, and, at any rate in Germany and Italy, preparations for a war of aggression. However, from the economic point of view these totalitarian states have brought new facts into being. More than anyone else they have developed what we have termed control levers. Thus they are laying the foundations for a controlled economic system delivered from the anarchy of the capitalist market. These control levers are being developed in order to bring about the establishment of a controlled economy, because without such levers a controlled economy would be impossible. The aversion which democratic socialism feels towards the totalitarian states, where human beings are harassed and persecuted for their opinions, must not, however, deflect us from an objective examination of the economic structure of these states, and of the control levers which are being developed before our eyes. These observations apply equally, it must be pointed out, to both Germany and Italy, and to Russia. No doubt we shall be asked whether it is possible for democratic socialists to discipline themselves to the necessary objectivity. We shall reply with a distinct affirmative, providing the Marxist method is scrupulously followed. Ninety years ago Marx was faced with a youthful and hardly developed capitalism. Today we are faced with a new economic system developing in the totalitarian states. Whilst overwhelming adolescent capitalism with those vehement criticisms which we all know, Marx never ceased to stress the progressive side of that same capitalism in comparison with the feudal system of which it was the heir. Whilst ceaselessly stigmatizing the sufferings which the new economic system inflicted upon the working class, Marx justly insisted on the immense progress represented by capitalism as compared with the defunct feudal system. It is in this way that we should examine both the fascist and Soviet economic systems. We are well aware of, and we have denounced the dictatorial regimes established in these countries, which are reactionary as compared with the aspirations of the workers, deprived of all liberty, and, above all, of the right of free association. However, their economic systems are nonetheless progressive as compared with liberal capitalism. 
compared with liberal capitalism they represent a superior stage of social evolution, inasmuch as they do strive to control and discipline the blind laws of the capitalist market, and towards this end they develop appropriate control levers. Let us recall the striking formula used by Marx in drawing a distinction between the machine itself and the use to which it was put by capitalism. Towards those workers who wanted to destroy machinery, Marx stressed that the machine as such was the instrument par excellence of their emancipation, and that only its capitalist utilization with a view to the production of surplus value was to be condemned. In the dictatorial countries we can see new instruments developing and forming themselves. However, they are not instruments of iron and steel, but social machinery, which we have termed control levers. These control levers, these legal institutions permit the influencing of the market, and the directing of economic activity, and they must be judged as Marx judged the machinery of iron and steel. We must draw a clear distinction between these control levers as such and their use in the hands of a dictatorial oligarchy. We welcome the arrival and the development of these control levers, and we are prepared to admit frankly that their consolidation is as acceptable a fact as the development of machinery in Marx's day. But, like Marx, we denounce their utilization in the hands of an oligarchy of plutocrats and technocrats, which prevents the community having access to them. Unless they want to lapse into the primitive ideology of the machine breakers. Democratic socialists must not aim at destroying what good has been created by the totalitarian dictatorships in this field. Just as Marx gave the workers the task of removing the machine from the absolute power of capital, we today must put forward as our task the removal of the control levers from the pitiless hands of a plutocracy, a bureaucracy and a technocracy in order that the community as a whole may become master of them. Let us therefore objectively examine the economic structure of the totalitarian states. In order to simplify matters we propose to use the term fascist here for both Germany and Italy. The difference between the two economic systems is, in fact, one of degree and not of kind. Under organized capitalism the growing influence of private monopolies and state institutions permits economic agents provided with a certain power to use the laws of the market instead of submitting to them. The automatic distribution of commodities changes into a controlled distribution, and the automatic distribution of revenues changes into a dictatorially allotted distribution. The freedom of the immense majority of economic agents to dispose of their property just as they like is limited no longer by the markets alone, as formerly, but by the will of other agents more powerful than themselves. However, in spite of that some freedom still prevails, the market is still the dominant factor. First of all, capital has still a certain margin of freedom to invest itself as it wishes, and secondly, the wage workers have still the freedom to choose what employment suits them. Under fascist economy, on the other hand, these two essential characteristics of capitalism disappear. The wage working class is enslaved, its organizations destroyed, and its conditions of work and life greatly deteriorated. But the employing class itself is also no longer free. The fascist dictatorship is, in fact, not the dictatorship of capitalism. In origin it is the dictatorship of a very restricted fraction of the capitalist class, the monopolist and finance plutocracy, over all other classes, but even this restricted fraction of the capitalist class does not enjoy absolute power. It is compelled to share economic power to an increasing extent with the state apparatus, with the fascist bureaucracy. In view of the innumerable economic functions exercised by the state in our day, that bureaucracy is not to be confounded with the bureaucracy which existed under liberal capitalism. Being an economic factor of first-rate importance, the state today becomes the forcing house of a new class of exploiters. There are disputes and competition between the plutocracy and the machinery of state, but we can also observe a progressive fusion between the two. 12. The state, in the hands of the plutocracy and the bureaucracy, enemies, but allies, disposes of the means of production, controls the investment of capital, and reduces the wage workers to the level of slaves. Under fascist dictatorship organization dominates the market, 
whereas under organized capitalism the market still dominates organization. We can say, of course, that the elements of the fascist social structure already exist under organized capitalism. What is called the fascist revolution has certainly not created any new social structure, it has merely torn away the veil which, under organized capitalism, still covers already clearly developed relations. It releases something already existing within the framework of the preceding order in just the same way as the bourgeois revolution released liberal capitalism, which was already constituted within the framework of the old society. In as far as fascism adopts nationalization, it is aiming merely to tighten the control of the ruling clique, and still further to dispossess the smaller capitalists. Fascism establishes an absolute economic dictatorship of that clique over all other social classes. In addition to introducing forced labor for the wage workers, it carries out the expropriation of the smaller capitalists, the final act of capitalist evolution predicted by Marx. And even where this expropriation is not carried out by the brutal methods of adolescent capitalism, it takes place by the reduction of the smaller capitalists to the level of paid superintendents. What nominally remains their capital still bears its fruit, but it falls into the hands of others, the dominant clique. The essential difference between the Soviet economic system, 13, and that of the fascist countries lies in the fact that the new ruling class in Russia was not born of a fusion with the old oligarchy, because large-scale monopolist and finance capital in Russia was represented principally by the foreign capitalist element. In Germany and in Italy the ruling class is plutotechnocratic, whereas in Russia it is bureautechnocratic. With regard to property relations we can observe a difference of degree, but not of kind. The ruling clique in Russia does not possess the means of production which it dictatorially controls any more than the ruling clique in the fascist countries does. In Russia these means of production are the property of the state, and in Germany and Italy they are the property of capitalist shareholders, but whilst the Pluto technocracy in Germany and Italy does own quite an important part of the means of production, the Russian bureau technocracy owns no part whatever. In both cases, however, the control of the whole economic apparatus is not bound up with property rights. Under different forms and by different methods both Plutotechnocracy and Bureautechnocracy have sounded the knell of the capitalist class. In the fascist countries we can still observe the existence of capitalist characteristics, whereas in Russia these characteristics have been radically destroyed as a result of the absolute seizure by the state of all the means of production and distribution. Although the Russian economic system has often been called state capitalism, and although the term state slavery employed by Karl Kautsky seems to us a more appropriate designation, in our opinion the present Russian regime is not slavery, or serfdom, or capitalism, but something of all three. It is related to slavery and serfdom by the absolute and total suppression of all freedom for the workers, who are tied by domestic passports to their places of residence, and often to their places of employment, like the feudal serf to the gleb. It is related to capitalism by the preservation of a great number of economic categories and legal forms. However, it is fundamentally different from any of these systems. With more reason, and, of course, with all those reservations proper to such historical comparisons, we may rather compare the present Russian regime with the social and economic regime of the Incas, who dictatorially governed Peru before the discovery of America an authoritatively controlled economic system strongly marked by numerous communist traits, but with a division of society into classes. No one can say how and towards what this curious social system might have developed had not a brutal and rapacious conqueror brought it to a sudden and premature end. It is quite certain, however, that on an infinitely larger scale, with an incomparably higher mass culture, and provided with all the achievements of 20th century science, our modern Inca is over what is called one-sixth of the globe reproduces from the social and political point of view the most characteristic traits or Peruvian Incaism of 400 years ago. Just as the Russian state disposes absolutely over the material elements of the economic process, so it disposes dictatorially over the human element also. The workers are no longer free to sell their labor power where they like and how they please. 
they no longer enjoy freedom of movement on the territory of the USSR, domestic passports. The right to strike has been suppressed, and if the workers expressed even the slightest desire to oppose the methods of Stakhanovism it would expose them to the severest punishments. The Russian unions, strictly under the orders of the governing party, are merely organs charged with the execution in their own province of the political instructions of the government. The instruments destined to defend the working class against the directive organism of the economic system have become instruments in the service of these organisms. 14. The working class thus finds itself subjected to the discretionary power of a bureau technocracy identical with the state apparatus. Let us now try from the standpoint of the qualitative distribution of income to compare the fascist and Soviet intermediary systems with liberal capitalism. Liberal capitalism. V. Labor. P. Including versus active capital. I. Functionless capital. R. Landed proprietors. Fascist economy, supreme form and negation of organized capitalism. V. Labor. Versus, directive superintendents of the bureau technocracy and of active capital. P. Plutocracy of the administrators, without function, and the peaks of the state apparatus. I. Investors. R. Landed proprietors. Soviet economy. V. Labor. Versus, including P. Directive superintendents of the bureau technocracy, state apparatus. I. Insurance funds. R. State apparatus. With regard to the remuneration of executive labor, we have preserved the designation V, though it must not be forgotten that in the fascist and Soviet systems wages no longer obey the automatism of the laws ruling capitalist economy. The most important and striking difference lies in the changing position of the functionless category. Under liberal capitalism, interest is the revenue par excellence of the functionless capitalists. Small investment not yet having spread amongst any important masses of the people, the small investors received only a very small fraction of the total interest, whilst the lion's share went into the hands of the loan capitalists. Under organized capitalism, of which fascist economy represents at one and the same time the highest expression and the negation, seeing that the essential characteristics disappear, interest becomes the revenue par excellence of the investor. 15. Whilst the functionless capitalist seizes the lion's share of surplus value, that is to say, profit. In Russia the category I represents essentially an insurance fund, leaving aside, of course, those credit operations conducted as between one enterprise and another. Interest here no longer remunerates the functionless capitalist, an evolution already foreshadowed in organized capitalism and in fascist economy where interest properly so called, dividends also tend more and more to be reduced to the category of interest pure and simple, becomes the specific form of investment revenue. With regard to the category versus, we observe that in capitalist economy it is joined with P, that in fascist economy, an evolution already foreshadowed in organized capitalism, it is separated, and that in Soviet economy it joins up again with P. However, Whilst versus is an integral part of P in capitalist economy, P is an integral part of versus in Soviet economy. In the former case the reward for directive labor appears as a part of profit, the revenue of exploitation, whilst in the latter case, profit, or labor appropriated without return, appears on the contrary as a part of the return for directive labor. In the fascist economic system P is appropriated by the plutocracy of administrators and by the peaks of the state apparatus. In the USSR the plutocracy has been suppressed, and its revenues are appropriated by the state apparatus. The characteristics of the Soviet economic system are certainly more collectivist than those of the other economic systems we have examined. All revenue appears as a return for labor, even the revenue of the bureau technocratical oligarchy the insurance funds being considered as remunerating labor past or future. It is the first step towards the reunion of property and labor, but by no means of labor as a whole, but of directive labor only. The revenue of the capitalist class arises out of its ownership of the means of production. 
the revenue of the monopolist and finance plutocracy arises out of its domination over the property of others. The revenue of the bureau technocratic oligarchy in the USSR arises out of its administration as a usufructuary of what, on paper, is already the collective property of the community. In the Soviet economic system there is no social class which is independent of the economic process. 16. In so far as we can speak of parasitism in the Soviet economic system, it is a question of an excessive number of bureaucrats, and not of a special category of parasites. Each individual bureaucrat is, if you like, parasitic to the extent of 25%, or even 50%. But the bureaucratic oligarchy as a whole fulfills a useful social function, although, of course, its remuneration is excessive. In the fascist economic system we find parasitism raised to the highest power, embodied by P, which has here become the symbol of the revenue of the functionless. P, the most important part of SV, falls into the pockets of a social class which is completely independent of the economic process. However, during the course of recent years we have seen in this respect, as in many others, that the fascist economic structure is developing farther and farther away from the traditional capitalist structure, and approximating steadily to the Soviet economic structure. In the expression Pluto-technocratic, the accent is gradually shifting from the first term to the second. For the rest, we can predict an identical development in Russia, it is foreshadowed here as there to the extent to which the cadres necessary for a rational administration of the enormous economic apparatus develop, the purely bureaucratic element will give way to the more technocratic element. This technocratic element is gradually acquiring a special technique, such as is also developing, but much more slowly, in those countries which have as yet no experience of controlled economy, and in which liberal economic principles still prevail over directional principles. This technocratic element acquires in practice the technique of directing the economic system as a whole, whilst the experience of the economic technicians of Great Britain, France and Belgium confines itself to a fragmentary and partial control. The economic technicians of the United States may be considered as being midway between the two. The technocratic element enjoys an advantage which can hardly be overestimated but it is one which has proved expensive. Those who one day calculate the enormous wealth which this hurried apprenticeship served under the terribly unfavorable conditions of totalitarianism, has spoiled, wasted and destroyed will experience a shock sufficient to make their hair stand on end. The five-year plans in the USSR, the ersatz regime in Germany, the active war economy in Italy, and the economic nationalism of all these countries, represents a crushing price to be paid for a measure of economic progress, which is being brought about once again on a basis of contradictions, according to the well-known law of Marxist dialectics. If they did not intensify the danger of war, the detached observer of these upheavals would have no cause to deplore them, because it has rarely been the lot of the sociologist to be able to study so many simultaneous experiments. As it is, we cannot but feel sympathy with the poor guinea pigs who are being compelled to submit to this economic and social process of vivisection. The economic laws of liberal capitalism have already changed under organized capitalism, and they are functioning less and less under the fascist economic system, and not at all under the Soviet economic system. 17. These economic systems are controlled according to plan. The Soviet economic system no longer experiences capitalist crises. The fascist economic system has been able to protect itself against the effect of such crises more easily than organized capitalist systems still having liberal capitalist characteristics. 18. This is explained by the fact that all the surplus product, or, if you like, all the surplus value is concentrated in the hands of a Pluto-technocratic or Bureau-technocratic oligarchy. This bureaucracy disposes absolutely of this surplus product, and also absolutely controls its division into funds of consumption, 19, and funds of accumulation. It sees to it that a balance is maintained between the two. There can, of course, be no overproduction there.
crises can arise only as the result of accidents due to insufficient forethought or to a defective execution of plans, and not to any automatism similar to that prevailing in the capitalist economic system. These economic systems no longer obey spontaneous laws. They are not subject to the laws which govern the capitalist system. They are subject to one law only, a law which in any case governs all economic formations no matter what they may be, the law of rentability. If this law is broken, then the economic system will suffer grave disturbances. The tragedy of the five-year plan in the USSR, and the economic convulsions in Germany and Italy are the best illustrations of this. From a purely economic angle these must be regarded as transitional systems closely related to each other, as also, in a structural sense, they are closely related to the organized capitalism of the American, British and French democracies. 20. These economic systems display much clearer socialist characteristics than those in which the liberal element has not been completely overcome. It would, however, be a very grave error either to take the totalitarian state for a realization of the socialist ideal, an error into which many socialists have fallen with regard to Russia, or to believe that the decadence and transformation of capitalist economy must necessarily give rise to political forms similar to those prevailing in the three totalitarian states. As we shall see later, everything depends on the capacity for action and the intellectual maturity of the working class. A fruitful study of these intermediary economic forms can be undertaken only with the assistance of the dialectical method of Marx. The bourgeois revolution sealed the triumph of an economic system which represented an immense step forward in comparison with previous modes of production. Marx stressed its progressive character on more than one occasion, but, armed with a dialectical method, he saw the class representing future progress at the base of that capitalist pyramid which embodied present progress. As a declared enemy of all fatalism, he by no means counseled the proletariat to leave the field to its new masters, and resign itself passively to the famous automatism of history so dear to the mechanical Marxist, and so sacrifice future to present progress. Whilst recognizing the progressive character of capitalism, Marx regarded the working class struggle against capital, and that at the beginning, and not at some hypothetical point of time when capitalism should perhaps have already become reactionary, as the surest instrument of historical progress and the best possible stimulant for all the progressive qualities of capital. We must take up exactly the same attitude towards the fascist and Soviet regimes. Whilst recognizing their progressive elements from the technical and economic angle, we should betray the ideas and methods of Marx if we relied on Pluto-technocrats and Bureau-technocrats for the establishment of socialism, that is to say, if we regarded them as the representatives of future progress. To each his part, the oligarchies are preparing the way for socialism in their fashion, just as capitalism is preparing it by accumulation, by centralization, by the development of the technical and administrative conditions for controlled economy a matter of supreme importance, and by the intensification of its internal contradictions. To each his part, the workers have also theirs to play, but it is not the one assigned to them by their oppressors. And, above all, it is the workers who represent the future. In other forms than those of capitalism, and on a higher scale, these intermediary systems are continuing the mission of capitalism, they are paving the way for the advent of socialist society. The centralization of the means of production, planned economy, the development of control levers, the increase of directive machinery, and the introduction of a more and more developed system of social bookkeeping are also indispensable conditions for a socialist society. From the standpoint of economic organization and control, these systems certainly represent a more advanced stage of the transitional period than the organized capitalist systems of all other countries. Driven as they are by capitalism, however, they fulfill this mission on a basis of contradictions. To the extent to which their technical and administrative structure is gradually being socialized, social antagonisms are accentuated, thus preparing the way for a new upheaval which will place the working class in power and in possession of the economic control levers.
The great thing is to know whether this new upheaval will take place under illegal forms. In those countries where the masses of the people are deprived of all democratic rights we cannot see how they can reconquer them within the framework of existing dictatorial legality and by a peaceful transformation of that legality. Up to now we have discussed these intermediary systems only from a purely economic angle. Must the new economic system which we can see arising everywhere out of the chaos of decadent capitalism necessarily result in the establishment of a totalitarian political superstructure? Those who reply to this question in the affirmative belong mainly to the camp of those mechanical Marxists who think they can find an exactly corresponding economic cause for each political happening. If we are to be faithful to the method of Marx we must distinguish carefully between essential and accessory factors, and never forget that the process of evolution in which we are involved is brought about by the clash of antagonistic forces. The development of our contemporary economic system towards a technocratic structure is a fact difficult to deny, but the productive population as a whole, and not merely the wage working class, whilst being involved in that evolution is not called upon to submit to it passively. It also has a word to say, and its own aspirations to express. However, before going on to deal with this, we must first clear up a particularly salient point in present-day economic development. 3. The Technocratic Menace and Democracy We have already pointed to the striking analogies to be observed in the economic structures of all the principal industrial countries. Whether it is the United States, Great Britain, Germany, France, Italy or Russia, their economic systems develop in the same general direction, and their points in common may be summed up as follows. 1. The increasing organic fusion between the state and the economic system, the development, at first spontaneous and then more and more deliberate, of control levers, the rapidly increasing centralization of all economic activity the development of decentralized control lacking coordination in the direction of centralized and coordinated control. 2. The development of property towards more and more collectivist forms, increase in the numbers of the shareholding public, the decline of the private sector of the economic system before the advance of the public sector, the broadening of social legislation, the development of increasingly collectivist legal forms. 21. 3. However, this process of centralization and collectivization is taking place on a basis of contradictions, the control levers and such property as has already been collectivized are not in the hands of society as a whole, a small minority controls these levers and administers this collectivized property exclusively in its own interests. In the totalitarian countries the people are prevented by violence from expressing their will and in the democratic countries they still passively tolerate this situation. 4. This small minority occupying all the commanding positions is recruited from all social classes. Originally they appeared in the guise of a monopolist and finance plutocracy, the master of organized capitalism and the immediate beneficiary of the fascist movement. However, in the fascist countries it has to give ground under the pressure of the bureau technocracy it has raised to power, and it risks having to abdicate before it altogether. In the democratic countries this plutocracy seeks to utilize the technicians, but there is elsewhere these technicians are beginning to turn against them. In Russia, where the November Revolution overthrew all the old forms, the plutocracy was destroyed and replaced by a bureaucracy which is now beginning to develop more and more into a technocracy. The development towards a more and more controlled economy creates, together with the necessary control organs, the technicians capable of using them. The economic and social characteristics we have just sketched are common to all the countries mentioned. The varying political regimes and the nature of the upheavals which gave rise to some of them have obviously given special characteristics to the economic framework of each country, but these are only of superficial interest when compared with their fundamental resemblances. We see no cause to be surprised at the existence of such differences. The development of capitalism also took on many and varied forms, in one country the development was uninterrupted, in another it proceeded by revolutionary fits and starts, in one country it adapted itself to a relatively democratic regime, 
and in another it passed through periods of terrorist dictatorship. However, despite all this the fact remains that these widely varying surface differences, which have been interpreted in so many different ways, were all expressions of one and the same process of development. In every case the final result was the triumph of 19th century capitalism, whose fundamental traits are characteristic of all the advanced countries of our day. We are faced with the same situation again. The new economic structure which is arising out of the convulsions of decadent capitalism, 22, is taking shape under varying conditions, and is developing in various countries within the framework of capitalism, more vigorous or more mature in some countries, less vigorous or less mature in others. 23. The political convulsions may provoke a premature delivery, in Germany and Italy, or lead to a caesarean operation, in Russia. We must decide once and for all not to let ourselves be hypnotized by this or that particular feature of this or that regime or political event, but to keep our minds fixed on those factors which are generally valid and common to the fundamental economic evolution of them all. If, instead of studying the general economic characteristics of adolescent capitalism, Marx had confined himself to enumerating the differences between the political regimes of Great Britain, France and Germany, he would never have been able to provide us with the indispensable key for the understanding of modern social development. To a certain extent the totalitarian countries show us what is likely to be the future of Western Europe and the United States, though not necessarily the future of their political institutions. We categorically reject the absurd idea that all countries must in any case and under all circumstances pass through a fascist or Bolshevist dictatorship. However, from the standpoint of the economic structure it appears quite certain to us that the intermediary forms to which British, French and American capitalism will ultimately give birth will be a more and more controlled economic system with increasingly collectivist forms. Seeing that not everyone is qualified to control economy, those who do so will inevitably be the specialists, or, if you like, the technicians, and it is here that the technocratic menace looms up, because we must make a clear distinction between the technician pure and simple and the technocrat. For a long time the great majority of the technicians were absolutely hostile to the idea of socialism and to trade union organization and action. They thought themselves better able to defend their own interests by making common cause with the capitalists against the working class. This mental attitude corresponded to the social relations existing throughout the past century. In a period when the shareholding public was still comparatively restricted in numbers, and when the employers owned and directed their businesses themselves, the technicians collaborated closely with their employers and they enjoyed an income which allowed them a reasonable hope of one day rising into the ranks of the possessing classes. Today the situation is different. The great spread of polytechnical institutions has led to the overcrowding of all the technical professions, to widespread unemployment amongst technicians, even before the great economic crisis, and to the great deterioration of their conditions. Industrial concentration and the gradual elimination of smaller undertakings now deprive the great majority of the technicians of all hope of one day rising into the ranks of the higher social class. The fact that joint stock companies have become the dominant form in modern economic life has created new relations between the technicians and their employers. Instead of an employer directing his own business, there is now a plutocratic oligarchy which commands without working and rules without in reality directing the business. Formerly the close collaborators of their employers, today the technicians have become the mere servants of the plutocratic administrators. Today the technicians are becoming more and more conscious of their situation, and they are beginning to rebel against the humiliating way in which they are being treated by people who they are gradually recognizing as mere parasites. The Technocratic Doctrine which rose a few years ago in the United States, was to a great extent the expression of that revolt. In proclaiming that the economic system was in reality directed by technicians, the technocrats expressed their opposition to the dictatorship of the monopolist and finance plutocracy, but at the same time they opposed the aspirations of the working class, which they regarded as nothing but a passive instrument for the execution of their orders. 
we must not seek to hide the fact that such a mentality is extremely dangerous. In face of the universal crisis, an expression of the decadence of capitalism, the working class movement and the technocracy are in agreement in their belief that a radical transformation, both political and economic, is urgently necessary, and that the anarchical economy of our day must be disciplined and controlled. However, whilst the technocrats aspire to substitute their own rule, hence the word technocracy, for that of the monopolist and finance plutocracy, socialism and trade unionism seek to place the general interests of the community as a whole above all particular interests, including that of the technicians. In short, they believe that it is not a question of replacing one set of privileges by another, but of abolishing privileges altogether. It was not by accident that the doctrine of technocracy arose in the United States, a new and young country, where the revolt against privilege takes on utopian forms just as it did a century ago in this old Europe of ours. A few years back we described technocracy as the utopian socialism of the 20th century. 24, it might also be described as Saint Simonism on a Yankee scale, which would amount to much the same thing. We know very well that a growing section of the technicians, particularly in France, is abandoning this technocratic mentality, and that it is giving disinterested devotion to the organizations of the working class, to which in any case the technicians belong both socially and economically. However, we also know that the technicians perform a directing function in the economic process, and that under certain circumstances they might develop into a new privileged caste as we can see more and more clearly in Russia today. This danger will even grow as the state penetrates further and further into the economic system, and we have already seen that a state which increasingly assumes economic functions may easily develop into a forcing house for a new class of exploiters. The technicians are members of the wage-earning class, but those amongst them who occupy directive positions come under the particular category of variable capital which Marx has called wages of superintendence, and which we have designated with versus during the course of capitalist development and parallel with the impersonalization of capital, versus has separated itself from P, and now approximates to V. However, this development towards a generalized wage earning class has not effaced the difference between V and Versus. This new relation between V and Versus is still concealed both under organized capitalism and in the fascist economic system. It is cloaked by the fact that by far the greater part of P is seized by the plutocracy, and that the domination of V and Versus by P is much greater than the domination of V by Versus. This cloak falls altogether in the Soviet economic system in which the revenue of the bureaucratic oligarchy presents itself in the form of Versus and includes also P. Thus we must ask ourselves seriously whether the transitional economic system which is developing is not characterized, at least to a certain extent, by the preponderance, not to say the predominance, of the technicians, the term technicians embracing not only engineers, but all those who occupy directive positions. In view of the increasing penetration of the state into the economic system, a penetration which is particularly deep in the totalitarian countries, a growing number of administrative functions are becoming economic functions. The bureaucrats themselves are beginning to appear as the technicians of administration. In this way the question arises of whether the relation between V and Versus conceals a new class antagonism destined to develop during the period of transition, whether this presents itself in the form of an economic autocracy, Germany, Italy and Russia, or in the form of a mixed economy as provided for in the labor plan of the French CGT. Class antagonism is another way of saying the exploitation of man by man. This exploitation of man by man has taken on many different forms throughout the ages, its three principal forms being slavery, serfdom and wage slavery. The first two are based on oppression legally sanctioned. The last category is based on the liberty of the worker. The exploitation of the wage worker being accomplished solely by economic laws, and not by any written law whatever. However, one condition is necessary to bring about this state of affairs, the masses of the people must be prevented from obtaining possession of the instruments or production. The mechanism of capitalism undertakes to do this on its own, 
and only where it proves too weak to do so does written law intervene to make good the deficiency. 25. Compared with slavery and serfdom, modern capitalism represents a great step forward. Under capitalism exploitation is no longer founded on a legal basis, but exists purely as the result of economic factors. The totalitarian economic systems seem to be a relapse into forced labor, into pre-capitalist forms of exploitation. However, on examining the relation between V and Versus we observe that this constraint is merely superimposed on an already existing inequality not caused by it. The fact that the technocracy appropriates a disproportionate share of the national revenue, that the magnitude of Versus is disproportionate as compared with V, a fact particularly obvious in Russia, where there is no plutocracy, is due to economic causes. In short, this constraint does nothing but reinforce an already existing inequality. Nevertheless, we must not lose sight of the fact that this new antagonism, between V and Versus, reflects a difference of degree and not of kind. The labor of superintendence and direction is better paid because it is more highly qualified labor and it will remain so even without constraint and without dictatorship as long as the requisite qualifications are a. All attempts at excessive leveling in this respect would endanger the smooth working of the economic system so long as there is not a sufficient number of competent technicians available, that is to say, as long as the requisite qualifications have not been obtained by a growing number of people, thereby losing their rarity. Only the higher education of the masses can remedy a state of affairs in which versus is greater than the remuneration of unqualified labor. The quantitative discrepancy between V and versus will disappear only when a leveling is brought about by raising the general cultural standards of the people. Here we have the famous apprenticeship fees of which Lenin spoke, and which the workers are obliged to pay to their specialists as long as the latter succeed in maintaining their cultural monopoly. It is a different matter altogether with category P, which belongs by right to society as a whole once the plutocracy has been expelled from its positions. After the liquidation of the plutocracy, the receivers of versus, now established at the commanding points of circulation abandoned by the plutocracy, will quite naturally tend to seize P, or as much of it as they can. This is the danger which we regard as one of the fundamental characteristics of our epoch and of the intermediate economic forms. The best antidote to this danger appears to us to be democracy. Under the leaden cloak of dictatorship, the bureau technocracy is free to dispose of P just as it likes. Only the existence of democracy can prevent this. Democracy certainly cannot do away with the necessity of paying apprenticeship fees but it can confine these fees to versus, and prevent their becoming larger at the expense of any considerable part of what was SV. Democracy, in other words, public control, is the condition sine qua non for any collectivist economic system. Without democracy, and unless the community as a whole enjoys an absolute right of control and decision, collective property is an empty phrase. It is not sufficient that a dictatorial clique should proclaim that property is collective. Property cannot be collective until the community as a whole is free to dispose of it as it wishes. The untrammeled exercise of these public liberties is an indispensable condition for the smooth functioning of an economic system, of which an important, and even vital, sector is withdrawn from the influence of the automatic laws of the liberal economic system. The rentability of this sector, in which competition no longer operates, cannot be assured except by democratic control exercised by the community as a whole. In an economic system more and more penetrated by the state, democracy becomes an economic factor of the greatest importance, whereas in the epoch of economic liberalism the democratic or dictatorial character of a political regime was of secondary importance for economic life. On the other hand, a democratic organization of economic life becomes a more and more indispensable condition for political democracy today. Political democracy is threatened and weakened by economic oligarchies whether they originate in the category P or the category versus political democracy and economic democracy are becoming more and more interdependent. One cannot exist without the other. In any case, democracy is nothing but a mold, a written law. 
The existence of this mold, as necessary as it is, is far from being sufficient in itself. This democratic mold offers immense possibilities, but these possibilities can become realities only if the following conditions are fulfilled. 1. The democratic will of the majority of the people, without this democratic will the first dictator who comes along can overthrow the democratic regime without striking a blow. 2. The competence of the masses of the people, it is useless to have wonderful democratic machinery if the masses of the people do not know how to use it. 26. In other words, if democracy is to have any real vitality it must be based on the competence and maturity of the masses of the people. The degree of emancipation of labor possible of attainment in a given historical epoch is directly dependent on the degree of maturity and competence of the workers, and on their ability to control the collectivist forms which are developing more or less automatically before their eyes. Alas, democracy appears greatly discredited in our day. If it were only a question of the thunderous speeches of dictators periodically proclaiming the bankruptcy of democracy we could easily console ourselves. But even in the ranks of socialists there are anti-democratic tendencies whose spokesmen assure us that democracy has had its day. We humbly proclaim ourselves old-fashioned enough to reject this point of view completely. The enemies of democracy make the undoubted weaknesses of parliamentarism a pretext for recommending systems either frankly dictatorial or camouflaged with the name direct democracy. We agree entirely that the referendum is an excellent democratic instrument, and we should like to see it introduced in France to settle important questions. However, when, under the pretext of correcting and improving democracy, people try to take us back to antediluvian democratic forms, 27, we are compelled to protest vigorously. Where we find that democracy is imperfect. The cause is generally a lack of sufficient parliamentarism rather than the contrary. Like all human institutions, parliamentarism is obviously not perfect, but like other human institutions, it is also open to amendment and improvement. However, in order to improve it we must first obtain as clear an idea as possible of its real shortcomings. Above all, we must take care not to blame it for faults for which it is not responsible providing it is accompanied by all those liberties which are the essence of democracy, Parliament may be called the mirror of public opinion. If a man looks at himself in a mirror and finds the reflected image rather depressing, that may be the fault of the mirror, on the other hand it may be that the features of the beholder are far from perfect. What we are now calling the crisis of parliamentarism is due to a little of both. Parliament reflects the image of society as it is, with all its divisions and hostilities. The fact that today many parliaments exhaust themselves in sterile palaver, and find their capacity for action greatly reduced, is often because the opposing political forces are more or less equal in strength, and mutually paralyze each other in the representative assemblies. In this case it is not the mirror we must blame but the ugliness of capitalist society in its decadence, and there is no point whatever in breaking the mirror. The parliamentary system certainly has its defects. In other words, the mirror is not at all that it should be. 28. In this connection the essential defect of parliamentarism today arises from the fact that the state is taking over an increasing number of economic tasks. Parliament, which is the backbone of the modern democratic state, is being called upon more and more frequently to deal with economic questions of vital importance. Unfortunately members of parliament are almost always elected on pure and simple political programs, only socialist parties represent an exception to this rule, and have done for the past 50 years, and they are plainly incompetent to discuss such matters fruitfully. The tendency to organic fusion of the state and the economic system has given rise in certain quarters to the idea of reforming parliamentarism on the basis of two assemblies the one political and the other economic. This idea, in itself quite an excellent one, will nevertheless prove impossible of useful realization, unless such an economic assembly is the expression of economic democracy. If, on the other hand, its realization were left in the hands of a privileged clique, democracy would have nothing whatever to gain from it. However, 
In our opinion the time has come to consider seriously a reform of parliamentarism. This reform should be carried out by extending public liberties, developing economic democracy, and adapting the parliamentary regime to those new and ever more pressing economic necessities which are arising in our day. 29. At the same time we should like to point out to the socialist detractors of parliamentarism. 1. Up to the present no democratic form has been found which provides the masses of the people with a better expression of their will. 2. The best way to repair the defects of the parliamentary system, and to save it from the paralysis which results from a general equilibrium of opposing forces, would be to send more socialists to parliament. As far as democracy itself is concerned, together with Marx and Engels we consider it the condition sine qua non of all fruitful socialist activity, because without it collective property would be inconceivable. We believe, with Karl Kautsky, that to doubt democracy is in reality to doubt the proletariat itself, and that, in general, the existence of a dictatorial and authoritarian government at a given moment proves, for this moment at least, the inability of the proletariat to emancipate itself, because no proletariat capable of doing so would tolerate for one moment any government determining what it should read, what it should hear, and what it should do. 30. 4. The First Stage of the Socialist Revolution The economic and social development which has taken place during the past 20 or 30 years permits us to see things more clearly today. The situation has sufficiently crystallized to permit us to develop quite considerably the ideas of Marx on the proletarian revolution, its forms and its order. We must excuse ourselves for using a banal image, but, at least, it has the great advantage of illustrating exactly what we mean, the end of capitalist development, which appeared to Marx and Engels like a far away point on the horizon, seems to us, their followers to be a vast landscape in which we live and move and have our being. The transformation of the economic system and of society as a whole towards socialism has begun. Many observers, both socialists and anti-socialists, refuse to accept the evidence before their eyes, because, first of all, they have never understood the Marxist theory of capitalist development, secondly, because the transformation has taken on hideous forms in Russia, Italy and Germany and inspires them with horror, and, finally, because they are prisoners of the utopian and primitive ideas of social revolution held by the adolescent working class movement a century ago, and still expect that the social revolution will come about in the form of a violent explosion and in a very short space of time. However, viewed historically, such an explosion may extend over several generations. Since the World War we have experienced only the first convulsions of this transformation. The great problem which faces the organizations of the working class in our epoch is precisely to act in such a way that the necessary and inevitable evolution may come about with a minimum of destruction, and to open the safety valves in good time so as to reduce social tension to such a degree that revolutionary evolution the term is Emile van der Velde's, can take the place of a succession of violent explosions. Will socialism and trade unionism succeed in performing this task? We are convinced that it is possible, and we shall presently show why. In looking at the world in which we live we are staggered at the almost mathematical precision with which the essential predictions of Karl Marx are being realized. Traditional capitalism is dying. Its dying agonies are setting greater and greater masses of the people in movement, and our epoch is marked by anti-capitalist movements and uprisings. Even most of the fascist movements call themselves socialist, and this is not merely because hypocrisy is the homage paid by vice to virtue, but because, and above all, the utopian socialism which characterizes many fascist programs is the natural expression of unenlightened masses in revolt. We shall not stress any further here that the economic development of our day is tending towards more and more collectivist forms, because we have already dealt with this point sufficiently in the earlier parts of this chapter. As Marx and Engels foresaw, the privileged classes are stopping at nothing to stave off the day of their defeat. They recoil from no violence however brutal, and recently we have seen in the affair of the Cagoulids, 
that even poison appears to them as an acceptable weapon in their struggle. In spite of the hatred they profess for Marxism, 31, the governments which have been carried to power by the movement of unenlightened masses establish forms and institutions which might be called socialist if the masses of the people enjoy liberty, an indispensable condition of socialism as we conceive it. In democratic countries, where there has been no violent revolution, we can observe the same development towards a more and more collectivist economic structure, socialism in power, whether alone or in collaboration with other parties, strives to control the rhythm of that development and prevent its plunging the world into chaos. 32. We are now right in the middle of the most tremendous revolution the world has ever known, and only those who understand the word revolution in the way the police do. 33 need wonder that the upheaval which haunts their dreams has taken such a long time in coming. The socialism of our day must divest its conception of the social revolution of the last vestiges of utopian socialist ideas, because utopian socialism, although colored with certain pseudo-Marxist notions, imagines that the capitalist world is advancing towards a day X and an hour Y on which the proletariat will arise in its might deal its enemies one crushing blow, establish its dictatorship and build up an ideal socialist society in a very short space of time. Scientific socialism, on the other hand, has steadfastly refused to give any detailed description a priori of socialist society. This apocalyptic scheme proceeds from a distorted generalization of the experiences of the 1798 and 1848 revolutions. And into the bargain. These events have been transferred, once again in a distorted fashion, from the political to the economic field. Economically this utopian idea of the proletarian revolution corresponds to a stage of capitalism not yet ripe for socialization, and one at which socialists necessarily harbored fantastic ideas about the form in which socialization would come about. We may apply what Marx and Engels said in the Manifesto of the Communist Party about utopian socialism in general to this primitive conception of socialization, expressed today in the well-known formula the expropriation of the expropriators. Such fantastic pictures of future society, painted at a time when the proletariat is still in a very undeveloped state and has but a fantastic conception of its own position correspond with the first instinctive yearnings of that class for a general reconstruction of society. 34. It was because of this insufficient maturity that about half a century ago militant socialists felt a little uneasy when explaining to their new recruits the rudiments of the materialist conception of history. No social order ever disappears before all the productive forces for which there is room in it, have been developed and new higher relations of production never appear before the material conditions of their existence have been matured in the womb of the old society. 35. However, if the political and legal superstructure of society is, in the last analysis, the expression of its economic basis, that is to say, of its productive relations, any revolution can consist only in the adaptation of the political and legal system to economic changes which have already taken place. This was, of course, the case in all bourgeois revolutions, which did no more than fashion the political state in the image of capitalist economy, slowly come to maturity within the framework of the old society. The conditions for the socialist revolution, on the other hand, seemed in those far-off days to be totally different. Whilst the bourgeoisie had been able to develop its own property and productive relations within the framework of the old regime until, when they became mature, they burst the old shell asunder, there seemed no way in which the proletariat could develop collective property to any extent within the framework of capitalist society. Directly contrary to the bourgeois revolution, it seemed that the socialist revolution would have to begin its task by changing the superstructure first rather than the base and that it would apparently be able to tackle the base only afterwards. Historical materialism, which insisted that a change in the base must proceed and bring in its train the change in the superstructure, seemed inadequate, and hence the secret uneasiness of the militant socialists of that time. In our own day there is no cause for any such uneasiness. Collectivist economic forms are already in existence and, as we have seen, 
they are rapidly increasing in number. In the course of its development capitalism has taken the general lines foreseen by Marx. Within its own framework it has produced the material conditions for the existence of these new productive relations. According to Sombart, 36, in 1919 joint stock companies in the United States represented 31.6% of all undertakings. This 31.6% employed 86.6% of the total number of wage earners, and their share in the total value of production as a whole amounted to 87.7%. The working capitalist, owning and directing his own enterprise, has disappeared from all the vital branches of the modern economic system. He has been driven back into the more barren fields of production, where the struggle for life is becoming increasingly bitter. Is this really the capitalist Marx had in mind in his celebrated chapter on the historical tendency of capitalist accumulation when he speaks of the expropriation of the expropriators? 37, we may be permitted to doubt it if we refer to Volume 3, Chapter 27 from which we have already quoted considerable extracts. The Joint Stock Company, considered by Marx as a necessary transitional point, is no longer an isolated and sporadic phenomenon today, and, in fact, it is the predominant element in a large sector of the modern economic system. The material conditions for the existence of new productive relations already exist. Contrary to what militant socialists thought rather uneasily about fifty years ago, historical materialism is seen to emerge unscathed from the ordeal of the intervening period. The socialist revolution will not have to create a socialist economic system out of nothing. Like the example of the bourgeois revolution, the rise of the proletariat to power will be the culmination of a state of things already existing in economic life, the adaptation of the political superstructure to an economic basis already socialized. 38 within the framework of capitalism. Even today many socialists imagine that the only socialization worthy of the name and the only one to which the working class can set its hands without dirtying them is expropriation without compensation. We have already seen at the opening of this book that neither Marx nor Engels ever expressed such an opinion, and the development of capitalism since their death has done nothing to lend any weight to it. On the contrary, it has rendered it completely absurd. To realize this clearly we have but a glance at things as they really are. Let us suppose that socialism is in power alone and strong enough to undertake fundamental measures. The most important and centralized branches of the economic system, the credit apparatus and the key industries, precisely those which lend themselves most readily to socialization, are almost completely controlled by joint stock companies and the scattering of smaller enterprises still individually controlled hardly count. Who is to be expropriated without compensation? The masses of shareholders? But the great majority of these shareholders are not capitalists. The money they have invested in shares represents no more than an insurance premium for them, and they are threatened with expropriation not by socialism, but by the finance plutocracy. We are here face to face with property already socialized although, as Marx said, in a negative fashion. In a negative fashion, that is to say, a handful of administrators has the possibility of disposing of social capital not its own, in short, to dispose just as it likes of other people's property. There is no point whatever in expropriating collective proprietors, the shareholders. The point is to dispossess the plutocracy of its power to dispose of already collectivized property. As far as the joint stock companies are concerned, it is impossible to socialize their property for the simple reason that it already is socialized. All that remains to be done there is to socialize power, or, to use another word, authority. The expulsion of the monopolist and finance plutocracy from its dominant positions will be no more than the social recognition of an already existing state of affairs, that is, the existence of property already collectivized. As Marx and Engels predicted, the socialist transformation, like the bourgeois revolution, will come about as the adaptation of a superstructure to an already changed base. We cannot stress too vigorously that the last vestiges of utopian socialist ideas still current in certain socialist circles must be categorically rejected. 
in those branches of the economic system in which socialization is already possible there are no capitalist employers to expropriate, and those branches in which they still exist are still far from being ripe for socialization. The economic task of socialism and trade unionism in this first stage of the proletarian revolution is to adapt the law to already collectivized economic forms, and to remove them from the power of the spoliatory and parasitic oligarchy which still controls them. The task is not to expropriate the shareholders but to put them in a position to dispose freely and consciously of their collective property. 39. As far as the important branches of economic life are concerned, the credit system and the key industries, the task is to replace the omnipotent control of the plutocratic oligarchy by organs of public control. And finally, our task is to establish the principle of economic control over the principle of competition, which is now becoming more and more chaotic, and even paralyzing, as the result of the gradual extinction of the automatic regulating mechanism of former times. We do not overlook the fact that the success of this task depends on an extension of collectivization, by the extension of the public sector of the economic system. 40. However, just as it is impossible to socialize everything from one day to the next, it is also impossible to pass with one step from the chaotic economic system of today to an integral economic system perfectly controlled, these two things complement each other, they are nothing but two aspects of one and the same development. The various labor plans drawn up in France, Belgium, Switzerland, Holland and Czechoslovakia have laid down precisely how much was both possible and necessary in the given period. We could, of course, make reservations with regard to the terminology employed, and in particular with regard to the term structural reform. However, that is not the question. Whatever may be the terms employed, the fact is that working class organizations are in agreement concerning the essential objects they believe attainable in the course of the period now opening up. The French CGT speaks constantly of the necessity for structural reforms, whilst in the French Socialist Party the term is seldom heard. However, the principal points of the CGT plan and the aims formulated by the Socialist Party Congresses of Toulouse, 1934, and Mulhouse, 1935, and confirmed by the Marseille Socialist Congress in 1937 are more or less identical. In our opinion things are more important than words. We are quite prepared to admit that we feel very little desire to engage in arguments about the difference between that socialization possible within the framework of capitalism, and that which goes beyond it. Here we are once again faced with survivals of utopian socialism whose fantastic schemes were destined to be brought about at one blow, and implied the idea of a clear and precise dividing line between the capitalist system and socialism. A dividing line certainly does exist, but it cannot be represented by a day X and an hour Y. On the contrary, it may extend over several generations. 41. Throughout the whole world today the framework of capitalism is crumbling. New forms are arising and developing within it, undermining it, weakening it and emptying it of its substance. It would be a bold man, however, who, watch in hand, would undertake to proclaim the precise moment at which the past gives place to the future. What separates the past from the future is not a second or an hour, but that whole period we call the present. Certainly, whilst capitalism was still powerful, unshaken and unshakable, it had to be admitted that any measures of socialization carried out within its still intact framework were of very relative value only. Today, however, with the framework of capitalism cracking at every joint, the criterion is elsewhere, it lies in democracy. The forms of socialization which have been carried out in Russia and Italy, and the collective forms which are developing in a hothouse atmosphere in Germany would certainly be of value from the socialist standpoint if the community as a whole were permitted to decide freely on the use to which these instruments of economic control should be put. All economic history presents itself to the careful observer as a succession of mixed economic forms, that is to say, of different systems overlapping and interpenetrating. To take only the evolution of the past two or three centuries, we see that during the long period which preceded the bourgeois revolution, industrial capitalism, 
at first embryonic only, developed within the framework of the old regime before overcoming it. Under modern capitalism, which has become the dominant economic form, we can still observe numerous pre-capitalist and even feudal economic survivals, and for a long while during the 19th century capitalism, already triumphant, accommodated even slavery within its orbit. Side by side with these survivals we can observe the development, still within the framework of capitalism, of more and more numerous and more and more important embryonic socialist forms. Thus we observe the interpenetration and coexistence of different economic forms, although, as a general rule, one specific form is the dominant system and stamps its seal on all the others coexisting with it, whether vestiges of the past or embryos of the future. We therefore find it difficult to understand the attacks launched against Charles Spinas by socialists believing themselves to have a monopoly of the revolutionary spirit. On 12 March 1937, Spinas, then Minister of National Economy, declared in the French Chamber of Deputies, Do you imagine, gentlemen, that I am going to smash up the capitalist system before I am in a position to replace it? Nothing of the sort. I know that the capitalist system is quite capable of lasting a long time yet. We agree entirely with Spinas that it would be senseless to smash the capitalist system without being in a position to replace it. We know also that the task of replacing it will be a long and arduous one. And as far as concerns his other statement about the length of time capitalism is still capable of lasting, only those need be perturbed who believe in the possibility of establishing socialism, as integral as indefinite, from one day to the next. However, if we believe that the advance towards socialism implies socialization by stages, then the idea of leaving capitalist property intact in those sectors of the economic system not yet ripe for socialization, is a logical development. In those sectors capitalism certainly still has a long time to go. The great thing in these conditions is to know whether it can still be defined as capitalism in the traditional sense of the term and to what extent the economic system in which we are living today still merits the term capitalist. In a speech delivered at St. Leonard's in May 1937 Leon Bloom quoted some interesting passages written by Press Main just after the World War. The capitalist system has very deep roots, and we shall not be able to pull them up with one tug, and I say this is a good thing. I fear a too rapid collapse of the bourgeoisie as I have often said to my comrades. Yes, of course, I can see that everything is in a state of decomposition. But when I, who have so often proclaimed that it is the task of the working class to take over the succession from the bourgeoisie, look around, I can't help being afraid that the succession may come too soon, before the working class is ready to accept it. Leon Bloom commented as follows, the italics are ours. In fact, my dear comrades, the revolution you have in mind has already begun, though it will not be accomplished within the space of a few weeks, and if you ask my opinion, it will take years and years. You surely don't imagine that the new social order will take the place of the old as if by magic, or that a new regime will suddenly rise in place of the old. The truth is that parallel with the decomposition of bourgeois and capitalist society we can see all around us, the strength of the working class is gradually taking shape. Capitalism will not suddenly disappear, and certainly not in the countries of Western Europe. When you realize that he, Press Main, spoke like that 17 years ago, you will imagine how glad he would be if he could share our present experience. We have no hesitation in endorsing these sentiments of Leon Bloom. Yes, the revolution has already begun. Nothing is more ridiculous or more anti-Marxist than to think it could be made. Revolutions make themselves, they have no need of any schoolmaster to assist them. All that is necessary is that the organizations of the working class should adopt tactics calculated to promote this gigantic economic and social transformation and to prevent the heritage they must take up from foundering and being destroyed in the chaos of civil and national wars. v. The Conditions of Revolutionary Evolution The working class movement of our day must thoroughly grasp the idea that the socialist revolution is fundamentally different from the bourgeois revolution, 
and that the apocalyptic upheaval of 1789 is no longer valid for the political forms of the transformation taking place in our own day. Was it in fact always and everywhere valid even for the bourgeois revolution? Let us consider the infinite variety of forms under which the bourgeoisie rose to political power in the various countries. In the preface to his Histoire de la Révolution Française Mignet writes, Once a reform has become necessary, and once the moment for its accomplishment has arrived, nothing can prevent it and everything assists it. How happy human beings would be if they could only get on with each other, if those who had too much would give their superfluity away, and if the others were contented with what little they have. Revolutions could then take place amiably and in an atmosphere of concord, and the historian would have neither excesses nor unhappiness to record, but only that humanity had become wiser, freer and more fortunate. Up to the present, however, Human annals offer no example of such wisdom in sacrifice, those who ought to make the sacrifice refuse to do so, and the others who demand the sacrifice impose it by force, so that good has the effect of evil, through the means and with the violence of usurpation. Up to the present the reign of force has been practically unbroken. Today, as in former days, we can observe the determination of the privileged classes to have recourse to violence. However, since Mignet made his bitter observations, we have also seen that in a good half of Europe the rise of the bourgeoisie to power took place as a result of a succession of compromises on the basis of the relations of force existing at each given moment, and was concluded without latent force degenerating into active violence. What was possible for a bourgeois revolution should be still more possible for a socialist revolution. Although we are well aware that this statement will bring us in a variety of offensive remarks from certain quarters, we are even prepared to stress it. Happily we find ourselves in the company of two men, whose title to the description Marxist is indisputable. The one is Marx and the other is Engels. We have already quoted from the well-known speech delivered by Marx in Amsterdam in 1872. In case there are any socialists who imagine that the ideas expressed in this speech were a temporary deviation let us draw their attention to the following observations made by Marx to Hindman in 1881. In a letter to Hindman written on the 8th of December 1880 Marx declares. If you say that you do not share the views of my party for England I can only reply that that party considers an English revolution not necessary, but, according to historic precedents, possible. If the unavoidable evolution turns into the revolution, it would not only be the fault of the ruling classes, but also of the working class. Every pacific concession of the former has been wrung from them by pressure from without. Their action kept pace with that pressure and if the latter has more and more weakened, it is only because the English working class know not how to wield their power and use their liberties, both of which they possess legally. In Germany the working class were fully aware from the beginning of their movement that you cannot get rid of a military despotism but by a revolution. 42. And in a conversation recorded by Hindman in his book Marx declared, England is the one country in which a peaceful revolution is possible, but, he added after a pause, history does not tell us so. 43. In his preface to the first English translation of Capital in 1886, referring to Marx's ideas concerning the entirely legal and pacific means with which it would be possible to accomplish the socialist revolution, Engels wrote. He certainly never forgot to add that he hardly expected the English ruling classes to submit without a pro-slavery rebellion to this peaceful and legal revolution. And in 1891 Engels developed this idea. Dot. For the moment it is not we who are being killed by legality. Legality is working so well in our favor that we should be mad to abandon it as long as it lasts. It remains to be seen whether it will not be the bourgeoisie and its governments which will abandon it first in order to crush us with violence. That is just what we expect. Take the first shot, gentlemen of the bourgeoisie. Never doubt it, they will be the first to fire. One fine day the German bourgeois and their government will grow tired of waiting with folded arms and watching the rapidly increasing strength of socialism, and will have recourse to illegality and violence.
The happenings of the past two decades have amply demonstrated how right Marx and Engels were in expecting that the privileged classes would shoot first. It would be madness on the part of the socialist and trade union movement of our day to neglect this danger, but we may rest assured their whole attitude proves that they are perfectly well aware of the danger. In democratic countries the situation today is such that we need no longer say with Engels, gentlemen of the bourgeoisie, take the first shot. If the socialist and trade union movements were strong enough either to participate in the government or to exercise a real influence upon it, they could disarm the shock troops of the reaction without giving them time to fire a shot. In our opinion that is the ideal solution. It is this solution which should, and which in fact does, guide the actions of working class organizations. However, the primary condition for such a line of conduct is a constant growth in strength of these organizations. We can do no better than repeat a phrase of Emile van der Velde which magnificently sums up the problem and its solution, socialist democracy has no chance of winning peacefully until it is so strong that its enemies are afraid to risk declaring war on it. 44. At the present time the strength of socialist democracy, of which Emile van der Velde speaks, does not reside alone in the compact masses of the working class properly so called, all classes of existing society, with the exception of a very small minority which consciously wills civil war, and even national wars, desire that social progress should take place in an atmosphere of social peace. The humanization of social struggles is the order of the day in democratic countries. The essential task of the socialist movement is to arrive at the necessary compromises in accordance with the estimated strength of the opposing social forces, instead of resigning itself to their acceptance after a ruinous struggle, in which the advantage of even a complete victory would be swallowed up by its excessive cost. 45. The conclusion of the necessary compromises must obviously be brought about by the force of all the democratic elements in the country. The monopolist and finance plutocracy will not retire, we are quite sure, except under restraint, and it will not do so unless it is deprived of all possibility of making use of its cagoulades. However, it will also be necessary for the working class organizations, both trade union and political, to put the brake on, the expression comes from Engels, the excessive ardor of their new recruits, 46, and to make them understand what, at a given moment, are the limits of the objectives which it is possible to obtain. 47. This seems to us to be all the more necessary because it is the price of that alliance which is today more indispensable than ever between the working class and the middle classes. During the past fifty years what are called the middle classes have changed their social substance. The old middle classes, artisans, small farmers, small employers and small businessmen have lost their independence and have become subject to the monopolist and finance oligarchy to such an extent that their income approximates more and more to simple wages of superintendents. 48. The new middle classes, clerical employees, administrative workers, technicians, intellectuals, etc., are made up for the most part of wage workers, and very many of them are already beginning to realize what is their objective position in society. The problem of the socialist attitude towards the middle classes is quite different today to what it was in the time of Bernstein. In Bernstein's day it was not possible for the proletariat to consider a lasting alliance with the middle classes without abandoning its socialist aim. In our day, these middle classes, seized in the inexorable toils of the present development towards the creation of a generalized wage working class are beginning to understand and to approve the immediate objectives of the working class against the power of the masters of the key industries and the credit system. Under such conditions the formula of the dictatorship of the proletariat, to which, in any case, Marx attached only a secondary importance, loses its reason for existence entirely. 49. Some socialists are obviously uneasily asking themselves whether socialism in showing so much solicitude for the middle classes is not committing the crime of les orthodoxy. They are asking themselves whether the measures designed to protect the middle classes against ruin are not contrary to the socialist program. Socialism, they feel, ought, on the contrary, 
to do everything possible to hasten the disappearance of the middle classes from the economic and social scene. This sort of argument shows clearly that those who use it have not as yet grasped socialist doctrine, and that all they know about it has been gathered from the columns of the capitalist press. It is in fact this press which for fifty years now has accused socialism of wanting the ruin of the middle classes, and the proletarianization of everybody in order to accelerate the advent of socialist society. The reality, however, is quite different. Socialism has always insisted that it is capitalism which ruined the small enterprises. The artisans and small masters are unable to stand up to the competition of the bigger enterprises, mechanized and provided with modern equipment, powerful and rationalized. Socialist doctrine has always taught that capitalist development leads to the breakup and the proletarianization of the middle classes, and all the facts confirm its teachings. But all this does not at all mean that once in power the Socialist Party would become the instrument of this purely capitalist disaster, place itself at the service of this process, and do its best to ruin the middle classes. In former days Socialism was still very weak and very far away from political power. In those days it had to confine itself to pointing out the inexorable tendency of capitalism to accomplish the ruin of the smaller enterprises and hurl their proprietors into the ranks of the proletariat. Having no influence on the economic policy of the ruling classes socialism was able to do practically nothing against the crushing action of the capitalist steamroller. Today, on the other hand, socialism has become a power with a word to say in the social and economic life of the nation. It has become so strong that it need no longer confine itself to registering certain tendencies of capitalist development it can influence capitalist laws, and, if need be, counteract them. But it may still be objected that in taking up the defense of the middle classes against the threat of large-scale capitalism socialism is acting in a reactionary fashion. It may still be objected that in its efforts to ameliorate the very difficult situation of the smaller enterprises socialism risks artificially preserving backward economic forms, thus barring the way to economic progress. Does progress demand that everything which is unable to hold its ground in the terrible struggle for existence should be destroyed? If efforts are made to prevent the destruction of the smaller enterprises, Will there not be a risk of slowing down the process of development leading to the centralization of capital, which, at the same time, renders the economic system ripe for socialization? All these apprehensions would be justified if the ruin of the smaller enterprises and the proletarianization of their proprietors were the only way to achieve socialism. Happily this is not the case. It is quite certain that the various branches of the economic system become ripe for socialization only to the extent to which the bigger enterprises eliminate the smaller ones, and the branch as a whole becomes concentrated in the hands of a steadily declining number of more and more powerful enterprises. However, as soon as the socialist working class possesses sufficient political influence it can intervene in this process of elimination in order to humanize it. It is necessary in the interests of progress that the smaller enterprises shall give place to the larger, but it is by no means indispensable that this process should be accomplished in the shape of a natural catastrophe, or that the proprietors of these enterprises should be declassed, proletarianized, pauperized and ground out of existence by the pitiless mechanism of capital. Today the proletarianization of these elements is less desirable than ever because the wage-earning class has for a long while suffered from widespread and chronic unemployment. An accelerated proletarianization of the middle classes would still further increase the pressure exercised by the unemployed on the conditions of labor and existence of the employed workers. Thus the working class itself has an interest in preventing any widespread proletarianization of the middle classes. Certainly, the smaller enterprises cannot exist forever against the competition of the larger ones, but appropriate social legislation and the development of the insurance system could save the middle classes from that catastrophic fall with which they are menaced by the workings of capital, ameliorate the time of waiting, and render the transition less painful. And in addition it must not be forgotten that this accelerated proletarianization of the middle classes drives them to despair and thereby favors the growth of fascism.
This has been demonstrated already in so many countries that we surely need not stress it here. No one can fail to recognize today that the newly proletarianized elements do not flock immediately to the cause of socialism. The experience of history has shown us clearly that socialism has never been able to assimilate such newly proletarianized elements except after a considerable period of maturing. And perhaps the German catastrophe of 1933 would not have happened if the proletarianization of the middle classes had been less rapid, and if social democracy had had time to win them over to the socialist cause. Today the interests of the proletariat and of the middle classes coincide in very large measure. The points on which their interests are opposed are gradually dwindling in face of those many points on which their solidarity of interests is incontestable. This once again confirms the fact that we are living in a revolutionary period in which our task is to transform society and not to tinker with it. Writing in his book Socialism und Krieg Karl Kautsky declares, The greater the tasks to be accomplished, the less likely are they to be accomplished in the existing state of class and party forces by the tactic of all or nothing, by the rejection of all cooperation with other classes and parties. It may be possible to obtain partial reforms of a modest nature by the exclusive action of the proletariat, but certainly not any fundamental transformation of the state. Thus it is precisely this purely class policy which in practice has been reformist. All real revolutions are carried out with the cooperation of several classes against a common enemy at the head of the state. 50. In the given circumstances our task is to work for a social revolution, and not for this or that secondary reform. It is curious to observe that it is just the adepts at fiery speeches and the uncompromising upholders of a pure class policy who fail to realize the necessities of the moment, and go on pursuing the most reformist policy it is possible to conceive of. And at this point the most crucial problem of our epoch arises, that of the attitude to be adopted by the working class. In the last resort it will be the maturity of the working class which will decide the forms, peaceful or violent, democratic or totalitarian, which the revolution at present shaking the world will take. In order to avoid all misunderstanding we must emphasize now that what we are about to say applies as much to those countries already bearing the yoke of a dictatorship as to those countries still enjoying a democratic system, with this one proviso that where democracy does not exist it cannot be created except by the breach of existing legality. But once legal democracy has been reconquered, the establishment of a new dictatorship of a contrary order could lead only to utter disaster. 51. It is the maturity of the proletariat, as we have already pointed out, which will decide the issue of this struggle. From a purely economic standpoint, the development which we can see going on around us today is so clear that no one can be deceived about it, the economic structure of socialism is rising more or less automatically before our eyes. The pointed issue is, who is to be the master of this more and more socialist machinery? society as a whole or a plutocratic or a bureau-technocratic oligarchy. The preservation and extension of democratic freedom will turn the balance in favor of the former, whilst a dictatorship will tip the scales in favor of the latter. And that is why, amongst other reasons, we repudiate the false dilemma fascism or Bolshevism, in which many people want to cramp contemporary development. Both of these dictatorships lead to the same result to the control of the economic system by a clique in the interests of a clique. Only democracy can guarantee society against this danger. However, the cause of democracy will be lost if the working class turns to methods of violence. In nine cases out of ten, the adoption of such methods will drive the middle classes into the camp of fascism, and hand over the working class bound hand and foot to the tender mercies of a fascist dictatorship. There is only one chance in a thousand that an armed uprising of a fraction of the proletariat will lead to the establishment of a more or less proletarian dictatorship. In both cases it would represent the uncontrolled triumph of an oligarchy, of a plutocratic oligarchy in the first case and of a bureau-technocratic oligarchy in the second, and in any case to the triumph of technocracy. 
it would be a gross illusion to believe in the possibility of keeping democracy safe during a civil war or of restoring it immediately afterwards. Without democracy even the most collectivist economic forms can be no more than a hideous and repulsive caricature of that socialist society towards which we aspire. If any very considerable part of the working class were to lose its head and let itself be provoked into ill-considered actions leading to civil war, which in the present state of European affairs would undoubtedly develop into foreign war, the result in the last resort would be the triumph of technocracy and the rule of a new dominant and exploiting caste. If, on the other hand, the working class as a whole resists all temptation to adopt methods of violence and totalitarianism it will have its say in the administration of those collectivist forms of our present-day economic system, and its role will increase in importance as its ability to sustain it develops. In this case the technicians charged with the superintendence of the economic system would remain under the control of the community as a whole, and have no opportunity of developing into a technocratic caste or class. We have already pointed out, 52, that there is not one mass, but two masses. The one is composed of workers who have been organized for a long time and are quite well aware not only of what is necessary, but also of what is impossible and the other is composed of the new recruits to the socialist camp and the newly declassed elements from the middle classes, who are an easy prey to all the illusions of pre-Marxist socialism, and willing material for Blanquist practices. This latter mass can easily swing to the extreme right or to the extreme left according to circumstances. Just after the end of the World War it provided Bolshevism with strong contingents. From 1922 onwards we saw it swing over to fascism, first in Italy and then in Central Europe. Incapable of clear thought because lacking indispensable socialist education, it reacts violently to superficial stimulus, and turns fiercely against those whom an unscrupulous demagogy represents to its short-sighted vision as responsible for its misery. Hence its swing to the extreme left just after the World War and its subsequent swing to the extreme right when it found the policy of socialism disappointing. But whether it turns to the extreme right or to the extreme left, this unenlightened mass is almost always fundamentally anti-democratic, it has no confidence in itself and looks for salvation only from the energetic action of a leader apostrophe, incidentally another characteristic of pre-Marxist socialism. The fate of democracy and therefore of socialism and of the trade union movement, will depend throughout the period now beginning upon the relations between these two masses, on the capacity of the former to assimilate the latter. In this first stage of the socialist revolution the Marxist postulate of history conscious of itself is as yet only partially realized. One section of the proletariat has already the necessary consciousness of its own strength, hence its repudiation of the leader cult and its deep attachment to democracy, and of its limits, hence its aversion to utopian schemes and impossible demands. Another section still lacks this consciousness. This is not at all surprising because the proletariat as a whole cannot be riper for socialism than the economic system in which it has its being, but, compared with the revolutions of 1789 and 1848, the conscious and enlightened fraction of the people is much more powerful. In those former revolutions this enlightened fraction was almost non-existent. Today it represents a strong force whose influence on the unenlightened and excitable mass is undoubted. For the first time in history we can see powerful organizations whose actions are inspired by an objective analysis of economic reality, and who are able to X-ray the decadent economic system around them, and distinguish the contours of the new system to which it is about to give birth. Far from putting forward utopian schemes and formulating impossible demands, they base their demands on the results of this analysis. For this great advantage they must thank Karl Marx, his materialist conception of history and his analysis of the capitalist economic system. However, this does not prevent certain people amiably inviting us to abandon this outworn, false and finely refuted doctrine. The existing order which is now sliding to its final dissolution will give way to a controlled economic system either dictatorial or democratic, according to whether the inevitable transformation takes place in violent convulsions or as the result of methodical revolutionary evolution.
In other words, it depends on whether the chaotic methods of the unenlightened mass prevail or the rational and ordered methods of the mass inspired by democratic socialism and trade unionism, whether the recollections of the bourgeois revolution prevail or the scientific knowledge offered by modern socialism. Will that part of the proletariat which now represents history conscious of itself be able to establish the necessary ascendancy over the other part which is still attached to the apocalyptic methods of the bourgeois revolution, and restrain it from those blind and ill-considered plunges which are so fraught with peril for the future of the movement? This is the crucial question of our epoch, and we are prepared to place ourselves on record as being absolutely optimistic. Our optimism is based upon the immense progress made by the working class during the last hundred years. Fifty years ago the workers, reduced to the level of the basest servitude and the cruelest distress, uneducated and unorganized, took the factories by assault and destroyed the machines. In May and June 1936 the workers of France, just becoming conscious and organizing themselves as a class, carried out their great occupation of the factories. They watched carefully to see that no damage was done, and they looked after the machines as though they had been their own children. And nevertheless, four-fifths of those who took part in that action had never belonged to a trade union and had never had any trade union education whatever. 53. What seems to us still more admirable is that this mass of several millions of workers, without trade union education, taking part for the first time in a movement of such magnitude, and knowing practically nothing of trade union discipline, nevertheless did not lend a willing ear either to certain Trotskyist agitators or to the fascist provocateurs, who would have been very happy to stir up trouble. Our optimism is based on facts and not on abstract speculation. A class which started practically at nothing and raised itself to such a level of consciousness and enlightenment within the space of a century merits our complete confidence. But it is precisely because we have confidence in it, and because we are more than ever convinced that its final emancipation must be the fruit of its own efforts, that we feel ourselves entitled to say frankly that it still has a long way to travel before its emancipation can be complete. Its moral level must be raised higher and higher by the improvement of its intellectual standards and the increase of its general political ability. It must reject the leader cult more and more categorically. Unfortunately far too many workers are still addicted to this cult, though it reeks of both fascism and Bolshevism, and has nothing whatever to do with Marxism. They must acquire that knowledge necessary for a real control of economic life. This will be a long and arduous task, but the emancipation of the working class demands it, and history knows nothing of any rebates or omissions. In the preface to the first edition of his Capital Marx writes, and even when a society has got upon the right track for the discovery of the natural laws of its movement, and it is the ultimate aim of this work, to lay bare the economic law of motion of modern society, it can neither clear by bold leaps, nor remove by legal enactments, the obstacles offered by the successive phases of its normal development. But it can shorten and lessen the birth pangs. At the time of the bourgeois revolution, the economic law of development of modern society had hardly been discovered. Today it is well known to us. We are thus now in a position, not to clear by bold leaps, but to shorten and lessen the birth pangs. However, this possibility will become a reality only to the extent that the mass of the working class raises itself by study to a knowledge of that law of evolution which has been laid bare for us today thus becoming the embodiment of what we have termed history conscious of itself.